Chapter The Period of Inactivity 1. After the cessation of the fighting to the north of Arras in May, quiet reigned everywhere on the Western Front throughout the summer of 1915. At the end of September the Entente started a powerful offensive near Luz and in Champagne. The troops which had been transferred from the east arrived just in time to support the defenders of the Western Front, who were holding out so gallantly, and avert a serious defeat. The Italians had attacked repeatedly, but without success. The Austrian army fought well against Italy, she was their hereditary foe, whereas the war against Russia aroused no national prejudices. The German and Austrian general staffs had decided upon the conquest of Serbia. Bulgaria, a natural enemy of Serbia, and smarting under the loss of Macedonia, declared herself openly on our side. The taking of Warsaw had made a particularly strong impression on her. The Bulgarian contribution of 12 strong infantry divisions at once equalized the forces in the Balkans. Field Marshal von Mackensen crossed the Danube at the beginning of October. By the beginning of December the Serbian campaign had brought us close to the Greek frontier. Consideration for Greece, the fatigue of the troops, and the state of our communications, perhaps also other political and military circumstances, unknown to me, prevented us from completing our operations with an attack on Salonika, where the first Entente troops were arriving to join in the fighting. The capture of Salonika would have considerable relieved our position in the Balkan Peninsula. It is clear to me, in the light of the subsequent experience, that by such an operation we should not have gained even one Bulgarian for the Western Front. The English, French and Serbians who afterwards occupied the Macedonian front would probably have fought against us in France. This consideration continued to weigh with us. The attack on Salonika was always a side show, and must be regarded as such. The Austrian troops pushed forward through Montenegro as far as the Vojusa in Albania, where the fighting lasted until February. The troops covering the flank of the Austro-Hungarian army had advanced from the Danube far into Albania, even to the Greek frontier. The protection of this front was entrusted to Bulgarian troops, not only in their own interest, but also in that of Austria-Hungary and ourselves. Most of the German troops returned by degrees to the Danube. Austria-Hungary also had fresh troops at her disposal. The Serbian army was severely defeated, though remnants of it escaped in the direction of Valona, and, owing to the high-handed action of France and England at Corfu, became once more a factor in the struggle to be feared by the Bulgarian soldier. They were transferred subsequently to Salonika, where they fought very creditably. The Entente found themselves forced to release troops for Macedonia from other theatres of war. They also had to abandon the idea of continuing the Gallipoli operations, which, thanks to German energy and the Mediterranean division, had cost them very dearly. The position of the expeditionary force had now become too dangerous. Communication with Turkey was established by the defeat of Serbia and the alliance with Bulgaria. We were no longer obliged to smuggle our war material through Romania, it was possible to give Turkey direct assistance. The railway running to Constantinople was opened on January 16. On January 8 and 9 the Entente troops evacuated the Gallipoli Peninsula. The blockade of the Straits was assured. If the enemy fleets, by occupying the Straits, had commanded the Black Sea, Russia could have been supplied with the war materials of which she stood in such need. The fighting in the east would then have assumed a much more serious character. The Entente would have had access to the rich com supplies of South Russia and Romania, and would have persuaded this kingdom to yield to their wishes even sooner than she actually did. Russia's communications with the outside world for the transport of war materials were, at that time, via the Trans-Siberian railways, along the Merman coast, to which the railway from Petrograd was still under construction, and far from completion, and, in summer, by the White Sea. The traffic through Finland with Sweden was important, but the latter would not permit the transport of war material. Sweden interpreted the duties of a neutral state correctly. These details clearly show the importance of the Straits, and therefore of Turkey, for the Eastern Front, and our whole military position. Military operations in Asia Minor were a difficult matter. Turkey was entirely dependent on communications by road, whereas modern warfare requires communications either by rail or sea. The railway to the Caucasus had only just been begun between Angora and Sivas. The Baghdad railway, broken by the mountain chains of Taurus and Aminus, had not nearly reached the Tigris. Tunnels were in course of construction. The railway to Syria joined the Baghdad railway at Aleppo, that is, beyond the intervening mountain barrier. 
South of Damascus it gave place to the narrow-gauge Hejaz Railway, with a branch line which traversed Palestine and came to an end at Beersheba, south of Jerusalem. The state of the railways, which were bad enough in themselves, was made still worse by the conditions under which they were worked, for as regards both personnel and materials things could not have been worse. The railway served very little purpose, and did not in any way meet the necessities of the situation. Endeavours were made, with some success, to use the Euphrates and the Tigris, but this made little difference to the general situation. German motor transport helped to improve matters. Owing to the difficulties of communication, a campaign in Asia Minor, Syria and Mesopotamia was doomed to failure so long as transport conditions were not improved. The military efficiency of the Turks in their frontier provinces was still further limited by the fact that the Kurds and Armenians on the Caucasus frontier and the Arab tribes in Mesopotamia and Syria as far as Aden were hostile to them. The Turks have always pursued an unhappy policy in regard to native populations. They have gone on the principle of taking everything and giving nothing. Now they had to reckon with these peoples as their enemies. By their unpardonable treatment of the Armenians the Turks deprived themselves even of labor, which they needed urgently, both for the building of railways and agriculture. The Turkish efforts to summon Tripoli and Benghazi to a holy war were only partially successful. Our U-boats brought them arms, and to a certain extent maintained communication between those districts and Turkey. An expedition against the Suez Canal in January-February, 1915, was defeated. It could only have been successful if, at the same time, the Sanusi had invaded Egypt from the west and the Egyptians themselves had risen. But these were utopian ideas, English sovereignty is firmly established in those provinces which are in her power. At the mouth of the Euphrates and Tigris, England, with her maritime communications, advanced step by step towards Baghdad. It had been impossible for the Turks to prevent this. In December, 1915, fighting again took place round Kut el Amara below Baghdad to which the English expeditionary force was, by this time, alarmingly close. The Turkish army on the Caucasus frontier had been defeated, in the winter of 1914-15. They had been marking time since then. Nevertheless they had suffered a high rate of wastage, chiefly owing to typhus and frostbite. The events in the Sinai Peninsula and Mesopotamia did not directly affect the Eastern Front. The Suez expedition was followed with great interest and many hopes. The difficulties of communication, of which I have given a short description, were not fully realized by me at that time. In particular I was under, the impression that the Baghdad railway was better and further advanced than was actually the fact. Whether more could have been done here I was not able to ascertain. The fighting on the Caucasia front did not bring us the relief we had hoped for, as regards Russia. Owing to the occupation of vast regions in the east, the opening of the Balkan Peninsula and our through communications with Turkey, our economic situation had greatly improved. Romania had become much more accommodating as regards the delivery of supplies, as she was unable to dispose of her materials elsewhere. The year 1915 ended with a distinct advantage to us. We had strengthened our position for the coming year, but we did not by a long way get everything we could or ought to have expected from the home country. Our enemies continued to increase their armaments. In England Kitchener's army was developing. The greater part of it had, by this time, arrived on the Western Front. The English Front had extended southwards and released French troops. Further divisions were being formed in England. Conscription had taken the place of voluntary recruiting. The English Conscription Bill was passed in Parliament in January, 1916. Thus England, the last European power to do so, accepted the standpoint of the universal obligation of every able-bodied man to serve the state under arms, when required to do so by the necessities of war and the duties of citizenship. England did not extend the law to Ireland, a characteristic touch. The French army had kept up its original strength. The Serbian army was being reorganized. Russia, to make good her losses, had made great inroads on her vast manpower. The transformation of the peacetime industries of France, England, Japan and America had made decided progress. The year 1916 was certain to witness some terrific fighting. In this great drama of historical events operations on the front of the commander-in-chief in the East, which since November 1914, had been an important and frequently the decisive theatre, receded into the background. The work we now had to do was of a less active kind. 2. 
At the close of the great operations the circumstances under which the eastern armies were living were makeshift and unsatisfactory in every respect, further, conditions, in the territory we had occupied in the course of events, had to be reorganized. In order to get a better grasp of affairs and be in closer touch with the troops, we went to Kovno at the end of October. The field marshal, the officers of the general staff and I were quartered in two villas belonging to Herr Tillmann, a German whose family name was in good repute among the Germans in Russia. He himself had been in Germany from the beginning of the war. The field marshal, Colonel Hoffman and myself lived together in one of the villas. Here also was our small staff mess. I have spent many hours in this house and it is indelibly engraved on my memory. The offices of the general staff were in the administrative building of the military government. The sixpenny portraits of the Tsar, the Tsarina and the Tsarevich were typical of the Russian culture of that time. The rooms were large and suitable for our purpose, and could be well heated for the coming winter. Kovno is a typical Russian town, with low, mean, wooden houses and comparatively wide streets. From the hills which closely encircle the town there is an interesting view of the town and the confluence of the Nymen and the Vilia. On the further bank of the Nymen there stands the tower of an old German castle of the Teutonic Knights, a symbol of German civilization in the east, and not far from it there is a memorial of French schemes for the conquest of the world, that hill upon which Napoleon stood in 1812 as he watched the Grand Army crossing the river. My mind was flooded with overwhelming historical memories, I determined to resume in the occupied territory that work of civilization at which the Germans had labored in those lands for many centuries. The population, made up as it is of such a mixture of races, has never produced a culture of its own and, left to itself, would succumb to Polish domination. I was proud to think that, over a hundred years ago, after a period of great weakness and tribulation in Germany, we had thrown off the foreign yoke. Now that same Germany, first beaten by Napoleon because she was decadent and subsequently united by the efforts of a few great men, stood victorious in this world war against enemies who far outnumbered her and added fresh glories to her record. I had faith in final victory. Nothing else was possible. The German people had been through too much already to expose themselves again to such a terrible fate. The men who were leading Germany only needed to develop her latent powers, to add fuel to the holy fire burning, as I then thought, in every German heart. A happy future of assured prosperity seemed to be opening out for the fatherland. Our work, of course, was not interrupted for a single day by the migration from Lotzen to Kovno. The necessary telephone connections were quickly made in the office, and the bare necessities in the way of furniture were improved upon. That this additional furniture was taken from other houses, which had been deserted by the inhabitants, could not be helped. It was done in as orderly a manner as possible, but a certain amount of confusion was inevitable. These are the regrettable conditions imposed by the exigencies of war. The belligerents or individual soldiers are not to be blamed for this. Circumstances are too strong for them. To the individual civilian who suffers it is a matter of indifference how he loses his property. He understands nothing of the necessities of war, and therefore is ready enough to talk about the enemy's barbaric methods of warfare. We found plenty of furniture at Kovno, but later, when we got to Brest-Litovsk, we're confronted by empty barracks. We therefore had furniture sent on to us from Kovno and requisitioned some from other places as well. War, alas, is a rough trade. In this town I usually attended the evangelical services which Pastor Wessel held in the former Orthodox Church, a magnificent building, typical of the Russian despotic rule in that country. There I heard for the first time on foreign soil the beautiful old melody sung as a hymn. I have given myself. With heart and with hand. To thee, land of love and life. My German fatherland. ICH hab mi hergeben. MIT Hurras und MIT Hand. DIR, Land vol Leap und Leben. Mein Deutsches Vaterland. I was deeply moved. This hymn ought to be sung every Sunday in all the churches, and should be engraved on the hearts of all Germans. 3. The first task before us was to consolidate our front and endeavor to improve the living conditions for the armies. On our right wing Prince Leopold of Bavaria's army group was occupying the sector south of the Nymen as far as south of Pinsk. This army group and the commander-in-chief in the east himself were under our general headquarters to the south these troops linked up with the front line of the Austrian army, with its general headquarters at Teschen, which had Linsingen's army group on its left wing and its right close to the Romanian frontier. 
In the sphere of command of the commander-in-chief in the east the line of the 12th and 8th armies had been so shortened that there was only room for one of them. The 12th remained where it was, it extended from the Nijmen to beyond the leader Molodechno railway. General von Gorwitz had given up the command and taken over the command of an army against Serbia. His place with the 12th Army had been taken by General von Fabek, who had come from the Western Front. The 10th Army extended to the north as far as the Disna. Further north again, the Schultz Army Group had been formed under the general of that name, who had commanded the 8th Army. The left wing of the 10th Army was on the banks of the Davinar, about halfway between Davinsk and Jakobstadt. The northern part of the front and the coast defences were under General von Below. The Nijmen army, no longer entitled to that name, became the 8th Army. Such a change of name is not so simple as it looks on paper. A variety of measures have to be taken to avoid present and future possibility of confusion. The navy had taken up quarters in the naval port of Libau. The sphere of its command there had to be specially provided for. Certain subordinate formations had to be fitted into this scheme for holding the front. A number of rearrangements on a large scale were necessary. Where the main offensives had taken place there was a congestion of troops. At other points the line was too thin, a proper balance had to be struck. Cavalry divisions had to be relieved by infantry divisions. It was a long time before these movements were completed and the troops arrived at positions where they could be left for the time being. But there could not be any question as yet of real rest. The line had to be consolidated, and meanwhile other troops had to hold long stretches of front. Both these tasks taxed the strength of the men. The positions to be strengthened were generally those where the fighting had been fiercest. Points which it was impossible to hold were to be abandoned, but both commanders and troops resigned themselves to this course with great reluctance. Between Vishniev and the Disna, the line to which the left wing of the 10th Army had withdrawn, it was easier to select positions. The construction of trenches and billets, and indeed conditions at the front as a whole, suffered from the bad railway connections. The Russians had everywhere completely destroyed the railways. The bridges over the Nijmen and other large rivers had all been blown up, the railway stations burnt, the water supplies destroyed and the telegraph wires broken down. The railways bad been tom up in places, and the sleepers and rails removed. The military railway authorities, with their labor and engineer companies, and the telegraphists for the extremely important work of re-establishing the telegraph, had a colossal task before them. The director of railways in the east knew his job. The completion of the railway bridge near Kovno was of the greatest importance. It was possible to use it by the end of September, and for a long time it was the only channel for supplies to the 10th and 12th armies and the right wing of Schultz's army group. At that time I was satisfied if I could count on two trains a day to leader for the 12th army, but, as it turned out, it was anything but easy to obtain the trains which the army required. Conditions on the railways at home were very bad. On one occasion the 12th Army had urgently requested a train load of fodder and received a train load of seltzer water. That is a trifle during a great war, but the well-being of man and horse is dependent on a series of trifles, and so the latter assume a great and disproportionate importance. The northern network of railways joined the Memel line at pre -Culm. The Russian railways in Lithuania and Courland had a surprisingly small capacity, even in peacetime. This would not have been the case if Russia had really needed the ports of Windor and Libau for her economic existence. The pre culm memel line, moreover, was behind the times. It was a long time before any sort of regular service of three or four trains could be established on the line from Panevish to Davinsk. On the long stretches from Vilna to Smorgan and Vilna to Davinar conditions were not so difficult, but even here the improvised water tanks froze in winter and there were all sorts of obstacles, surmountable and insurmountable. The branch line Panevish Ujani, Svensiani had hardly been damaged, but it was quite inadequate. It was long after Christmas before traffic was made safe and comparatively regular on all the lines, so that at last the longed for leave trains could be put on. And then a peculiarly critical situation arose. After a spell of intense cold, the ice on the Nijmen and Windor began to break up. The masses of ice swept away the bridge across the Windor at Moskeki. The sole means of communication with Germany by rail was thus broken. The floating ice dashed against the railway bridge at Kovno and displaced the rails, but the bridge stood firm. Once more we passed through a period of great anxiety, although for a different reason. 
If this bridge had also been destroyed the armies would have been in a critical position. By degrees the other bridges across the Nymen were completed. The extension of the railways progressed, traffic became regular and conditions on the eastern front were regulated more satisfactorily. The new lines, the Torogan Radziwilishki and Shavli Mittau sections were completed in May and August, 1916, the line from Svensiany towards Lake Narich not until later. The two former railways have opened up the country and facilitated the work of civilization. These districts owe us much for that. Behind the front there arose a system of light railways, connecting up with this network of lines, for the direct supply of the troops. The roads in the districts occupied by the troops continue to be of great importance. The great main roads from Grodno to Lida, Kovno to Davinsk and Torogan to Mittau were put into excellent repair. The other roads were repaired as far as possible. At the season when the snow was melting they were transformed in places into a slough in which horses were drowned if they happened to fall. As the work on the railways and roads progressed the consolidation of the front also went forward. The troops cut wood for themselves, and some of the barbed wire was manufactured on the spot. The proximity of underground water made the construction of trenches peculiarly difficult. The geologists rendered good service to the troops in this connection. Behind the front arose workshops for the repair of all kinds of war material. The numerous captured Russian machine guns were altered to suit German ammunition in a specially erected factory. Of course I did not deal with these matters in detail, and confined myself to stimulating and organizing activities. I was particularly concerned about the shelter and feeding of the men and the horses. The quarters were, in themselves, not so bad. The war had passed comparatively rapidly over the region which we finally occupied, and therefore had not been very destructive. Nor had the Russians burned down everything as they did further south in Poland. All the same there remained a great deal of work to be done in the construction of billets for the troops, especially close behind the line. The dugouts, which took a long time to build, were made as habitable as possible by the troops. But only those who have been through it can know with how little officers and men had to be satisfied, and were satisfied. Hutments for men and horses had to be built further behind the line. The troops became great experts at this work. Their artistic sense was displayed in decorative embellishments of birch wood. Generally speaking, the provisioning of the troops proceeded pretty regularly. Rations were sometimes short with some of the troops, especially potatoes. There was not enough fodder for the horses. There were no oats, and green fodder was too scarce to be supplied in sufficient quantities. Many horses died of exhaustion. In the end we had to add sawdust to their food. It needed special care to prevent the supplies which had been brought up at such pains from going bad at the railway stations. Of course there were no sheds or tents there. I had to see to this also. Goodwill was universal, but the difficulties accumulated until they took the heart out of many. In dealing with the Christmas parcels there were similar difficulties to be overcome. The health of men and horses had my special attention. I went into both these subjects in detail with the officers responsible for them, Surgeon General von Kern and Chief Veterinary Surgeon Gramlich. It had been difficult to look after the wounded during the advance, but conditions had now become somewhat easier. There still remained, however, a great deal to be done by the responsible authorities. The few hospitals which we found in the occupied territory were hardly worth considering. I urged that as many wounded as possible should be sent home, but I had to be very patient. Later on, cases of slight illness or wounds were not sent home but retained in the occupied territory, where, during convalescence, they were given light duty. We were spared the epidemics to which armies are liable, only spotted fever occurred from time to time for a short period. As regards measures against vermin, very thorough precautions had been taken at the frontier to prevent the troops from going home infected. Thanks to the energy of Surgeon General von Kern and the conscientiousness of the army doctors the whole medical service was in perfect order. Herr von Kern is a philosopher, and this would appear to show that philosophers can also be men of action. The horses suffered from glanders and mange. We mastered the glanders by means of blood tests, but not the mange, and this did extensive mischief. Many remedies were tried, but an effective one was not discovered until the war was almost at an end. Veterinary hospitals were erected in large numbers, and the officers of this service had plenty to do. Their devotion was rewarded by great successes. The supplies and accommodation for the horses were not always all they should have been. 
I often represented to the army headquarters staffs that they should devote more care and attention to their horses. The replacement of clothing, the provision of winter clothing and woolen wear, and the delivery of pit props for the trenches were beset with many difficulties, I had to bring all my energies to bear. Leave was begun as soon as possible. It was granted more and more freely as the situation on the railways improved. I went into the question of the speedy delivery of letters and newspapers, I was most anxious that the men should be as closely in touch with home as possible, and I was able to help in that direction. At the beginning of the war the military postal authorities were faced with an insoluble problem. They had not sufficient motor lorries. But under the military postmaster Domislav they soon got to work, and were able to meet the heavy demands on their resources. Behind the front and in the large town soldiers and officers clubs were established from time to time, we could not have enough of these. The soldiers clubs in the east met a deeply felt need, this was shown by the numbers who frequented them. The people at home gave me real assistance, and the women who came out to the soldiers' clubs did good work. The field marshal and I were gratified when, through the agency of Pastor Hopper, some friends offered to equip certain field libraries for the use of the troops. Providing for the intellectual needs of the troops was a labor of love, and we eagerly accepted this offer. Pastor Hopper took the matter in hand and carried it through energetically. On my birthday in 1917 he handed me a considerable sum for the same purpose with these heartfelt words, Der Geist schafft Waffen und Sieg. The spirit creates weapons and brings victory. I hope these field libraries were useful to the troops. They could not, of course, entirely satisfy their demand for books, field bookshops were set up in great numbers. These were handed over to the management of Messrs Stilke, who were to cooperate with other firms. They served the troops well. The military bookshops also stocked newspapers of every political complexion. The armies produced their own local newspapers. I arranged for them to have a good news service. The getting up of concerts, theatres and cinema shows was in the hands of the army authorities, and was encouraged by us. In view of the enormous demands that the high command in the east had been obliged to make on the troops it was a real pleasure, to do everything I could for them, and my colleagues. Helped me most effectively in this work. The military efficiency of the troops was not neglected. Training was promoted as far as possible, although schools could not be established on the same scale as they were in the West. The Nymen fortresses, Grodno and Kovno, as also Libau, were strengthened, and the former frontier lines maintained. They formed reserve positions. The labor available did not allow of any further measures. My ordinary duties in looking after the various armies were very considerably increased by the demands made by the military and home authorities in the occupied territories, not to speak of my duty to take care of the local population. I cheerfully undertook all these fresh duties and firmly resolved to make a good job of them. 4. The country was in a devastated condition owing to the war, and order prevailed only where we had been in occupation for some time. Some of the inhabitants had deliberately left before the retreating Russians, others had been taken with them. Numbers of these had hidden themselves in the depths of the forests and now returned home. Many properties, however, remained unoccupied. The harvest had not been reaped, and it was impossible to imagine how cultivation was to be continued there was no supreme authority. The Russian government officials, judges, administrative authorities, and nearly all secret intelligence agents had left the country. There were neither gendarmerie nor police, and the priests alone possessed a certain amount of influence. This denuded country had to live somehow. At the very outset of our occupation of Vilna, Kovno and Grodno, serious difficulties arose in connection with the feeding of the population, and these difficulties threatened to increase and spread to other towns. There was also a shortage of wood for fuel. The population, apart from the German portion, held aloof from us. Those in the German districts, especially the Balts, had welcomed our troops. The Letts were opportunists, and awaited events. The Lithuanians believed the hour of deliverance was at hand, and when the good times they anticipated did not materialize, owing to the cruel exigencies of war, they became suspicious once more, and turned against us. The Poles were hostile as they feared, quite justifiably, a pro-Lithuanian policy on our part. The white Ruthenians were of no account, as the Poles had robbed them of their nationality and given nothing in return. In the autumn of 1915 I thought I would like to obtain some idea of the distribution of this race. At first they were, literally, not to be found. 
Subsequently we discovered they were a widely scattered people, apparently of Polish origin, but with such a low standard of civilization that it would be a long time before we could do anything for them. The Jew did not know what attitude to adopt, but he gave us no trouble, and we were at least able to converse with him, which was hardly ever possible with the Poles, Lithuanians and Letts. The language difficulties weighed heavily against us, and cannot be overestimated. Owing to the dearth of German works of reference on the subject, we knew very little about the country or the people, and found ourselves in a strange world. In a region as large as East and West Prussia, Pomerania and Posen together, we were faced with an appalling task. We had to construct and organize everything afresh. The first thing to be done was to secure peace and order behind the army and put an end to espionage. The country had to be made self-supporting, so that it might supply the army and our people at home. It had also to contribute to the equipment of troops and our requirements in war material. Our economic conditions, due to the enemy blockade, made this course an imperative duty. Agriculture had to be taken in hand as soon as possible. The time for the solution of political problems had not yet arrived these matters were handed over to the inspectors of the lines of communication, who were primarily concerned with the administration of the occupied territories. Keeping order in the country was a military duty of the lines of communication commandants. The lines of communication troops were at their disposal for this purpose, and they had the assistance of the military police in the work of counter-espionage. The inspectors of the lines of communication were supplied with special staffs for the administration of the country. These were under a chief administrator, who had special powers and a heavy responsibility to his lines of communication inspector. The commandants on the lines of communication and the administrative bodies were subordinate to the authority of the inspectors. There were, of course, possibilities of friction, and therefore, among Germans, friction was bound to arise. However, thanks to our excellent inspectors, all these difficulties were eventually overcome. Generals von Harbu, Madlung and Freiherr von Seckendorf proved themselves efficient administrators. In the area under the control of the commander-in-chief in the East administrative and economic questions were studied and dealt with by a special department. There was no room for a general government, quite apart from the fact that it would have been a useless piece of machinery. The armies required their own lines of communication areas. The quartermaster general was busy in the west and unable to give sufficient attention to affairs in the east. The commander-in-chief there had to manage by himself. The inspectors were responsible for the execution of any order issued by him, in addition to their many special duties. Owing to the absence of any home administrative or legal machinery, our administration had a character of its own, which enabled it to withstand the storms of the revolution in November, 1918. 5. I can only give a brief description of the administrative work of the commander-in-chief in the East, but I do it gladly, for I owe as many thanks to my assistance in this field of labor as to those who helped me on the purely military side. What we accomplished together before my departure at the end of July, 1916, was admirable in every respect, and worthy of the German character. It benefited the army and Germany as well as the country and its inhabitants. I required many colleagues in this responsible undertaking. They were not all appointed at once, but only as occasion and necessity demanded. By the side of my military staff there gradually arose an extensive administrative staff under the Deputy Chief of Staff, General von Eisenhorth Roth, a man of wide experience in economic problems. He served me and our cause with a devotion and enthusiasm which were infectious. As Intendant General, he was of the utmost assistance to me later on. At the end of October the first thing to be done was to introduce our administration into the newly occupied portions of the lines of communication area, as had already been done in the western portions. A belt along the whole front remained the operations zone, under the direct control of the army commands. The various lines of communication areas had each adopted different methods, but uniformity was imperative, as otherwise it would be very difficult to supervise the administrative machinery. This had to be done with tact and caution, or we should do more harm than good. In view of the magnitude of the task, and the wide region to be administered, a large personnel was necessary, in spite of all efforts to be as economical as possible. Although I hold the view that it is not numbers that matter, but the quality of the individual, this principle is necessarily subject to limitations. I could not carry on without a certain staff, and no organization could have done with less than mine. The individual standard of achievement was always high. We could not have dispensed with a single man. 
I was careful that the military character of our administration, since nothing else was possible within the framework of the inspectorates, should be maintained, and, above all, that those should be selected who were no longer fit for service at the front. But I also used civilians. My chief preoccupation was to obtain men with technical training, for I am not one of those who believe that the majority of men are capable of holding any post, I have often observed how even a little technical knowledge lightens the work to the advantage of everybody. For purely administrative posts I was compelled to take men without technical experience. A resolute will, general experience and sound knowledge of men had to make up for what was lacking. For agriculture, forestry, law, finance, ecclesiastical and educational affairs, experts were absolutely necessary. The extraordinary demands on the manpower of the nation for the army and home services made it at first difficult to obtain the necessary men. Later on, when the administration of the commander-in-chief in the East attained a certain reputation, it was an easier matter. We used to make searching inquiries about all candidates at the employment bureaus at home. The subordinate posts were filled by the various administrations and lines of communication inspectorates in the same way. I insisted upon having reliable men in this foreign land. Natives were only employed in Courland, and then sparingly. Everybody co-operated zealously with me in this strenuous undertaking. We were governing a country, the conditions of which were absolutely unknown to us, which had been devastated by war, and in which all political and economic bonds had been severed. We were among a foreign population, consisting of many different, rival races, a population that did not speak our tongue and was, generally speaking, secretly hostile. All of us were animated by the spirit of faithful and self-sacrificing devotion to duty, the heritage of many centuries of Prussian discipline and tradition. As I became better acquainted with the country, I realized that some measures could not be carried through, but would have to be modified. Here and there we might have done more and done it better, that goes without saying. But my duty was to act promptly and decisively in these unfamiliar conditions. In particular, any omission in matters economical was more serious than a mistake which could be rectified later. Only after we had got to work on the problem was I able to see my way clearly. I should have been more cautious had I been dealing with a political problem, but I was not concerned with that yet. 6. The territory administered by the commander-in-chief in the east stretched southwards to parts of the lines of communication area of the army group under Field Marshal Prince Leopold. These had formerly been the areas through which the 12th Army advanced and subsequently had its lines of communication. The forest of Bialoviesa also came under the administration of the commander-in-chief in the east. Its organization followed the changes in the lines of communication areas, and the two developed side by side. Up to the end of 19x5 and 19x6 the following administrative provinces had been created, Courland, Lithuania, Suwaki, Vilna, Grodno and Bialystok. This arrangement was changed later. Suwaki and Vilna were combined to form the administrative province of Vilna. At my desire, on my departure in July, 1916, the provinces of Vilna and Lithuania were combined under the administration of Lithuania. In the first instance, Grodno was joined to Bialystok and in the autumn of 1917 all this enlarged district was incorporated in Lithuania. The chief administrators of Courland and Lithuania have attracted much public attention. Major von Gosler administered Courland in an unobtrusive and impartial manner. He was a member of the Reichstag, a lord of the manor and an ex-landrat. Since 1905 the Balts had been very embittered against the Letts. He understood not only how to make the former more conciliatory, but also how to win the sympathy of the latter and gain their active cooperation. In Courland they still speak with gratitude and appreciation of his just and far-seeing administration. Lieutenant Colonel Prince von Eisenberg, in Lithuania, was more impulsive, perhaps too much so. He was an energetic man who managed his family estates admirably. My attention was first drawn to him in occupied Poland, where he had taken an useful part in the administration. The lieutenant colonel later fell a victim to politics. So long as I remained in Kovno politics played no part in the administration. Prince von Eisenberg had full opportunity of interesting himself in the affairs of the other districts, and enlisting the sympathies of the population and clergy of the small province then under his control. I am sorry I cannot give the names of various other deserving administrators. The personality of the lines of communication inspector, General Freiherr von Seckendorf, made itself felt, particularly in the province of Bialystok. He gave his administration a character of its own. 
Nowhere else did the lines of communication and district commandant work so well together and with so little friction from the start. The chief administrators were responsible to the lines of communication inspectors and the commander-in-chief in the East in all respects, for the administration of the country. They had a body of officials under them corresponding to the economic section of my staff. The administrative provinces were divided into districts, often as large as a lines of communication area in the West. The onus of the administrative work, as regards its economic and agricultural aspects, lay on the district commandant. He had nothing to do with the judicial system, which was parallel to his own. The district commandant ranked with town commandants of the larger towns. Subordinated to the district commandant were the mayors of the small towns and the area presidents in the country, and under the latter were the village presidents. Attached to the district commandants for the economic exploitation of the country were specialist agricultural officers, whose duty was to supervise cultivation and estate management, and to take steps for increasing production and utilizing the harvest. Other officials assisted the commandants in producing all kinds of raw material required for war purposes. The uniform system of administration outlined above was only gradually introduced into the different provinces in accordance with an administrative decree of the 7th of June 1916. The district commandants had a body of gendarmerie for their police force. In the provinces they were formed into special gendarmerie detachments, and in the district under the commander-in-chief in the east they were formed into a corps. I deeply regretted the lack of German police forces. Germany could not spare sufficient gendarmes, and I was therefore compelled to commandeer older men from the front. They received special instructions to fit them in some measure for their duties. Colonel Roches Schmidt, a particularly careful officer, and I would gladly have found some better arrangement, but the whole thing was a makeshift. Unfortunately individual gendarmes may have added to the discontent which showed itself later. How could they be expected to give satisfaction and accomplish anything in a strange land, among a hostile population, and with no sufficient knowledge of the language? This one question will illustrate the difficulties which Germans in a foreign land had to encounter. Dishonesty and profiteering are absolutely inexcusable. The loyalty of the gendarmes brought them into conflict with the numerous armed bands, and many of them lost their lives. This must never be forgotten. The government of the country included the administration of justice which was so arranged as to fit in with the district organization. In each district there was a district court for the local population, we had to create them, as there were none. The provincial courts were set up as a kind of higher court, perhaps unnecessarily. The high court in Kovno, under President Kratzenberg, was the final court of appeal. As chief of the Department of Justice, he had to take considerable part in its administrative business. The functions of the lines of communication tribunals were in no way restricted by these district courts. The courts worked well, both together and independently. The forestry service in the various provinces was outside the district organization. Inspectorates were created according to the forest areas, of which that at Bialoviesa became the best known. 7. Vitality had to be infused into this administrative system if it was to accomplish useful work. It must not become bureaucratic, but must adapt itself to the needs of the situation. Precedent, that grave digger of independent judgment, could not apply here, thank God. I had the services of Captains von Brockhusen and Freiherr von Gale, of the reserve, in the whole business of building up the administrative system. Prior to the war the former had been a landrat, and the latter director of the East Prussian Land Company at Königsberg. We produced a sound organization, well fitted to cope with the heavy demands made upon it. We gave special attention to the health of the population. We triumphed over spotted fever which was rampant in many places. It involved heavy sacrifices in doctors. To pacify the population and give material relief to the country, we made a beginning with the redemption of requisition notes issued by the troops during operations. It was a difficult and complicated matter to carry through. From now on we paid for everything in cash. I wanted in that way to help the country and increase its productivity, in my view a very important matter. It was necessary for us to obtain control of the products of the soil, and to ensure the proper management of agriculture and full exploitation of the land. This was all the more difficult, because the population was so small. For example, the district of Borsk only numbered four inhabitants to the square kilometre. In our anxiety to help the home country, and indeed under pressure, we attempted too much in the way of cultivation. 
We interested German companies in the business, in the hope of their being able, with the means at their disposal, to improve the cultivation of the thinly populated regions. We took big estates under our own management. Motor plows and agricultural machinery of all kinds were supplied. Seed was distributed. Army horses helped in the plowing. The main thing, however, was to stimulate the interest of the local population by paying ready money and fixing fair prices. The prices we allowed were lower than those adopted by the general government of Warsaw, but they were quite adequate. We took into consideration the already enormous expenditure of the treasury. Prince Max's government raised the prices immediately, I do not know why, at any rate he got no thanks for it. The soil was, generally speaking, unproductive, and disappointed our hopes. It is not drained and cultivation can only be attempted late in the season. The varieties of seed were not selected with sufficient care. Artificial manure was unknown. The yields of hay and clover, rapeseed and flax were alone satisfactory. The transport of stores to the railway and other collecting stations was a particularly arduous business. The roads were bad, and it took days to get the produce of the land to these places in small carts drawn by one or two horses. We paid premiums, but the peculiar difficulties of this theatre of war could only be reduced, not eliminated. A good deal was never delivered at all. Arrangements were immediately made for the installation of potato drying plant, and we took steps to organize the production of fodder from wood and straw. It was doubly necessary to exploit to the full the resources of the occupied territory, as the demands on the home cattle stocks were so great. Cattle had, of course, suffered severely owing to the war. A census had to be taken. It was a difficult business. Many were hidden in the cellars or driven into the forests, but we were gradually successful in our stock taking, although there was no register. By degrees we got everything properly organized. We paid much attention to the cultivation of vegetables and fruit. Jam and marmalade factories were established. Mushrooms in large quantities were collected and dried. The fishing rights of the numerous large lakes were leased. At Libau deep sea fishing was organized. Everything that could be used for food was exploited to the fullest extent. The condition of the town population was desperate, and in the winter of 1915-16 we were compelled to draw on our military stores for the alleviation of distress. Later, the conditions improved considerably. The army received its share, and I also helped the home country. I remember that when in June or July, 1916, Herr von Batocki asked me to assist Berlin, I was in a position to do so. In order to help the country we permitted the activities of the existing foreign maintenance committees of the various nationalities inhabiting the occupied territory, on condition that their support should not be confined to inhabitants of their own nationality, but that they should also consider others. The Jewish committee, who had the largest means at their disposal, derived from America, showed themselves broad-minded, and did useful work. Their activities testified to the extraordinary unity of this people and won recognition. The first Jewish national kitchen established in Kovno bore my name. The army rabbi Rosnak made the suggestion to me. Men of proved capacity gave me their assistance in all agricultural and food problems. Among these names the most prominent are those of the well-known member of the Prussian upper chamber, Major Count York of Wartenberg, Gehr. Regrat Captain von Rumke, and later Hofkammerat Major Heckel. The conscription of horses naturally lay in the hands of the military. In this matter the district commandants performed the same duties as the Prussian landrat. The occupied territory had to supply a large number, if we wished to avoid making yet heavier demands on the home country. The Lithuanian horse is small and strong, it possesses great powers of endurance, and its wants are few. It is therefore a very useful animal for military purposes. The country was bound to suffer severely as the result of the continuous heavy demands made upon it, especially the constant levies of horses and cattle. The local administrative authorities often drew my attention to this fact, but there was nothing for it but to insist on these deliveries. The area governed by us was not more severely taxed than any other. The home country also suffered from the measures we were forced to adopt. A great deal of the discontent that was apparent later was traceable to these inevitable military requisitions. Severities that occurred from time to time may have increased this ill feeling, they certainly did harm. The political democratic agitators made it their business to add fuel to the flames. 
it would have been an absurdity to spare the area administered by the commander-in-chief in the East, from false humanitarian reasons at the cost of our own country. Owing to the intensive cultivation in Germany, any action prejudicial to the agricultural industry must be far more harmful than decreased productivity in the area of the commander-in-chief in the East. The provision of raw material was a specially important undertaking for which we also paid cash. The Jew was, in this instance, indispensable as middleman. We supplied the Home War Department with skins and hides, copper and brass, rags and scrap iron, and further relieved it by taking over and managing the factories in Libau, Kovno and Bialystok. What became a very extensive trade department was gradually established, under the control of Geheimrat Major Eilsberger, a man of extraordinary foresight and energy, who later became ministerial director in the Imperial Treasury. Great importance was attached to the manufacture of barbed wire. This, and the management of other factories, was efficiently undertaken by Captain Markow who in peace had been with the General Electric Company, and during the war with the chief of the field telegraphs on the Eastern Front. In this way everything was put to the fullest possible use, each after its kind. Amongst other things a large railway workshop was established at Libau by the Military Railway Directorate. With the provision of raw materials there was a slight improvement in trade which was necessarily hampered by the restrictions on personal intercourse which, for military reasons, we were compelled to impose on the country. The rich forests particularly invited exploitation, but indiscriminate felling was prohibited. The consumption of wood for field works and railway sleepers was enormous. Sawmills arose one after the other, and as we gradually provided for all the needs of our army, we were also able to deliver wood to the west and Serbia. Suitable timber was sent to Germany and also given to the inhabitants for the rebuilding of their homes. At all torts, in Courland, the chief of the aviation services erected a workshop for sheds and barracks. Sleepers were made in considerable numbers. It was extremely difficult to have the stocks of wood necessary for heating purposes always in readiness, especially in the winter of 1915-16, as we lacked all idea of the quantities required. Cellulose wood, for the manufacture of powder and paper, was sent to Germany in considerable quantities. We soon allowed unrestricted trade in this particular kind of wood in the occupied territories, as we and Germany profited by it. I was glad to be able to help the supply of paper to the German newspapers. Raft transport on the Nijmen and other navigable rivers was undertaken and magnificently organized by Forstrat Schutte. We turned our attention to the production of resin, and acting under the advice of Oberf Derstekinitz, introduced this industry into those districts. It is a tedious but nevertheless profitable process. It was intended to demonstrate it in Germany at a later date. A factory for preparing the resin was established at Kovno. We manufactured chemical wood products in special factories. Finally we went in for charcoal burning. Forstrat Kirchner and many other officials have left a monument of their energy and foresight. The work done by Forstrat Major Eskerich, both as an organizer of agriculture and administrative official in his district of the Bialoviesa forest, has been the admiration of many German visitors. The agricultural possibilities of the land were very thoroughly developed in every direction, but we spared the country and local population as much as we could. Consideration for the rate of exchange made it impossible always to pay in German money. In agreement with the Imperial Bank and the authorities in Berlin, the Army Intendant Geheim Kessel and Captain Koenigs issued special local coinage of the Commander-in-Chief in the East, which was soon gladly accepted. We also opened German banks in order to revitalize economic conditions. It was no simple matter to finance the whole administration. Gare. Oberfinanzrat Captain Tiesler, who distinguished himself by his peculiarly clear insight and creative gifts, undertook this duty with great skill. He had to draw up an exact budget for the entire administration, and at the same time find sources of revenue. As I have said before the personnel employed was kept down as much as possible. There was an absolute scramble among the various departments of my administration for places and extra pay for the subordinates. The commandants on the lines of communication were always coming to me with fresh demands. I had to smooth things over, and so gained some idea of the trials and anxieties of our national financial administration. As soon as we had successfully drawn up our first budget, we forwarded it to the War Ministry in Berlin, and to the Quartermaster General. After careful scrutiny and violent disagreement it was at last approved. Our revenue was derived from customs, monopolies, taxes and national industries. 
the technical details of the whole system of taxation had to be arranged on the simplest possible lines. It would have been impossible to introduce a more complicated and therefore more equitable system in the first place, because we lacked a trained staff. Besides, nothing had been left of the Russian system, and in any case the population was ignorant of these matters. The bulk of our revenue was derived from customs, indirect taxation and monopolies, in view of the Russian practice. Import duties were collected at the frontiers by Prussian financial officials, against an indemnity to the Prussian treasury. Private parcels intended for the army were, of course, duty-free. Only the few consignments intended for the population were affected, and the revenue derived from this source was small. We levied a small export duty only on cellulose wood. It did not bring in much. The taxes yielded more. Captain Tiesler established a monopoly of the sale of cigarettes, the financial technicalities of which seemed to me worthy of imitation. Monopolies of spirits, salt, matches and confectionery were introduced, on the same lines. For direct taxes we introduced a rough system of graded taxation per head. There was no better basis for a system of personal assessment. As regards taxation on property, we introduced a tax on land and profits and inhabited house duty. The people on the whole were satisfied with the taxation, which did not burden them heavily. The total taxes per head, including the local rates, did not exceed 19.50 marks annually, as against 32.75 marks before the war. They could not, however, get used to the dog license. Owing to hydrophobia, dogs had become a danger to the country, and countermeasures had to be taken. The tax, however, was abolished when its purpose in that respect had been accomplished. At first the government undertakings yielded very little profit. This was due partly to the heavy initial expenses and the high cost of liquidation, and partly to the economic isolation of Germany which made it necessary to concentrate on the maximum of production rather than financial profit. I have only indicated the principal items of taxation. Further sources of revenue were gradually developed. The results were favorable, for the receipts sufficed for the administration of the country without assistance from the imperial treasury. A system had been established, which, though based on broad principles, had required the most careful elaboration in detail. 8. The legal system was in accordance with the Hague Convention. This required in matters of private litigation that the local population should have the benefit of their own laws. Our first business, however, was to find out what the law really was. This was no easy matter, owing to the confusion in the Russian system, a confusion which had existed in this region even before the war. When we found out what the law was it had to be translated into German to enable the German judges to give judgment accordingly. I firmly believe that only Germans would take so much trouble in a conquered country. In spite of that, enemy propaganda denounced us as Huns to the world at large so successfully that we were helpless against it. President Kratzenberg did excellent work in his quiet, clear-headed way. The German judge administered foreign laws to the poor, vermin-infested villages of Lithuania in the same spirit of justice and impartiality that he would have shown in Berlin. Who can emulate this? Major Altman, inspector of schools in the Prussian Ministry of Education, drew up a scheme for the guidance of schools, to the further benefit of the population. It was conceived in a lofty spirit and respected the rights of each denomination and race. Here, as elsewhere, anything of a provocative nature was studiously excluded. There was a dearth of teachers for the schools, so we supplied members of the teaching profession from the landstem. Later on, the complaint was made that they spoke only German to the children who, after all, attended voluntarily, the teachers unfortunately knew no other language, and we had very few Lithuanian or Polish-speaking teachers at our disposal. We turned our attention to the question of school books, for various Polish school books had shown me what education can do to intensify national feeling. Danzig, Niesen, Posen and Vilna were Polish towns. This fact impressed me as deeply as the systematic manner in which France had educated her youth in the idea of revanche. The Poles and the French have by these means kept alive a strong national feeling, which stands them in good stead now. We have not pursued such an educational policy and suffer from the fact that the strong national idea has not been instilled into our youth. Such a feeling is necessary if a country is to survive crises such as we have lived through since 1914, and now more than ever. This view is rejected by all who think that the ideal of human brotherhood comes first. That is natural enough from their point of view. 
The logic of facts, however, is against them until all nations adopt the same point of view. Would that we too had had, what we so sorely needed, a strong national feeling. No restrictions were imposed on anyone in the practice of his religion. We went so far in our desire for toleration as to give the Jews wheat and flour for unleavened bread. The evangelical clergy in Courland were wholly on our side, and we were soon on satisfactory terms with the Catholic priesthood of Lithuania. The Polish Catholics however, were hostile to us. To a certain extent the attitude of the people towards us was reflected in that of the church, but the Lithuanian clergy were on the whole better disposed to us than the democracy in Vilna, who soon lost all status through their muddle-headed ambitions. The Polish clergy were the pillars of Polish national propaganda. They had preserved that character even under the Russian knout. They were at war with the Lithuanians and had already overthrown the white Ruthenes. That the Russians should have allowed such a state of affairs is incomprehensible. The white Ruthenes had to conduct their religious service in Polish, not in their own tongue, and this with Russian approval. The assistance of the clergy was invoked there to oppress the white Ruthenes, as their brothers in East Galicia were oppressed. The Poles soon put forward claims in educational matters, and were anxious to have their own university in Vilna, but I refused permission. As long as I controlled the administration we maintained a neutral attitude towards the various races. The Poles regarded us as anti-Polish, because we gave the Lithuanians equal rights with them. I knew we should make no friends by pursuing a neutral policy. I had purposely held aloof from racial politics, as I knew it would be impossible to deal with this question until the Polish situation had been cleared up. As the imperial government did not commit itself to any definite policy, my reserve was justified. In view of the general condition of the country, any political intervention would have been mistimed. I could therefore not make up my mind to ask the imperial chancellor to draw up any definite political program, and merely kept him informed as to my views. Every race had its own newspaper which was, of course, subject to censorship. As a German paper, the Kovnoer Zetung took precedence. For the press and the censorship, Captain Bertkow acted as my advisor. He combined great energy and a detailed knowledge of press technicalities with an independent and mature political judgment, and so was of great use to me. He had previously worked with the publishing house of Ulstein, while the editor of the Kovnoer Zetung, Lute, Osman, had been on the staff of the Deutsche Tage Zetung. With his strong national feeling, he was just what I wanted. I gave all newspapers clear instructions to discuss events in Germany in a spirit acceptable to the imperial government. I could not, of course, permit any political activity on the part of the people. They were also forbidden to hold meetings. Despite the necessary limitation of intercourse among the population, I permitted a certain amount of correspondence. I established a local post, with the aid of the Imperial Post Office. Imperial postage stamps were used, surcharged for the territory of the Commander-in-Chief in the East. Lastly, we allowed freer intercourse between the Lithuanians and Jews and their compatriots in the United States. We observed with satisfaction that the country was gradually settling down, and that life was once more falling into an orderly routine. The German love of order and knowledge of hygiene carried the day. The peasant earned more than he had done under the Russians. In the town's business was revived. The population was governed with a calm and steady hand. I objected to the compulsory military salute introduced by one army. I believe that today the people will acknowledge that we acted with justice and moderation. 9. The economic measures which had been introduced into the occupied territories were carried out in the operations zone by the troops. In particular, many sawmills were erected by the men, there being not only a big demand for planks, but also for wood shavings for the mattresses of officers and men, and bedding for the horses. The monotony of trench warfare was greatly relieved for the men by their industrial employment. I sympathized with this feeling and was glad to find a fresh field in which to serve the fatherland. A very stimulating piece of work had fallen to me, which made heavy demands on me. I came to know splendid men and had to interest myself in many spheres of activity quite new to me. It was a great satisfaction to know that the officers of the military administration placed unlimited confidence in me. My will permeated every branch of the administrative services and kept alive their zeal for work. We felt that we were working for Germany's future, even in a strange land. We especially hoped to open a field for German colonization in Courland. 
I prohibited the sale of land in order to lay the foundation of a sound land and colonial policy, and also to prevent its exploitation. At that time I had in mind plans similar to those which the Navy had carried out with great success at Kiauchu. What the commander-in-chief in the East accomplished in the short time before the beginning of August, 1916, when I left, was a work for civilization. The beautiful gift later presented to me in Ples by the administrative officials will always remind me of the time when it was granted me, in the midst of war, to do constructive work. This work was not wasted, for it certainly helped the home country, the army, and the land itself during the war, but whether seeds have remained in the soil which may later spring up and bear fruit is a question dependent on our hard fate, a question that only the future can answer. The Campaign and Crisis in the East. 10. While the commander-in-chief in the East was quietly working for the welfare of the army and the occupied territory, the war continued on its course. In November and December, 1915, our successes against Serbia and Montenegro had brought on the Fourth Isonzo Battle, and, about Christmas, the Russian offensive on the southern portion of the Austro-Hungarian Front. This attack lasted into January of 1916. Both concluded in a successful resistance on the part of our allies. The two general staffs had now to make their plans for the campaign of 1916. Both were to attempt an offensive to bring about a decision. The German general headquarters proposed to attack at Verdun, while the Austro-Hungarian had in view an offensive against Italy from the Tyrol. This laid on the whole Eastern Front the obligation of giving up reserves and parrying the Russian attacks which could be anticipated with certainty. Strategically Verdun as the point of attack was well chosen this fortress had always served as a particularly dangerous salaport, which very seriously threatened our communications, as the autumn of 1918 disastrously proved. Had we only been able to reach the defences on the right bank of the Meuse, we should have achieved complete success. Our strategic position on the Western Front, as well as the tactical situation of our troops in the St. Mihiel salient, would have been materially improved. The attack began on February 21 and met with great success, especially during the early days, owing to the brilliant qualities of our men. The advantage, however, was insufficiently exploited, and our advance soon came to a standstill. At the beginning of March the world was still under the impression that the Germans had won a victory at Verdun. The Tyrol offensive against Italy by the Austrian troops was only to begin at the end of April or early in May. Owing to the bad railway communications, preparation had to be made very early. To make the offensive against Verdun possible, heavy artillery had to be transferred from the German East Front to the West. General headquarters had brought back the divisions from Serbia, and in order to reinforce the Italian front, the Eastern Front had been greatly weakened by the Austrian general staff. Both offensives were to suffer from the fact that failing impetus prevented the first successes from being followed up. At Verdun, perhaps, as the attack was restricted to a tactical operation, we only just fell short of obtaining a moderately favourable conclusion. But in Italy it was a question of an operation on the grand scale which from the start demanded for success much larger reserves than were available. Yielding to this demand led to a very serious weakening of the Eastern Front, where the position was already critical on account of the great numerical superiority of the Russians, even if a decisive victory were won in Italy. It appears, too, that the successful repulse of the Russian winter offensive had made Austria-Hungary cocksure. I am unable to say whether the two general staffs could have embarked on different operations altogether, or have undertaken a joint offensive against Italy. In any case, the result of the war was not to be decided on the Italian front. The decision could only come in the West, in France. And we should only be strong enough for a decision on that front when the Russians had been defeated. My thoughts turned to Romania. She was the feather in the scales. We had to know what her attitude was. Had Romania, even under pressure, joined forces with us, the Russian army would have been outflanked. This offered great possibilities. If, under pressure from us, Romania turned to the Entente, we should, at any rate, have known how matters stood. We could act without delay with the troops on the spot at the time. The Quadruple Alliance was on the defensive in the Balkans and Asia Minor. Only south of Baghdad Field Marshal von der Goltz was preparing to attack the English at Kut el Amara. As a result of the evacuation of Gallipoli by the Entente, the position of Turkey was considerably improved. I do not know what the Entente had in view for 1916 before the French army was compelled to concentrate on Verdun. It appeared, and indeed it was only to be expected, that they were contemplating great offensives on all fronts. 
the Russian advance into Armenia, which in the spring of 1916 led to the capture of Trebizond and Erzurum, was of no strategic value, and the Russians had no need to make any special effort. They held a more favorable position, and had great numerical superiority over the Turks. The English operations in Persia, Mesopotamia and the peninsula of Sinai were, on the same principle, not directed to the destruction of the Turkish army, but aimed at territorial acquisitions for the British world empire. 11. The German offensive at Verdun in March led to the Fifth Isonzo Battle. This Italian attack, therefore, took place long before the contemplated Austro-Hungarian offensive. It was once more unsuccessful. The Russian army also came on the scenes. The Russian attack in the second half of March against our Eastern Front was much more than an attempt at a relief offensive. It was to be a decisive battle, and had that character from the start. Captured army orders were found, speaking of driving the enemy back beyond the frontiers of the empire. Since the beginning of March rumors had been current of a proposed offensive against Vilna. A concentration of troops had been observed east of Smorgan. The Smorgan-Vilna direction seemed to be indicated. Reports of a coming offensive also reached us from Davinsk and Jakobstadt. Countermeasures were taken. We gathered that it was not exactly imminent, and I decided to go for two days to Berlin on family matters, and attend the wedding of Captain Prince Joachim of Prussia who had been a valuable member of our staff since autumn, 1914. I was in Berlin, on the 11th and 12th of March, when I received news which seemed to indicate that the attack was to begin shortly. So I was relieved to find myself back at Kovno. The Russian bombardment began on the 16th, not, however, in the Smorgan region, as I expected, but on the narrow front between Lakes Narich and Vishniev, on both sides of the Svensiany Postovy Railway, and southwest of Davinsk. The artillery duel was of unprecedented intensity for the Eastern Front. It was resumed on the 17th. On the 18th the infantry attacks began, and continued with intervals until the end of March. The Russian aim was to cut off our north wing in the direction of Kovno, and shatter it by attacks at other points. In the second stage, it was to be thrown back against the coast north of the Nymen. This plan was conceived on a grand scale. The first move in this pinching out process was to cut a piece out of our front in the direction of Svensiany by the two attacks from the Vishniev Narich sector and at Postovy. The front was wide and well chosen. Our reserves would have been insufficient to close up the gap. Besides, it was very difficult to rush them up to the line, owing to the bad railway connection with Lake Narich. The railway was in process of construction. If the gap were once forced, the rest would follow. The way to Kovno would lie open. The attacks on the northern portion of our front were made from the south of Lake Drizvyaty, near Widzi, and chiefly from the bridgeheads at Davinsk and Jakobstadt. From the 18th to the 21st of March the situation of the 10th Army was critical and the numerical superiority of the Russians overwhelming. On the 21st they won a success on the narrow lake sector which affected us gravely, and even the attack west of Postovy was only stemmed with difficulty. The ground had become soft, and in that marshy country water collected in ponds, the roads were literally bottomless. The reserves which we drew from the 10th Army could only make slow progress from the Vilna Davinsk Railway by wading through the swamps. Everyone was strung up to the highest pitch of anxiety, wondering what would happen next. But the Russians, whose offensive had led them into even heavier ground than we had, in and behind our positions, were exhausted, and when the Russian offensive again reached its highest pitch on March 26, we had practically overcome the crisis. The position of Schultz's army group and the 8th Army was no less difficult. Although holding a long front, the body Hussars brigade was compelled to defend itself at Vidzi against the massed attacks of the enemy. It did wonders. Further north at Davinsk the enemy made particularly determined attacks. Divisions of the oldest classes displayed the same spirit of self-sacrifice as the younger comrades at their side. The front was particularly thin at Jakobstadt, but the West Prussian regiments there did their duty. The attacks of the enemy collapsed. The Russian offensive was petering out by the end of March. As has been truly said, without exaggeration, it had been choked in swamp and blood the losses suffered by the Russians had been extraordinarily heavy. Our thin lines, manned by well-trained and brave troops, with their proper quota of officers, had triumphed over the massed attacks of the badly trained Russian army. The efforts of our troops had been very strenuous owing to the swampy ground and wet and cold weather. The front of the commander-in-chief in the east had survived its first great defensive action. 
One would expect such a defensive battle to be less strain on the higher command than an offensive, but in reality it is much more nerve-wracking. The commander must content himself with providing reserves at the right time, but for this to be possible the reserves must be available. That is a difficult matter when the command is forced to live from hand to mouth, as we had to. Further, it is not easy to make up one's mind to transfer reserves before the direction of the attack is known with certainty, and yet it has to be done, or they will arrive too late. Nor is it easy to expect the subordinate commands to give up their reserves, when they themselves anticipate attack. But the cordial relations which existed between Lieutenant Colonel Hoffman and myself and the various army commanders enabled us to settle these serious problems without friction, to the general benefit of the army. At the beginning of April things quietened down. On April 28, in a vigorous operation, carefully prepared by powerful artillery, the 10th Army recaptured the lost ground between Lake Narich and Lake Vishniev. It was the first engagement on the Eastern Front in which we employed the artillery methods which had now become customary in the West. The result was good. We reckoned on a continuation of the Great Russian Offensive. The armies were organized accordingly and reserves held in readiness. By order of general headquarters certain German divisions with the Austro-Hungarian army were sent to us. Later in May fresh attacks from the Riga bridgehead and the region of Smorgan seemed imminent. We took measures accordingly, and even contemplated an offensive of our own. But with the inadequate forces at our disposal, this offensive could only be a local one at Riga, with the object of removing that very inconvenient bridgehead. At the end of May His Majesty visited us. The Kaiser went over the whole of the area under the commander-in-chief in the east. The field marshal and I accompanied him. We also went to Mittau. I shall never forget how German everything seemed there. Everyone who went for the first time to these Baltic provinces had the same feeling, that here was a piece of their own native soil. At the beginning of June we celebrated the victory of our fleet in the Skager Rack battle, another of those great achievements in the war which influenced the attitude of the neutral states. But our rejoicings were damped by our losses, which turned out to be heavier than at first reported. 12. I had followed the doings of our navy with much interest. In peacetime we had set great store by it. Now, as a fighting weapon side by side with the army, it had to fight for victory to save us from strangulation by England. It was to be expected that in accordance with England's historical traditions, her share in the war would take the form of a ruthless fight against the home populations of the central powers, regardless alike of international law or the laws of humanity. It was clear from the start that our warships could not keep the seas open the Mediterranean division went to Constantinople. After the successful Japanese attack on Kiao Chao, whose garrison put up a brave fight, our cruiser squadron in East Asia and the Southern Pacific was left without any support and compelled to return to the home harbours. The Battle of Coronel on November 1, and that of the Falkland Islands on December 3, 1914, mark the victory, distress and extinction of our cruiser squadron. These battles fill every German heart with pride and sorrow. Our cruisers and auxiliary cruisers had sown enemy waters with mines, and from time to time even made the high seas dangerous to the enemy. They brought fresh laurels to German valour, but were unable to accomplish anything decisive. All the same, their deeds were not in vain, for they will ever be a source of pride to the Germans. The Mediterranean division in the Bosphorus was, on the whole, doomed to inactivity, after the Entente had given up the attack on Constantinople. The enemy had a great superiority in the Black and Mediterranean seas. The Austro-Hungarian navy was not very enterprising. After Italy's declaration of war, it made only a few unimportant raids along the east coast of that country. In the Baltic the fighting strength on each side was such as to enable us to maintain our merchant service this was of paramount importance to us on account of the importation of iron ore from Sweden. The navy fulfilled a part of its duties in maintaining the freedom of the Baltic. This enabled the commander-in-chief in the east to establish communication between Libau and the German harbours in the Baltic, which was of the utmost importance for the supply of our troops in Courland. In addition to, to this the fleet practiced in the West Baltic. The bulk of our fleet was in the North Sea protected by our bases at the mouth of the Elbe, Heligoland and Wilhelmshen. We ought to have sought a decisive battle at the beginning of the war. This, indeed, was the desire of Grand Admiral von Tirpitz, though he did not sufficiently insist upon it. Only by this means could we hope to defeat the enemy plans, of which we had no clear idea. 
After the English naval maneuvers of 1910-11, there were signs that England contemplated an extensive blockade. It was in defiance of international law and could only be carried out provided that neutrals, particularly the United States, tolerated it. England avoided battle, though the British had everything to gain by venturing upon it. Tradition, her strength and the war situation should have urged her to it. Had England won such a battle, she would have made it almost impossible for us to import iron from Sweden and the submarine warfare could never have assumed proportions so dangerous to herself. Great Britain preserved her fleet for political reasons. She realized that a battle with the German fleet might cost her not only her place in the world, but also her prestige among her allies and even at home. The other reasons put forward, such as the dearth of docks on the east coast, to enable her to effect swift repairs after battle, are not convincing. It is not to the credit of England's proud navy that she refrained from giving battle. The naval action in the Heligoland Bight on August 28, 1914, was of no strategical importance. Our cruisers were attracted by the love of adventure. Our fleet was more enterprising than that of the enemy. We bombarded the English coast that had not been attacked for centuries. The battle off the Dogger Bank on January 24 was the result of such an attack. Our naval policy of compelling the English to give battle as near our coasts as possible was pursued more definitely when Admiral Xi assumed command of the fleet. On May 31, 1916, he successfully achieved his end. He was not afraid, although far from all our naval bases. Owing to the caution of the hostile fleet, our naval fortresses did not appear to be threatened, and we were able to withdraw their garrisons. They went to form the Marine Corps, which was employed on the Flanders coast after the taking of Antwerp. Certain Marine divisions also fought with distinction in the land campaigns. Meanwhile the submarine warfare on enemy ships within a certain zone round England began on February 4, 1915. At the time this was against the advice of Admiral von Tirpitz, who considered such a plan premature. We had a very small number of submarines, I do not know why. In any case, what the U-boats accomplished was only realized during the war as the successes won by the crews increased, and they gained in experience. The submarine campaign proclaimed on February 4 did not materialize, as for political reasons it was directed exclusively against enemy merchant ships. Further restrictions soon followed that entirely crippled it. After the sinking of the Lusitania it fell into abeyance for the time, but was revived for a short time from November, 1915, to February, 1916. After the sinking of the Sussex on March 24, 1916, Germany declared her intention of prosecuting the campaign only according to the rules of the prize court. The U-boat warfare was thereupon suspended. In their fear of submarine warfare, our enemies did not hesitate to call the U-boat a weapon the use of which was contrary to international law and humane principles. This was a surprising doctrine in view of the perpetual violation of international law by the Entente. New weapons of war create new international precedents. The United States acknowledged this in their note to England of March 5, 1915. Admiral Sir Percy Scott, a man whose opinion carried weight, took up the same attitude in the Times of July 16, 1914. He wrote. Such a procedure, a blockade by means of mines and submarines, would in my opinion be perfectly in order, and, once it had been made, if any British or neutral ships disregarded it and attempted to run the blockade, they could not be held to be engaged in the peaceful avocations referred to by Lord Sydenham, and if they were sunk in the attempt it could not be described as a relapse into savagery, or piracy in its blackest form. We were within our rights, as far as the submarine war was concerned, in adopting such measures as we considered necessary to serve our purpose in the war, so long as they were in accordance with the laws of humanity, and showed due regard for neutrals. We found the right solution, and no criticism can make any difference, as the future will prove. At the very beginning of the war, England, in total disregard of international law, started the war of starvation against Germany and Austria-Hungary. This strangling hunger blockade was intended so to debilitate the body as to prepare the mind for the poison of propaganda. England had another aim, to make war against the children still unborn, so that a physically inferior race might arise in Germany. A more gruesome method cannot be imagined. England acted with inexorable consistency, as so often before in her cruel history. 
Step by step, and of set purpose, the English government, by orders in Council of August 20 and October 29, 1914, and other economic and military decrees, suppressed all direct traffic to the German harbours, all imports through neutral countries, and even the import of the products of neutral countries into Germany. The trump card was the proclamation of the North Sea as a war zone on November 2, 1914. The northern approaches to the North Sea were thereby completely cut off, and the neutral trading vessels were compelled to go through the channel, close to the English coast, and could then only proceed on one track, right across the North Sea. And yet at the beginning of the war England had declared that she would in principle accept the convention of the Declaration of London as her standard of action. Her attitude in the years before the war was also quite different. With the declaration of a war zone she had allowed it to be understood that she would no longer consider herself bound by the regulations of cruiser warfare as laid down by the prize courts, and also that she considered herself justified in the adoption of violent measures against traffic in the war zone. Germany was therefore blockaded, although there was no lawful blockade. The only reason why a true blockade was ineffective, according to the rules of naval warfare, was that England was powerless to hinder traffic in the Baltic. The German declaration of a war zone on February 4, 1915, only a similar measure to the English precedent, gave England an excuse for further severity in the economic war against the Central Powers. In the famous order in Council of March 11, 1915, she declared her intention of seizing all ships entering or leaving Germany. All goods intended for Germany, or exported from there, as well as all goods in German ownership, or of German origin, even if the property of neutrals, could henceforward be taken from neutral ships. This was another unexampled instance of putting might before right. England justified herself by declaring this procedure to be an act of reprisal against the submarine warfare commenced in February, 1915. This defence fell to the ground when Germany, after the Sussex case, formally renounced submarine warfare. Had England acted in accordance with her declarations, she would have raised the so-called blockade, now that the reason for retaliation had lapsed. But she never thought of such a thing. The blockade went on as before. By order in Council of June 7, 1916, England finally abandoned the Declaration of London. In this way those principles, which, despite repeated assurances, no one had attempted to maintain, were formally denounced. The violation of international law was to be made legal and valid. We in the East also felt the effects of England's continued violation of international law. In the long run it was bound to help the cause of the Entente, as the United States, both before and after her entry into the war, had given her sanction, and the neutrals of Europe were in England's power. 13. The German attack at Verdun led to no decisive result. By May it bore the stamp of the first great battle of attrition, in which the struggle for victory means feeding the fighting line with a continuous mass of men and materials. The other parts of the Western Front were inactive. On May 15, the Austro-Hungarian offensive against Italy had at length begun, and at first was brilliantly successful and brought our allies to the asiago arciro line. But by the end of the month it was clear that the operation had lost its impetus. All was quiet on the Macedonian and Turkish fronts, except for the fighting in Mesopotamia. Cut Elamora was taken towards the end of April, but Field Marshal von der Goltz, who had prepared the way for this victory, did not live to see it. He died of spotted fever shortly before the attack. In the east there were signs that local attacks on the Austro-Hungarian army were probable, although the bulk of the Russian army remained on the German front in readiness to attack us there. The Entente were planning a powerful assault on their most formidable enemy, the German army. In the west there was to be the offensive on the Somme. In the east the Russians were to start an offensive, with Baranovici, Smorgan and Riga as its critical points. Their operations on the Austro-Hungarian front in the beginning of June, in the region of Lutsk, Tarnopol and on the Dniester, were more in the nature of a demonstration. At first much larger reserves were concentrated behind the selected sectors of the German front than in the Lutsk and Bukovina sectors. Russia's amazing victories over the Austro-Hungarian troops induced her to abandon her proposed offensive against the front of the commander-in-chief in the east, except for the move in the direction of Baranovici, and concentrate all her efforts against Austria-Hungary. The more the German front proved itself inviolable, the more eagerly did the Russians turn. From it to hurl themselves against their weaker foe, the Austro-Hungarian army between the Pripyat and the Carpathians. The front of the commander-in-chief in the east was therefore denuded as occasion required, in order to bolster up the fronts further south. 
a very intimate connection sprang up between the tactical operations of the army group under Field Marshal Prince Leopold of Bavaria and those of the commander-in-chief in the east, as, indeed, between the whole German and Austro-Hungarian fronts. The previous arrangements between the two general staffs had been good enough for periods of inactivity, but never contemplated such a situation as developed out of the Russian offensive. It was now imperative to act quickly. Reference to the two general headquarters in Charleville or Pless and Teschen might mean a loss of time that could never be recovered. Even in the Great March offensive our liaison system had been found inconvenient. We were only able to avoid friction because we always worked so well with the army group of Field Marshal Prince Leopold of Bavaria and Wojsha's group under his command. From that time the question of a single command had not been lost sight of. First, the proposal to put Prince Leopold's group under the command of the commander-in-chief in the east was frequently discussed. But a wholesale change, such as war is constantly calling for, was what was required, and that meant that the commander-in-chief in the east would have to take over the command of the whole eastern front from the Gulf of Riga to the Carpathians. But bitter experience was needed before this change was effected. Irrelevant matters that had nothing to do with the issue aggravated the problem. In the first place, the Austrian general staff, for reasons of so-called prestige, found it difficult to contemplate any limitation of its tactical authority over the Austro-Hungarian troops. In its interpretation of its powers it jealously maintained the Austrian point of view of not letting Germany's military predominance become apparent. Germany, on the other hand, considered military necessities and nothing else. On June 4 the Russian offensive against the Austro-Hungarian front east of Lutsk, at Tamapol and immediately north of the Dniester began. Their attacks were carried out, though the Russians had no decisive superiority in numbers. In the neighborhood of Tamapol they were completely repulsed by the army of General Count von Bothmer who had taken over the command of the German Southern Army in succession to General von Linsingen, but they broke through in the two other places and won a complete victory. At both points they penetrated deep into the Austro-Hungarian positions. Things were all the more critical because the Austrians had shown such small powers of resistance that at one blow the whole eastern front was in dire jeopardy. Although we were anticipating an attack on our front, we immediately started divisions on the southward march. Field Marshal Prince Leopold of Bavaria's army group also responded to the requirements of the situation. Our general headquarters made heavy demands on both groups, and also withdrew divisions from the west. The Battle of the Somme had not yet begun. Austria gradually broke off the Italian offensive, and sent troops to the eastern front. The Italian army now started a counter-offensive in the Tyrol the face of the war had changed completely. Not much later the opening of the Somme battle and Romania's declaration of war was to make our position still more unfavorable. General headquarters seems to have had some hope of neutralizing the piercing of our lines by the enemy at Lutzt by a counter-attack, an operation similar to our successful counter-attack in November and December, 1917, at Cambrai, and at the same time holding up the advance of the troops that had broken through so far on the Dniester. Thanks to the failure of the Austrian defense, the Russian offensive at Lutzk made rapid progress, and following the railway to Kaul, soon reached the Stockard. The first German reinforcements became involved in the retreat. A new German front was gradually created on the Stockard on both sides of the railway. It was in touch with the Austrian troops who were still holding the STYR. The Russians had not followed up very smartly in a westerly direction, although a great victory was beckoning them. They had too few reserves at hand to make full use of their opportunity. At Sotertsky and Kasilin, some way west of the Stockard, the beaten Austrian army was able to collect its remnants. It was obvious that the wing of the Austrian army which had escaped south of Lutsk would have to swing back quickly to avoid being rolled up. Here again Brusselov was not strong enough for a really energetic pursuit. The arrival of further reserves strengthened the front on both sides of the Kaul lutsk railway. They came up with the 4th Army further south, and somewhere near Goriko formed a strong counter-offensive group behind the Austrian wing retreating to the southwest. Our critical situation did not allow of our waiting for the arrival of all our reserves in order to attack altogether, although Linsingen's group always wished to do so. The counter-attacks of the German troops during the latter half of June and early part of July obtained only local successes. The Russian offensive on the Dniester had broken through the Austrian divisions under General von Flanzer Baltin in the Okna, east of Zaleszki, Sniat in direction, and south of the river soon gained a lot of ground. Chernowitz fell. 
By the end of June the Russians had reached a line from the Dniester, through Klumax, to Kolomia and Kimpelung, and were pushing on toward the Carpathian passes. The Austrian front south of the Dniester, originally a very short one between the river and the Romanian frontier, had now become very much longer, and this long new line was, of course, now correspondingly thin. Owing to the extraordinarily bad railway communications reserves could only be brought up with the greatest difficulty. German troops from the front of the commander-in-chief in the east, as well as the western front, were conveyed to the Carpathians and the Dniester. Even all the fresh divisions that were thrown in were hardly sufficient to hold the front. In these circumstances counter-attacks were inadvisable. They were attempted by our troops all the same, but remained without result. A pure defence from the start would have been our proper course, as the Russians were also contending against extraordinary difficulties of supply and were not very strong. This fact helped the Austrian army more than its own defence. Owing to the complete failure of our allies south of the Dniester, General von Bothmer saw himself compelled at the beginning of July to withdraw his right wing from Buxax as far as the mouth of the Koropiec. Thanks to the excellent influence of our army on the Austrian troops with it, all the Russian attacks had been beaten off. While the Russian onslaught on the Austrian army was gaining its first successes, and when the greater part of the commander-in-chief in the Easts and Field Marshal Prince Leopold of Bavaria's reserves had proceeded to the relief of our allies' front, a violent Russian attack was delivered against Wojcia's army group on June 13. It collapsed completely after extraordinarily severe fighting. The army group and General von Wojcia were compelled to throw in all their reserves. At that time we were anticipating an attack at Smorgan, or, as now seemed more probable, on the old battlefields of March, and at Riga. At these points the Russians were still in very great strength. In spite of this we denuded our front to the utmost to help the armies in the south. We even had battalions to serve as reserves for our long lines. I formed these battalions from men at recruit depots, although I realized that if the Russians had a really great success at any point these units would be but a drop of water on a hot stone. We were absolutely confident that our troops would hold their positions, however thin their lines were. Our anxiety increased with the progress of events. In the first place, the Russian forces on our front had not been noticeably reduced. They had to decide whether they would really attack us, or follow up and consolidate their successes in the south. Of course they realized that we and Austria-Hungary would send reinforcements. They meant to obtain a decision on the Austrian front, but had such large reserves at their disposal that they could attack us in force as well, and thereby prevent us from sending further help to the south. While the Germans and Austrians were concentrating round the Lutsk salient, on the Dniester and in the Carpathians, and in the second half of June making local attacks nearly everywhere, the Russians rushed up reserves to the point where they had broken through and brought the German local efforts to a standstill by counter-attacks. In the middle of July, after severe fighting, in which the Austrian troops had again shown only slight resisting power, they prevented the Germans from developing their initial successes in the Lutsk salient. They pushed forward southwest to the Styx. General von Böhm Ermoli found himself compelled to withdraw his left wing and center to the frontier of Galicia. But in the Lutsk salient the Russian offensive was held up. The enemy gained still more ground south of the Dniester in the direction of the Carpathians. While all this was taking place at the two main points of attack, the Russians embarked on a violent onslaught on the front of the commander-in-chief in the east, between Lakes Narich and Vishniev and at Smorgan, on the army group of Field Marshal Prince Leopold of Bavaria, northeast and south of Baranovici, and on von Linsingen's army group in the bend of the Styr. General Bothmer was also engaged. In July a terrible struggle was raging on the eastern front, while in the west England and France were gaining their first successes on the Somme. We managed to hold out against the attacks, and beat them off in battles lasting many days. The line of Wojcia's group was successfully forced at the point where it was held by Austro-Hungarian troops. To fill the gap we threw in all our carefully hoarded reserves. They held their ground, and from July 8 onwards the battle here died down. The Russian offensive at the bend of the Styr, north of Lutsk, was completely successful. The Austro-Hungarian troops let their lines be broken through in several places. The German units that had been sent to help were once more in a critical position, and on July 7 General von Linsingen was compelled to withdraw his left wing behind the Stockard. The right wing of Field Marshal Prince Leopold of Bavaria's army group, part of Grono's group, south of the Pripyat, had to retire also. This was one of the greatest crises on the Eastern Front. 
we had little hope that the Austro-Hungarian troops would be able to hold the line of the Stockard, which was unfortified. We took the risk of denuding our line still further, and Field Marshal Prince Leopold of Bavaria followed our example. Although the Russian attack might begin again at any moment, we extended our line and released single regiments in order to support the left wing of Linzingen's army group, northeast and east of Kaul. If this wing were to retreat still further it was impossible to imagine when it would end. Those were terribly anxious days. We gave up everything we had, knowing full well that if the enemy were to attack us no one could help us. And that is just what happened. On July 16, the Russians, in enormous force, poured out from the Riga bridgehead west of the Davina and gained ground at once. We went through a terrible time until the crisis here was overcome, thanks to the valor of the troops and the careful handling of affairs by the headquarters staff of the 8th Army who were compelled to use single battalions and batteries as reserves. These battles were not yet over at the end of July, when there were sure indications that the attacks at Baranovici and along the whole course of the Stockard would be resumed. We awaited these with a sinking heart, for our troops were exhausted by constant fighting and had long fronts to defend. The Austro-Hungarian troops had lost all confidence in themselves, and needed German support everywhere. We could see everything that was going on as far as the Stockard, but further south we were less in the picture. We only knew that General von Böhm Ermoli was also now expecting an attack at Brody, that the Russians were continuing their offensive between the Dniester and the Carpathians in full strength, and that they were gaining ground towards the crest of the ridge. General Count Bothmer had stood like a rock in the maelstrom of continuous attacks, and in all essentials remained master of the situation. It was clear that the Russians were gathering strength for another mighty blow, while we were still bleeding from many wounds on the Somme, and the Austro-Hungarian troops were being hard-pressed on the Italian front. Storms were threatening, and our nerves were strung to the highest pitch. 14. We had maintained the closest touch with general headquarters during the difficult and anxious days we had passed through in Kovno since the beginning of June. We had repeatedly pointed out the necessity of unity of command on the Eastern Front. Of course, if necessary, we could have carried on as before, but it had become evident that reserves could be moved about with less friction I, the command of the whole Eastern Front was under one control. Before the end of June the Field Marshal and I were summoned to Pless to give our views on the position in the East. It could only be described as very grave. Of course we came back to the question of the single command, and in this connection we emphasized the necessity of extending the process of mixing German troops with the Austro-Hungarian units. Also, Austro-Hungarian troops could be used on the quieter parts of the commander-in-chief in the East's front. We urged very strongly that the Austro-Hungarian troops, especially the infantry, should be trained on really modern lines. The journey to Pless was fruitless as regards any settlement of the command question, for the opposition was still too great. But General Headquarters decided to form three divisions for the Austro-Hungarian front from troops taken from the Western and Eastern fronts. These were to be ready in Poland for use about the beginning of August. The desired interchange of German and Austro-Hungarian troops was begun, and we received a battle-worn Austro-Hungarian infantry division, which set free the 10th Landwehr Division of the 10th Army. This was immediately handed over to General von Linzingen. In the critical battle situation a second Austro-Hungarian division, which had been placed at our disposal, could not now be withdrawn. The Austro-Hungarian army had arranged their reserves in such a way that at given intervals each infantry regiment had a so-called march battalion, composed of reservists, assigned to it. These battalions were often attached to the regiments as fighting battalions. Regiments that had not suffered at all sometimes contained five or six battalions instead of three, whereas the strengths of others were often very low. What was wanted was an even distribution, and this was uncommonly difficult on account of the many nationalities among the Austro-Hungarian troops. National distinctions among the men were also maintained. What was still more grave was the very inadequate training of the march battalions. They only served to swell air losses in prisoners. We had to take a hand in the training of these march battalions, and we did. We thereby discovered much good and useful material in the ranks, but the officers, who were then still under the control of the Austro-Hungarian command, were of poor quality, and not trained to that strict sense of duty which distinguishes our German officers. On July 27, we were again summoned to Pless. The news of the fall of Brody, which reached us that day, induced the Austro-Hungarian general staff to modify their attitude to a certain extent. 
they agreed to let Field Marshal von Hindenburg take over command of the whole front as far as south of Brody. The armies of General Count Bothmer and General von Flanzer Baltin formed already one army group under the Archduke Charles, with General von Siecht as chief of staff. We were still under the German general headquarters the Archduke Charles S group was under the Austro-Hungarian general headquarters as before. The Austrians could not yet make up their minds to go the whole way, but still the new arrangement offered such considerable advantages that I regarded it as a great step in the right direction. We then returned to Kovno, where I said farewell to the place in which I had spent a happy period of quiet work, and latterly lived through such critical hours. I left many loyal colleagues behind me in the administrative services. The military staff remained unchanged. I had first proposed to visit the army headquarters of the former Austrian front, in order to form my own opinion of the situation. The position of our new headquarters had not yet been settled. There was no question of remaining in Kovno, it lay too far north. For the present we decided to live in our special train. General von Eichem, while retaining his command of the 10th Army, took over the command of Scholz's army group and the 8th Army. The 12th Army was assigned to the command of Field Marshal Prince Leopold of Bavaria. Chapter The Extended Command on the East Front, August, 1916. 1. On the 3rd or 4th of August we were in Cowell, the headquarters of General von Linsingen. His chief of staff was Colonel Hell, hitherto chief of staff of the 10th Army. He had taken over his new duties in July, and was the right man in the right place to deal with this extraordinarily difficult situation. The East Front had passed through another critical period. The terrific Russian offensive had burst on us, and the end of the fighting could not be foreseen. We were heavily engaged, and there was small hope of relief. There were too many troops of the oldest classes on the Eastern Front, and we did not like to place such men in the hottest comers. While the attacks at Riga were dying down, the Russians resumed their offensive on July 23, north of Baranovici, where they imagined they were facing Austro-Hungarian troops and had some success. But this had since been limited by a German counter-attack. The Russian attack, carried out with great violence on the 25th and 27th, remained without result. The actions on the front of von Linsingen's army group had been continued into the second half of July. They never actually came to an end. The strain on this group was severe. The front was not firm. On the 28th of July the big Russian offensive on the Stockhod had begun and continued with unprecedented violence until the evening of August 1st. The Russians had assembled enormously superior numbers and continuously fed their line regardless of losses. At several points there had been very critical moments. German Landwehr had to drive the enemy out of those parts of the Austro-Hungarian lines which he had penetrated. Even the German troops were forced to give ground, as their front was thin and their losses were heavy. But we threw everything into the scale, and the front held. The fighting had extended northwards and involved Grono's army group, which, in spite of the fact that their strength was inadequate for so extended a front, put up a strong defence with exemplary coolness. They employed their few reserves with the greatest economy, and always had something in hand to support General von Linsingen's extreme left wing. The staff of this group naturally took a grave view of the situation, but their resolution was unshaken. There was no doubt that, despite their terrific losses, the Russians would soon resume their offensive and continue it for some time. They had plenty of men, but used them recklessly, and such tactics promised no success, even against our thin fines. The staff of the army group hoped to remain master of the situation. In Cowell I also saw General von Bemhardy, who commanded the sector along and between the railway connecting Cowell, Lutsk and Sarny. He was a born soldier, inspired with an ardent love for his country. In the evening we were at Vladimir Wolinsk, the headquarters of the Austro-Hungarian Fourth Army, which was in General von Linsingen's command. This army had been thoroughly stiffened with German troops. Its commander, Colonel General von Turchansky, an excitable officer, was so obsessed with the idea of Austrian prestige that he gave General von Linsingen a good deal of trouble. We dined with him. March battalions, as a guard of honor for the field marshal, find the route from the station to the mess. The men made a very favorable impression upon us. On this occasion General Turchansky spoke of the behavior of the Austro-Hungarian troops during the recent battles with remarkable frankness. The picture he gave us was anything but cheerful. Next morning we were in Lemberg, the headquarters of the 2nd Austro-Hungarian Army. 
I was surprised by the beauty and German appearance of Lemberg. In this respect it formed a striking contrast to Krakow, which is characteristically Polish. In General von Berm Ermoli and his chief of staff, General Bardolf, we found two very shrewd and clear-sighted soldiers, with whom it was a pleasure for our services to work. They had no illusions about the low powers of resistance of their troops. At the end of July, after the Russian attacks, the army had been withdrawn west of Brody and the Upper Seraph. Both officers were delighted to hear that a mixed German division could be put at their disposal for use in the immediate future. They regarded the continuation of the enemy offensive as a certainty. We enjoyed the congenial company of the officers of this staff for a few hours longer and left them with the feeling that they were full of confidence. But on the front, in spite of our strong positions, we anticipated a critical situation in view of the imminent Russian offensive, as we could not possibly send reserves up in time. In Lemberg I also had a few words with General von Siecht, who took a serious view of the position of the Archduke Charles group, especially south of the Dniester. The Russians had thrust hard against the line west of Tlumaxatinia, and in places reached the crest of the Carpathians between the Tartar Pass and the frontier of Romania. The fate of the Archduke Charles group was a matter of life and death to us. The grave position in which it stood was naturally of the greatest concern to us. If this group retired any further south of the Dniester the left wing, and then the right, of the extended eastern front would be carried back with it. We had continually to allow for the situation of this group. We gave it all the help we could, although it was not under our command. The 1st Infantry Division, which had already fought in the Carpathians in the winter of 1915, was now, by order of our general headquarters, on its way through Hungary to this sector. I should have preferred to have it north of the Carpathians, as there was little chance that the Russians would attempt to envelop our extreme right wing from the Carpathians between our front and Moldavia. Their communications behind their line were much too bad, and this danger could never become serious. It would always be possible to meet it in time, despite the incredible railway communications in Hungary. But the Austrian general staff, at Teschen feared a Russian invasion of Hungary, and their cries for help proved stronger than military considerations. On the return journey to Brest-Litovsk, where we intended to remain for the present in our train, we discussed matters with General von der Marwitz and General Litzmann, who now commanded mixed German and Austro-Hungarian troops in Linzingen's army group. They regarded their position, if the Russians resumed their attacks, and this they anticipated, as very grave, basing their fears on their experiences in recent actions. Both General von der Marwitz and General Litzmann were splendid soldiers and fearless leaders who had the well-being and efficiency of their men very much at heart. We heard the same story everywhere. The situation in the East remained as critical as ever. I had set myself the double task of consolidating the front and training the troops of the Austro-Hungarian army. What measure of success I should have was doubt for you. 2. Our headquarters in the train in Brest-Litovsk station was anything but ideal. We were really very poorly housed. There was no room to work. The big maps alone took a lot of space, to say nothing of our clerical staff. The way in which Lieutenant Colonel Hoffman made the most of what he called his salon was a source of continuous amazement. The other officers had even less room, and on top of all this, the sun beat pitilessly down on the roofs of the carriages and made our stay unendurable. I decided, therefore, to leave the train as soon as possible, and suggested to the field marshal that we should find quarters in Brest-Litovsk itself. The members of the staff had a mild shock. The town had been burnt to the ground and was out of the question, the citadel was a little prison. The commandant of the fortress had made it his residence and fixed up his offices there, but labor had been too scarce for him to make it really suitable. The whole place was neglected and overgrown, for nothing had been done for a long time past. Nettles had grown to a tremendous height and the air was damp and musty. The barracks were still there, but there was not a stick of furniture. But this was nothing, we had to decide something. I made arrangements for our headquarters to be established in the citadel. Of course, it took a considerable time before everything was ready and we could leave the train. I liked being in Brest and did not leave the citadel. The remarkably fine tall willows, with their boughs drooping into the water which flowed through the citadel, and the few short avenues, gave the whole a pleasant aspect. Desolation reigned outside the fortress. The ugly but highly important railway junction and the gutted town offered few attractions. 
I had the barracks cleared of the invading creepers, so that the air could get to the walls and dry out the damp, trees were also felled and branches lopped to allow the sun and air to get in. I took pleasure in putting things to rights. German troops were needed to stiffen the Austro-Hungarian front. The old front of the commander-in-chief in the east had already been so heavily drawn upon that no further demands could be made upon it for the time being. The heavy attack south of Riga had just been repulsed, but it was quite likely to be renewed. We released a few cavalry regiments, a mixed division, about three battalions strong, and some batteries under General Melia. We had already promised these to the Austro-Hungarian army and they were immediately dispatched. Our only reserve for a front of about 1,000 kilometers now consisted of but one cavalry brigade, strengthened by artillery and machine guns, certainly not an enviable position, considering that we had to prepare at any moment to send help to any point of an enormous front. This is but one further example of what we Germans achieved. The cavalry brigade was also destined for the Austro-Hungarian army, and was to be attached to Melius' detachment. Our general headquarters had further forces at its disposal for use in the east. The Turkish 15th Corps was coming. Enver had decided, in view of the critical position in the east, to send an army corps from the Constantinople district to the east front. The German general headquarters intended to strengthen Linzingen's group with this corps. The billeting officers were actually on the scene at the beginning of August, when the situation of the Archduke Charles group determined general headquarters to deflect the Turkish corps, which had only a few trains at its disposal, to East Galicia. The Turks fought well with the German Southern Army, although they had to learn and practice what to them were entirely novel methods of warfare. The formation of the three divisions which General Headquarters had ordered in July for the East was nearly complete, and I should have been glad to have had them at my disposal at once. General Headquarters did not consent, as it did not consider them fit for action yet. A few days later, however, two were handed over to us, while the third was attached to the Archduke Charles group. The Russians had by this time realized that they could do nothing against the German front, and did not again attack north of the Pripyat. They intensified their pressure in Wolhynia and East Galicia, and brought up fresh forces to these points. Even in the first half of August their attacks here were resumed. On the 8th and 9th of August the Russians again attacked Linsingen's group and the right VSDNG of Grono's group along their whole front and were repulsed. Even if the main offensive had come to an end, severe fighting was still in progress, especially along the Stockard east and northeast of Kaul. The Russians succeeded in gaining a footing in a few places on the western bank. This was not in itself of decisive importance, but it made things very difficult for Linsingen's group, which was being taxed to the uttermost and suffering heavy losses. It compelled us to detrain our cavalry at Kaul. Simultaneously with the attack on Kaul, Russian attacks against the Second Austro-Hungarian Army and the Archduke Charles group in Galicia met with success. The right wing of the Austro-Hungarian army was broken through at Zalosh, Melius' detachment prevented the worst, but the front was so rickety that we withdrew it to Zboro. The two new divisions placed at our disposal were put under General von Eben, commanding the 1st Corps, and they just sufficed ultimately to hold the Zboro sector in severe and prolonged fighting. They had come too late to defend the Sereth sector. When this was abandoned by the right wing of the Second Army, the left wing of Bothma's army, which had until then stood its ground, had to retreat also. South of the Dniester, at Tlumax, the Russians had again attacked the Austro-Hungarian troops, thrown them back and taken Stanislaw and Nadwerner. Here their attacks had been victorious, but in the Carpathians the German troops, under General von Konter, including the 1st Infantry Division, had denied them any success. I considered it of the highest importance that we should not suffer reverses in Galicia, in view of their effect on Romania. But the withdrawal of General Count Bothma's army, notwithstanding its stout and prolonged resistance, was unavoidable in view of events south of the Dnieper. It withdrew, keeping touch with the Austro-Hungarian army to the zboro brzeseny line behind the Zlota Lipa, and bent its right wing in the direction of Stanislaw. So, in the middle of August the collapse of the Austro-Hungarian army seemed manifestly possible. The attitude of Romania grew ever more doubtful. From the middle of August onwards the new front, under the control of the commander-in-chief in the east, began to hold. The second Austro-Hungarian army, which, after all, now received our cavalry reserve from Kaul, was placed in support at Brody. It was also so stiffened with German troops that its positions could be regarded as secure. As far as numbers are concerned, the Austro-Hungarian troops would have been quite able to hold their positions without German help. 
but that was impossible in their present condition, and we had to come to the rescue. We helped as much as we could, but the losses of the German troops with the Austro-Hungarian army could never be made good. Linsingen's army group was endeavouring to bring order into its units and form reserves. We sent this group the 1st Landward Division from Mitau, which the Russians were leaving in great numbers. The construction of positions was pushed on, and in this connection we had to supply the 2nd Austro-Hungarian army with a great deal of barbed wire. The rear communications were also organised. It was a case of doing everything we had done further north in the previous autumn, when the armies of the commander-in-chief in the east took to trench warfare after our offensive ended. The conditions of trench construction were similar. We had to start everything from the beginning. Of course, the establishment of a railway network was, on the whole, easier, for whereas the front was then advancing beyond its communications, it was now being forced back on them. All the same, there was a great deal to be done on the Austro-Hungarian railway system, new lines had to be begun and a network of field and light railways constructed close behind the front. Special line of communication arrangements had TCB made in Lemberg for the German divisions in the 2nd Austro-Hungarian army, and the same applied to Hungary for the divisions fighting in the Carpathians. We made a beginning with the training of the march formations on our own principles, and they were to be inspected by German generals. Colonel Prince Oscar of Prussia, who was responsible for the training of the Austrian march battalions in the German Southern Army, did very valuable work. German artillery brigade commanders taught the Austro-Hungarian artillery, which stood very high as regards the technical side of its work, the conduct of an artillery action as required in great modem battles. We initiated the practice, though on a small scale, of exchanging officers. Nothing was left undone that could possibly help to prevent any further reverses to the Austro-Hungarian army, such as we had witnessed in June. There were very many matters, great and small, to be attended to, and the time spent in the citadel of Brest-Litovsk passed quickly. On August 27, Romania declared war on Austria-Hungary. The dual monarchy thereby reaped the reward of Hungary's selfish policy, and with the fruit of our passive acquiescence. On the 28th, at one o'clock in the afternoon, the chief of the military cabinet, General von Linke, telephoned Field Marshal von Hindenburg and myself that His Majesty the Kaiser commanded our presence in Pless at once. That same day, at 4 p.m., we left Brest, never again to return to the Eastern Front. Behind us lay two years of strenuous, united work and mighty victories. First Quartermaster General, August 29, 1916 to October 26, 1918. Chapter The Untanked Offensive, Autumn, 1916. 1. General von Linke received us on our arrival in Pless, about 10 o'clock in the morning of August 29. He informed me that Field Marshal von Hindenburg had been appointed Chief of the General Staff of the Field Army, and that I was to be Second Chief. The title, First Quartermaster General, seemed to me more appropriate. In my opinion there could only be one chief of the general staff, but, in any case, I had been expressly assured that I should have joint responsibility in all decisions and measures that might be taken. When His Majesty received us, he expressed the hope that the crisis at the front would be overcome and the Imperial Chancellor, who was present in Pless at the time, spoke to the same effect. The subject of peace was not touched on by him. The gravity of the situation must have often brought it to mind. The enemy's intentions prevented any steps being taken. My position was a thankless one, as I fully realized. I entered on my duties with a sacred desire to do and think of nothing that did not contribute to bring the war to a victorious end. For this purpose alone had the field marshal and I been called upon. The task was perfectly enormous. The awful feeling of responsibility did not leave me for a single instant. The field of action was in many respects entirely new and uncommonly comprehensive. The amount of work involved was quite unprecedented. Never before has fate suddenly placed so heavy a burden on human shoulders. With bowed head I prayed God the all-knowing to give me strength for my new office. The circumstances in which the field marshal and I had been summoned to take supreme command were extremely critical. Whereas we had hitherto been able to conduct our great war of defence by that best means of waging war, the offensive, we were now reduced to a policy of pure defence. The Entente had gathered up all their strength for a mighty and, as they thought, last great blow, thrown us on the defensive and brought Romania into the field. 
it was to be expected that the attacks on the Western Front, in Italy, Macedonia and south of the Pripyat would be intensified, while the Romanians, reinforced by Russians, would burst into Transylvania on our exposed right flank, or invade Bulgaria from the Dobruja. Somewhere or other we were to receive our death blow. We also had to reckon on increased enemy activity in the Asiatic theater. We were engaged in a battle of titans, unparalleled in history. Our nerves and muscles braced themselves instinctively, for it was a question of saving the fatherland from a position of extreme peril, as we had done at Tannenberg and in the operations around Lodz in less complicated but no less serious circumstances. At the moment I could not then fully appreciate how severely Romania's entrance into the war would affect us economically. The critical military decisions we took in September were not dictated by that aspect of affairs. In this death grapple Germany and her allies had been cut off from the world by a monstrous conspiracy and thrown back upon their own resources, they were facing the great military powers of Europe who had the whole world at their disposal. After the failure of the first great blow against France in 1914 there had been no change in the situation and Field Marshal von Moltz's prophetic words of May 14, 1890, had become a fact. If the war, which for more than ten years has been hanging over our heads like the sword of Damocles, if this war ever comes, its duration and end cannot be foretold. The greatest powers of Europe will oppose one another, armed as they have never been before. Not one of them could be so completely overthrown in one or two campaigns that it would be compelled to admit defeat and declare its readiness to accept the hard conditions that peace would mean, without rising again to renew the struggle within a year. It might be a seven, it might be a thirty years war. The longer the war lasted, the more acutely we felt the overwhelming superiority of the enemy in numbers and war material. On our side the first two years had exacted a heavy toll the flower of our fighting strength lay under the sod. But the army was still strong and resolute and had been able to preserve, or liberate, not only the frontiers of the fatherland, but also those of its allies in the European theater. Only on the Eastern Front had we now suffered a reverse, and that because the fighting power of the Austro-Hungarian army was still on the decline. We had succeeded in calling a halt to our retreat there. We were to retain our power to do so, but it demanded further German help. Austria-Hungary continued to be a drain on German blood and German war industries. Her most pressing needs were coal and railway material. The same was true of Bulgaria and Turkey, although the demand for troops was not so great, but their concern was for money, military equipment and transport material. Germans had to help everywhere. We did so, in many cases without the necessary return. The burden on us was certainly directly relieved by our allies. Without them the war would have been unthinkable, they did their share valiantly but considered they had a natural right to approach us with a constant succession of demands, although their efforts in no way equaled ours. The dot longer the war lasted the more detrimental must these constant allied claims on Germany become to the quadruple alliance as a whole. The whole gigantic burden of this war lay on our shoulders. The enemy had been constantly adding to their numbers since the beginning of the war. Italy had come in. All the powers had created new formations and summoned all their auxiliaries to arms. Now Romania came in against us with 250,000 men. So, despite the adhesion of Bulgaria and Turkey to our cause, and the constant additions to and changes in our war machinery, we were still greatly inferior in numbers. We had six millions at the front against ten millions of the enemy. The equipment of the untanked armies with war material had been carried out on a scale hitherto unknown. The Battle of the Somme showed us every day how great was the advantage of the enemy in this respect. When we added to this the hatred and immense determination of the untanked, their starvation blockade or stranglehold, and their mischievous and lying propaganda, which was so dangerous for us, it was quite obvious that our victory was inconceivable unless Germany and her allies threw into the scale everything they had, both in manpower and industrial resources, and unless every man who went to the front took with him from home a resolute faith in victory and an unshakable conviction that the German army must conquer for the sake of the fatherland. The soldier on the battlefield, who endures the most terrible strain that any man can undergo, stands, in his hour of need, in dire want of this moral reinforcement from home, to enable him to stand firm and hold out at the front. In the situation in which the field marshal and I found ourselves, and in view of our whole conception of the character of this war and the enemy's determination to destroy us, we considered it essential to develop the economic physical and moral strength of the fatherland to the highest degree. 
General Headquarters' demands on the imperial government comprised manpower, war material and moral resolution. We endeavoured, as far as we could, to influence our allies in the same sense. Austria had already raised the age limit of the Landstum to 55, and Turkey raised the limit of liability to service to 50. So they made the utmost use of their manpower, on paper, at any rate. In such a situation general headquarters must devote more attention than ever to the question of using the resources of the occupied territories. These were the definite changes made by general headquarters for the future. The chief of the naval staff advocated unrestricted submarine warfare, which would apply to neutral ships also in the barred zone. That was the most effective assistance that the navy could render the army in its desperate struggle. It was doubtful whether the enemy's naval forces would again give battle, an attempt to bring it on had been made in August, but without result. Enemy minefields progressively restricted the freedom of movement of our high seas fleet, and limited its use. The question of the unrestricted U-boat war was discussed as early as August 30 at the request of the Imperial Chancellor. It was a matter of immediate concern to the Field Marshal and myself that any part of our naval forces should simply lie idle in this contest of nations. It was not enough help for the army merely to keep the Baltic open and contribute the naval corps in Flanders, while the operations of the Entente received decisive assistance from their navy. Only with extreme regret could we refuse to pronounce in favour of unrestricted submarine warfare on the ground that, in the opinion of the Imperial Chancellor, it might possibly lead to war with Denmark and Holland. We had not a man to spare to protect ourselves against these states, and even if their armies were unaccustomed to war, they were in a position to invade Germany, and give us our death blow. We should have been defeated before the effects, promised by the Navy, of an unrestricted U-boat campaign could have made themselves felt. The discussion, however, afforded an opportunity of overhauling our defensive arrangements on the Danish and Dutch frontiers. The Northern Command at Hamburg was instructed to fortify these frontier lines. The Governor-General in Brussels was asked to hurry on, as much as available labour permitted, the construction of fortified lines on the Belgian frontier, with which a beginning had already been made. 2. On the Western Front the Verdun battle was dying down, and in the early days of July the battle on the Somme had not brought the Entente the breakthrough they hoped for. The Second Battle of Attrition of the year 1916 had since then been in full swing on both banks of the Somme, and was raging with unprecedented fury and without a moment's respite. Verdun had exacted a very great price in blood. The position of our attacking troops grew more and more unfavourable. The more ground they gained the deeper they plunged into the wilderness of shell holes, and apart from actual losses in action, they suffered heavy wastage merely through having to stay in such a spot, not to mention the difficulty of getting up supplies over a wide, desolate area. The French enjoyed a great advantage here, as the proximity of the fortress gave them a certain amount of support. Our attacks dragged on, sapping our strength. The very men who had fought so heroically at Verdun were terrified of this shell-ravaged region. The command had not their hearts in their work. The crown prince had very early declared himself in favour of breaking off the attack. When the Battle of the Somme began the Entente had a tremendous superiority, both on land and in the air. General headquarters were surprised at first. Reinforcements were quickly thrown in, but it had never succeeded in wiping out the enemy's superiority in artillery, munitions and aircraft, even to a limited extent. The Entente troops had worked their way further and further into the German lines. We had heavy losses in men and material. At that time the front lines were still strongly held. The men took refuge in dugouts and cellars from the enemy's artillery fire. The enemy infantry, coming up behind their barrage, got into the trenches and villages before our men could crawl out from their shelters. A continuous yield of prisoners to the enemy was the result. The strain on physical and moral strength was tremendous and divisions could only be kept in the line for a few days at a time. They had to be frequently relieved and sent to recuperate on quiet fronts. It was impossible to leave them behind the line, we had not enough men. The number of available divisions was shrinking. In view of the shortage of artillery it was now kept in the line, even when the divisions were relieved. Divisions which were released by battle-worn divisions had, in turn, to leave their artillery behind them and come up behind the battle front. The result was that units were hopelessly mixed up. The supply of ammunition was steadily getting shorter. General headquarters received the ammunition from the war office in the form of ammunition trains, which I myself distributed daily amongst the armies. 
I was always hearing what they required, and knew how little I could give them. Mine was indeed a sad and harassing task. The situation on the Western Front gave cause for greater anxiety than I had anticipated, pound UT at that time I did not realize its full significance. It was just as well. Otherwise I should never have had the courage to take the important decision to transfer still more divisions from the heavily engaged Western Front to the Eastern, in order to recover the initiative there and deal Romania a decisive blow. The field marshal and I intended, as soon as conditions allowed, to go to the Western Front to see for ourselves how matters really stood there. Our task was to organize a stiffer defense and advise generally. But before we went there, some divisions were got ready for Romania and His Majesty the Emperor was induced to give the momentous order for the cessation of the offensive at Verdun. That offensive should have been broken off immediately it assumed the character of a battle of attrition. The gain no longer justified the losses. On the defensive we had only to hold out in a battle of attrition forced upon us. On the Italian front, too, the situation had become worse. In the north, the Austrian troops as early as July retired to the heights north of the Asiago Arsero line, and in the course of a further Isonzo battle in August had to abandon positions they had long held. Gorizia and, south of it, the De Burdo portion of the Carso Plateau were left in the hands of the Italians. Here, too, the fighting power and resolution of the Austrian army had diminished. General von Conrad, whom we saw very shortly afterwards, said that the army had already protected the frontier for one and a quarter years and would continue to do so. More he could not say. This in itself was not particularly cheering. Field Marshal Prince Leopold of Bavaria had taken over the command of the German East Front. I had asked that Lieutenant Colonel Hoffman might be given my former position, for I knew that in that case the work would continue on the same lines. The army group which the prince had commanded hitherto was transferred to General von Woisch, who kept his own army as well. We anticipated further fighting there with a certain sense of security, although the crisis, especially as regards Lin Singen's group, was not by any means over. The Archduke Charles S group had not yet been able to make a stand, and a further retreat was only to be expected. When Romania declared war, the Carpathians assumed a new importance. The movement to envelop our southern wing was no longer restricted to the space between the Dniester and Moldavia. It now had the whole of Romania for its starting point and could become extremely effective. Austria-Hungary had done nothing to protect her right flank and Transylvania, either in peace or war. The railway system was inadequate and the capacity of the few existing lines extremely small. Fortifications had not been erected, in order not to irritate Romania. But Austria-Hungary herself had calmly looked on whilst Romania built works on Transylvanian soil close to the frontier. At the 11th hour weak forces were hastily concentrated there and battalions formed of miners. But there were yawning gaps everywhere. In the North Russian as well as Romanian troops pushed their way across the frontier of Moldavia, and in Wallachia up the Danube into Transylvania and Hungary. The important mountain passes fell into the enemy's hands without a shot being fired. Kronstadt and Petrosini, with their coal mines, were occupied as early as the 29th of August Romanian patrols were soon seen in Hermannstadt. Orsova was taken by the enemy. If the Romanians' advance were not stopped, not only would Archduke Charles's army group be enveloped, but the way into the heart of Hungary and to our lines of communication with the Balkan Peninsula would be open. That would mean our defeat. We were now faced with the difficult problem of holding both the western and eastern fronts against all hostile attacks, supporting Archduke Charles S group, and effecting a concentration against Romania, which would be not merely a guarantee of defence but enable us to pass to the offensive. The execution of this task was made all the more difficult by the appeals of the Archduke Charles S group for reinforcements which ought really to have been sent to Transylvania. General headquarters found itself compelled to withdraw more and more divisions from other fronts. The concentration against Romania was deferred. Not a single man more could be spared from the Western Front. The commander-in-chief in the East received instructions to withdraw units from various points of his already thinly held front, and to form new divisions. Everything was staked on our decision to make the most of our superior mobility in comparison to the Entente and deal with Romania in one great strategic maneuver, but how and when this could be accomplished could not be seen at the beginning of September. The first step to be taken in the execution of our plans was to bring our whole front to a standstill on both sides of the Carpathians, from the left to the right wing. 
the front had to be extended into Transylvania, approximately along the river Maros above and below Maros Vasahali, whilst we attacked the Romanians from Bulgaria, although we were not in strength there, in accordance with the plan of the former chief of the general staff. After the campaign against Serbia had been brought to an end, Field Marshal von Mackensen handed over the command of the Bulgarian Macedonian Front to the Bulgarian General Staff, although he himself remained in the Balkans. When relations with Romania became increasingly acute he had made preparations for the opening of hostilities, and on 28 August had taken over command of the German, Austro-Hungarian, Bulgarian and Ottoman troops on the Danube and the Dobruja frontier. The only forces he had at his disposal were, west of Orsova, the Austrian Danube flotilla, very weak Bulgarian landstam of the older classes, employed in watching the Danube, at Ruschuk, Colonel Bode's mixed German detachment, drawn from the German troops in Macedonia, and a Bulgarian infantry division. Other weak Bulgarian forces were posted to the east of the railway line from Bulgaria into the Dodrubja. Several heavy German batteries and a Turkish division were on their way, but only at the rate of two to four trains a day, as the railways of northern Bulgaria could not cope with more. Bulgaria's attitude to Romania was most uncertain. While Germany and Turkey declared their solidarity with their allies immediately after Romania's declaration of war on Austria-Hungary, Bulgaria did not think fit to do so until the 1st of September. She made no definite stipulations as to her reward for her military assistance, such as the cession of the whole of the Dobruja. At that time the situation on the Macedonian front was responsible for a certain reserve on Bulgaria's part. According to the arrangements arrived at between General von Falkenhayn and the Allies, Field Marshal von Mackensen was to cross the Danube in the direction of Bucharest with the troops under his command. General von Conrad had favoured this operation wholeheartedly, because he thought it promised corresponding relief in Transylvania. The outcome of this movement might mean the defeat of Field Marshal von Mackensen's weak army, either on the northern bank of the Danube or by an advance of the Romanians and Russians over the Dobruja frontier, which at that time was insufficiently protected. Field Marshal von Hindenburg and I rejected this plan, and advocated the invasion of the Dobruja by Field Marshal von Mackensen. This would also be the best means of parrying a possible thrust into Bulgaria from the Dobruja. The idea of crossing the Danube could only be considered when the operations against the Romanian armies in Transylvania made further progress. Later events proved how dangerous this crossing was. General von Conrad accepted the altered plans reluctantly, the Bulgarians very readily, for the Dobruja was calling. Enver of course agreed. Field Marshal von Mackensen received instructions accordingly. While the situation on the northern Romanian front was still particularly uncertain and looked dangerous, we attacked in the Dobruja. 3. The bulk of the Bulgarian army was on the Greek frontier. They were stiffened by German staffs, about one German division, and other German troops, particularly artillery and machine gun, telephone and flying units. Further, Bulgaria received from us, and in a considerably less degree from Austria-Hungary, money and plenty of war material. The Bulgarian railways were far from efficient. We had to take drastic steps to improve their working condition. The Entente had conveyed to Salonika the reorganized Serbian army, as well as forces of their own, but had remained inactive. General Sarail had been appointed commander-in-chief and marked his entry into office by laying a strong hand on Greece and forming units of Venizelis troops. In Albania Austro-Hungarian forces had been stationed since the spring west of Lake Okrida, south of Berat, and on the low of Ojusa. The Italians had occupied Valona, and extended their bridgehead into northern Epirus, which had been annexed by Greece. However, the Entente front between the Adriatic Sea and the Mediterranean was not yet continuous. We were in touch with Greece by the very difficult Caritza route, but this was of no value. Greece was so firmly in the grip of the Entente, and so dependent on them for her very existence, that no one could seriously think it possible to win her over to us. The Bulgarian army, and Bulgaria herself, were willing to continue the war just so long as it furthered their national ambition to become the chief power in the Balkans. For this the Bulgarian army was fighting. It had not, it is true, yet completely recovered from the effects of the two Balkan wars. No military action was to be expected from Bulgaria in any other allied theatre of war. When Turkey joined Germany in 1914, Bulgaria had, as the price of her neutrality, demanded Turkish territory on the right bank of the Maritza and a belt 10 kilometres wide on the left bank, from Adrianople to the sea. 
In return for her entry into the war against Serbia, she laid claim to Serbian territory, and, in the event of Romania joining in, she demanded the whole of the so-called Bulgarian Dobruja, which had been ceded to Romania by the Peace of Bucharest in 1913. Agreements made in the autumn of 1915 regarding the cooperation of German and Austro-Hungarian troops only applied to the Serbian campaign, and no longer held good. The territory conquered in that campaign had been placed under the jurisdiction of Austria-Hungary and Bulgaria. The dividing line was, approximately, the river Morava from its confluence to Pristina Prizrend, and then the course of the river Drina. The headquarters staff of the German 11th Army on the Macedonian front controlled the sector on both sides of the river Vardar. Here was the bulk of the German troops, though we had detachments on other parts of the front. The line of communications inspectorate was at Nish. We had not kept for ourselves one line of communication area in Serbian territory. Only the railways were under our administration. We may thus have avoided political difficulties, but the German troops had to suffer considerable inconvenience as a result of our moderation. Incorporated in the Bulgarian army as they were, they did not meet with that assistance which they had a right to expect so far away from home and which, indeed, the Bulgarians had expressly pledged themselves to render in many matters. The German soldier, with his keener insight, fought on the Macedonian front just as devotedly as he had done on the western and eastern fronts. He knew that even in the Balkan Peninsula he was defending his own home. Neither the Bulgarian people nor the Bulgarian army were ripe for such a lofty view. They did not even grasp it when German troops were taken from the Macedonian front in an endeavour to force a decision elsewhere. Even before the Romanian storm cloud broke, the Bulgarian general staff had decided to take the offensive in the direction of Salonika. This was quite a sound plan from a military point of view. Holding the line of the Struma, with one flank resting on the sea, the Bulgarian left wing would be considerably safer than in its positions along the frontier. The district east of the Struma was occupied on August 27 without serious fighting, as the Greek 4th Army Corps, stationed there, offered no resistance and quietly looked on while the Bulgarian troops marched past. This corps remained in the neighborhood of Drama and Kavala. The German general headquarters immediately ordered our liaison officer to take charge of these troops. They soon placed themselves at our disposal and, with their own consent, were taken to Gorlitz for interment there. All danger to the rear of the Bulgarian army had now been removed. Untank troops were on the line of the Struma. The Bulgarians did not advance any further, as their main thrust via Fiorina had meanwhile failed. The Bulgarians had crossed the Greek frontier at this point on 19 August, with the massif of the Malkanidza, east of Fiorina, which was held by the Serbs, as their first objective. The lower slopes were carried by surprise, but the main attack was repulsed by a violent Serbian counter-attack. The Bulgarian losses were heavy. Their offensive and their spirit collapsed together. The Tsar of Bulgaria and Radoslavov, who were in place at the beginning of September, were full of laments and demanded German troops. Our government strongly supported them in this, against our wishes, and also urged an abatement of Bulgaria's debt to Germany, a matter which I did not at that time fully realize, because it did not concern me. It would have been contrary to sound conduct of the war to yield to Bulgaria's demand for German reinforcements. From the point of view of the war as a whole, more important matters were at stake in Transylvania. General headquarters refused any assistance. I found that the communications between the valley of the Vardar and the plain of Monaster were in no way adequate to supply the needs of the troops which were already there. To send more troops there would have been bad policy. Once more we had, first of all, to put matters on a sound footing, even though the Bulgarians might have to surrender a little ground. That had to be faced. We could not do everything with German troops. But general headquarters gave as much help as the situation permitted. The German army headquarters were transferred from the Vardar to the right wing, with a view to securing correct tactical handling and the adoption of thorough measures for the establishment of rear communications. German railway troops and labor battalions had to take this work into their own expert hands. This mountainous country was exceedingly difficult, and it took them many months to do what should have been done before the Fiorina offensive was undertaken. General Jekov was the Bulgarian commander-in-chief. He was a loyal supporter of the alliance, but did not possess those outstanding qualities which are required of a leader in a modern war. Besides, he lacked the necessary training. 
His character was irreproachable, but he had not sufficient resolution to remedy various grave defects in the Bulgarian army. He was entangled in narrow party politics and so forgot the war. His chief of staff at that time was Lukov, a man of unsound judgment and an intriguer who is responsible for the misfortune of his country and the Quadruple Alliance. I found it difficult to get a clear idea of the psychology of the Bulgarian people. They appeared to me to have strong national feeling and to be quite ready to fight for the position of first power in the Balkans. Radoslavov was a Germanophile from inward conviction. He stood and fell by the alliance. In putting forward demands on Germany and in his greater Bulgarian policy, he was exceedingly obstinate and gave free rein to all agitation in that direction, so that he could play off the national wishes against us. But he forgot that in so doing he was making his own position very much more difficult for peace negotiations. He also did nothing to enlighten his people about the necessity of the war. Perhaps he did not fully realize it himself. The Tsar of Bulgaria was just as firm a supporter of the alliance. He was an uncommonly clever man, but a lover of skillful diplomacy rather than a man of action. He liked to have several irons in the fire and thought he could always postpone decisions. Thanks to the great ability with which he managed the Bulgarians, this policy had been good enough for peacetime, but it was not enough in war. I was particularly sorry that he was no soldier, and therefore did not exercise that influence over the army which his high position demanded of him. The Crown Prince Boris, excellently trained by his father, was a thoroughly soldierly personality and mature beyond his years. He had a clear understanding of military necessities. Our staffs in Bulgaria and I myself like dealing with him. This people cannot find a better ruler. 4. The situation in Turkey had improved since the forces of the Untant evacuated the Gallipoli Peninsula. It had now become possible for Enver Pasha to place some troops at the disposal of the German general headquarters he realized, quite rightly, that as far as Turkey was concerned, the war would now be decided in other theatres. Of course, these troops had first of all to be trained, clothed and equipped. That took time. At the end of July and the beginning of August the Turkish 15th Corps had been sent to Galicia, and now an Ottoman division was sent to the neighborhood of Varna. Enver took these troops from the army of Marshal Lyman Pasha, to whom the defense of Constantinople and the coast of Asia Minor were still committed. The English had driven the Turks out of the Sinai Peninsula they were now busy building a full-gauge railway and a pipeline, as soon as sufficient progress had been made with these works an enemy invasion of Palestine was to be anticipated. The Turkish success at Kut el Amara had had no sequel. The English were preparing a new operation against Baghdad, and this time it looked as if it was to be carried right through. The resumption of active hostilities here was to be expected sooner or later. Both operations were bound to succeed if the English really took their task in hand, as now appeared to be the case. But the stouter the Turkish resistance, the larger the force they would have to employ. For that reason the fighting value of the Turkish army was a matter of the greatest importance to us. The stiffer the Turkish defense in Palestine and Mesopotamia and the larger the force absorbed in the English effort to achieve their object, the more our burden in the West would be lightened. Of course in their Indian contingents the English had troops at their disposal which they did not care to use in France, so that their employment in Asiatic Turkey did not benefit our situation in the West. All the same, it increased the military demands on the British. The Turkish enterprises in Persia in the direction of Hamadon were merely episodes, and of no importance for the conduct of the war. In eastern Asia Minor, west and south of the Trebizond Erzingen Mush line, Russians and Turks stood facing each other, inactive. The strengths of both armies appeared to be extraordinarily low. I have never been able to find out exactly what the Turkish strength there was. We no longer anticipated any more great Russian offensives, because this theatre presented too many difficulties for Russia, as well. The Turkish army was exhausted. To begin with, it had not recovered from the Balkan War before it was involved in another its wastage from disease and inaction was continuously high. The trustworthy, brave Anatolian had vanished from its ranks. The unreliable Arab auxiliaries were playing an increasingly important part everywhere, but especially in Mesopotamia and Palestine. The forces were now below their paper strength and the men were badly fed and still worse equipped. The lack of efficient officers was particularly felt. Lyman Pasha, relying on his authority, endeavoured again and again to make his divisions into an efficient fighting instrument. He did all that could he done. 
when Turkish troops left his hands to come under German leadership, in Galicia or against Romania for example, they behaved quite passably, and sometimes well, but where they were under a Turkish command they soon forgot what German thoroughness had taught them. Besides money, Turkey received from us officers and technical units, as well as war material, though the amount of this was regulated by the very limited number of trains to Constantinople which were at our disposal. Lyman Pasha's divisions could not be equipped here. The further transport of war material for the troops in Palestine and Mesopotamia or the Caucasus front was also so limited, that these were only very poorly equipped. This reduced still further their fighting power, which was low enough already on account of their small numbers. We tried to increase the capacity of the Turkish railways by supplying material and technical personnel. The Turkish government preserved its attitude of hostility towards the other races. In spite of my entreaties, Turkey made no serious attempt to break with her old policy towards the Arabs. In any case, perhaps it would have been too late. English gold did the rest. The Arabs turned more and more against the Turks. It was a miracle that Turkey was able to hold the Hejaz Railway and Medina almost to the end of the war. At the beginning of September, Enver, too, came to Ples he was a very gifted man and made an unusual impression on us. He was a true friend of Germany and there was a bond of warm sympathy between us. He had a real military instinct for the art of war, but he lacked both the knowledge of first principles and professional qualifications. Nor had he received a thorough training. His great military ability had no chance to develop. His sending Turkish troops to Galicia and against the Romanians proved his sound military judgment. On the other hand, he was always clamoring for war material on a scale that could not possibly be supplied. The majority of the available trains to Turkey via Sofia were used for coal, which was sent from Upper Silesia to Constantinople. Over and over again I begged Enver, the very distinguished Talat, and other Turkish high officials, who visited us, to increase their home output of coal, which appeared perfectly possible. If they had, there would have been more transport space for war material. I discussed with them the great importance of railways in warfare, and showed them how Turkey could help herself in this respect. I made little impression on them and they certainly showed no disposition to accept my suggestions. They continued to assail me with their demands, although it was plain that no notice could be taken of them. Turkey did practically nothing to improve the working of her coal mines and railways. The young Turks were firmly in power in Constantinople. The people themselves held aloof. When I took up my new duties, the outlook in Turkey was far from reassuring. I could only think with apprehension of Mesopotamia and Palestine. 5. Wherever personal discussion was impossible, liaison with OUI allies was assured by military representatives. The German General von Kramen was responsible for communication between ourselves and the Austro-Hungarian General Headquarters, and he fulfilled his often difficult task with extraordinary skill and great personal tact. Thanks to him our relations with the Austro-Hungarian General Headquarters became steadily more intimate. The Austro-Hungarian military representative at the German General Headquarters, Lieutenant Field Marshal von Klepsch, kept more in the background. He was also an exceptionally gifted man, who contributed largely to avoidance of misunderstandings, and was always ready to work with us in the spirit of unshakable comradeship. Our dealings with Bulgaria passed in the main through the hands of Colonel, late General, Ganchev, the Bulgarian representative at our headquarters. He was an uncommonly skillful and clever personality, who represented Bulgarian interests most efficiently, without losing the wider point of view. He was a loyal friend of the alliance, and later, on the king's abdication, accompanied him to Germany. The German military representative in Sofia, Colonel von Marsau, who stood very well with the Tsar, was often called into aid, and had continually to smooth away the difficulties to which the peculiar character of the Bulgarian so easily gave rise. The Turkish military representative, Lieutenant General Zeki Pasha, an Ottoman of high rank and a loyal friend of Germany, was a remarkably skillful and tactful upholder of his army's interests. The German representative in Constantinople, General von Lossau, was particularly well informed on Turkish subjects, and a personal friend of Enver Pasha. Naturally, we frequently had recourse to his services. As the chief of staff at the Turkish general headquarters was a German, first. General Bronsart von Schellendorf, and subsequently General von Sieg, relations with this body were naturally particularly intimate. 
when the field marshal and I arrived at Pless, the question was just being mooted of the establishment of a single command for the Quadruple Alliance in all tactical and strategical matters. I warmly advocated it and had the pleasure of seeing it carried out soon afterwards. The final decision lay with His Majesty, who gave permission to the field marshal to do everything by order of His Majesty. In practice the actual control was limited, we had no definite knowledge of the quality of our allies' troops, and were thus unable, for example, to direct that only so many troops should be retained on Austria's Italian frontier. In practice we generally came to some mutual arrangement, but the directions issued by the German general headquarters carried with them a certain authority which proved to be of great utility. The field marshal and I had, accordingly, the conduct of operations in the west, and in the east as far as the Dobrugia in the south. With regard to the Romanian campaign, it was necessary to come to an arrangement with our allies, and in particular with Austria-Hungary. The Austro-Hungarian headquarters staff in Teschen had under its command the army group of the Archduke Charles and the troops that were now moving into Transylvania. They depended, however, so largely on the measures we ourselves were about to take, that the assumption of the single command by our general headquarters made no difference whatever in fact. The Italian and Albanian fronts were the exclusive sphere of General von Conrad. Conditions in Macedonia, Bulgaria and Turkey demanded our closest attention, but we could not have the final voice there. One result of the establishment of the single command was that the general staffs of the various allies had recourse to us whenever disagreements broke out between them. In Balkan questions, the Bulgarian general headquarters was very reluctant to have any direct dealing with Turkey or Austria-Hungary, while the latter, in its turn, preferred to deal with us rather than with Bulgaria. 6. His Majesty the Emperor was Supreme War Lord. In him resided the ultimate authority over the army and navy. The commanders-in-chief of the land and sea forces were responsible to him. Subject to His Majesty's pleasure, the Chief of the General Staff of the Field Army had full control of the direction of operations. Decisions of the first importance required His Majesty's approval. He had no executive authority. The Emperor was thus the head of General Headquarters. I may mention that, when I use this latter expression in these memoirs in the narrower sense as referring to the General Staff of the Army in the field, I do so in accordance with the current, though incorrect, practice. The chief of the naval staff, as the director of operations at sea, had the same status as the chief of the general staff of the field army. As regards such operations he had the same rights and duties. The general staff and the naval staff have always worked well together. The governors general in Brussels and Warsaw were directly responsible to his majesty, and took their directions from the chancellor in matters of policy. In military questions they took directions from general headquarters, on one occasion it proved necessary to obtain an order from His Majesty when we wanted some horses from the Warsaw government. The other occupied territories fell under the administration of the quartermaster general, and thus under general headquarters the real authorities in these areas were the army headquarter staffs. The ministries of war of Prussia, Bavaria, Saxony and Württemberg ranked equal to ourselves. They had their representatives at general headquarters, in the person of the military representatives of the separate contingents. The Bavarians were always changing their representative. Latterly General von Horitz, and after him General Kobel, held the position. Saxony and Württemberg were represented by Generals von Ulitz and von Gravenitz, the latter being afterwards succeeded by Lieutenant Colonel Holland. The other function of these officers was to uphold the interests of their own armies as against general headquarters it must be clear that not even in the German army was jealousy wholly non-existent. If any difficulties arose in any part of the field, one national contingent was at times disposed to lay the blame on another. At one time there would be complaints of too heavy losses, at another of too little opportunity to shine. There were also personal questions to be settled with the military representatives. These officers cooperated well with general headquarters I think I must have convinced them that I attended to their interests in an impartial spirit. I have never made any difference between the four contingents. They all did their duty and all had their good and less good divisions. Württemberg alone had only good ones. The Baden divisions deserved the same praise, although they did not form a separate contingent. In spite of the variety of the peoples composing it, the army held together well. It was only after a long period of nerve-wracking toil that a certain spirit of hostility manifested itself between the Bavarians and the Prussians. And this never applied to officers of higher rank. 
The Prussian War Ministry was represented by Major Stieler von Heidkampf, who gave me devoted assistance in my many difficult tasks. In many directions the war ministries complied with our requests, and I found them loyal helpers. When, however, the exigencies of war began to affect the home life of the people more and more intimately, the officials could not shake themselves free of home influences. They succumbed instead of rising superior to them, and thus failed to give the army that moral support it so urgently needed. I had no dealings with the general officers commanding the army corps districts, except on questions of patriotic instruction. They were not under the orders of general headquarters under the Belagerungsgesetz they were absolutely independent, and after the creation by the Reichstag of a supreme military authority, in the autumn of 1916, they were made responsible to the war ministers, as was already the case in Bavaria. Footnote, Belagerungsgesetz, literally, the law of the state of siege, corresponding in some ways to our defense of the realm regulations. By this appointment the Prussian war minister became of much more importance to the successful prosecution of the war. His responsibility was much greater, and he had now frankly to remind the Chancellor of his duty to strengthen moral, in order that that of the army should not suffer. He had also to insist that order should be maintained at home from whatever quarter it was threatened. This was what the army expected of the Prussian war minister. The attitude of the government and the law creating a supreme military authority lowered the status of the general officers commanding of the corps districts. Indeed, it was the precise object of that law which was aimed primarily at them and all their works. It is true that in the interpretation of the law relating to associations and in the application of the censorship, as well as in many other matters, it was a great disadvantage to have a multiplicity of authorities, and must have led to considerable confusion. One common definition of the powers of the government would have been far better. But this was wanting, and the war minister did not succeed in supplying it. More and more, as the Chancellor yielded to party pressure, uncertainty and confusion spread from Berlin to the provinces. Independent action on the part of the general officers commandings of the corps districts became rarer and rarer. The law creating the supreme military authority, which might have done good, was ultimately fatal to us. A further authority, with which general headquarters had to deal as of equal status, was the chief of the military cabinet, who was responsible to the emperor alone. He worked well and conscientiously, forming his opinion simply on the reports of the staffs. He received my views also in the case of the general officers commandings of armies and the corps districts. Beyond this, general headquarters had nothing to do with personal questions, save that it was morally responsible for officers of the general staff, and also for the award of decorations. I should like to have seen at the head of the military cabinet men who had had real personal experience of the fighting, so that we could rely upon them to do justice to the corps of officers. As it was, this body worked too closely on the lines of its peacetime routine, and did not bring strong characters to the front. In questions of decorations, too, the importance of which must not be underestimated, the chief of the military cabinet had jurisdiction. Here, too, he relied upon the reports of the army headquarter staffs. Unfortunately, too long elapsed between the recommendation and the actual grant of decorations. It was only after long and continuous pressure that General Headquarters managed to secure the grant of a wounded badge. The conduct of the war in the colonies was in the hands of the colonial secretary. In peacetime he had not maintained close touch with the general staff on the subject of the conduct of military operations in the colonies. In 1904 General Count von Schlieffen only obtained the control of operations in South West Africa by a special order. The colonial office had not paid sufficient attention to the defensive possibilities of the colonies. One cannot estimate too highly the benefits France has reaped from her colonies in the prosecution of the war. Especially in the summer of 1918, she carried on the fighting largely by means of colored troops. We could never, of course, have done this, but we might have reaped greater advantage from our colonial possessions. The band of German heroes in East Africa succeeded in drawing off powerful enemy forces, which thus could not be used against Turkey, and had to be replaced to some extent by other troops, thus weakening the Western Front in the long run. I followed the campaigns in the colonies with interest, and was surprised that South West Africa did not act with more energy. It should not have fallen so rapidly. I do not know the causes of its fall. The lack of attention of the home government to questions of colonial defense cannot have been the sole reason. In East Africa, in the autumn of 1917, between the Rufiji and the Rivuma, and later, on Portuguese territory until the end of the war. 
General von Letto Vorbeck gave a magnificent proof of German courage in foreign parts. General headquarters and the Chancellor had equal status. Here, too, the common head was the Emperor. Our dealings with the imperial government were frequent, and not too pleasant. We did not meet with that spirit of accommodation which was so necessary when we told the government what the successful prosecution of the war demanded of them, if the German people were to be rendered capable of victory. The representation of military interests in all questions of foreign policy during the war and in connection with the conclusion of peace meant frequent dealings, and much friction also. The machinery of government in Berlin gave the impression of being extremely clumsy. The various departments worked side by side without any real sympathy or cohesion, and there was infinite overlapping, the left hand often did not know what the right was doing. A Bismarck could have made these departments cooperate properly, but the task was beyond our war chancellors. Relations between the general staff and the government were improved and simplified in February, 1917, by the Chancellor appointing a personal representative at general headquarters at first this was under Secretary of State von Stein, who was like a breath of fresh air all the time he was with us. In the autumn of 1917 the position was taken by Count Limburg Styrum, a skillful and well-informed man of great patriotism. Dealing with him was a real pleasure. In much the same way Colonel, later General, von Winterfeld represented the general staff at the Chancellor's Department in Berlin. He worked at his difficult task with devotion and tact. General headquarters had further to deal with a whole series of imperial offices, and also, in questions of communications, with the governments of the larger states. I greatly missed the assistance of a strong imperial executive. The disadvantages of our complicated constitution were plainly evident. The desire for an imperial ministry of war was mentioned to me by several far-seeing Bavarian officers of high rank. I could only agree with them, and beg them to advocate that view in Bavaria. The question of unifying the constitution of Germany is now under discussion and I trust that it may be achieved as a further step in the development of our country. It must not be forgotten, if changes are made, what Germany owes to Prussia and to the other states. The military attaches in neutral states were at the disposal of general headquarters, as in peacetime. They were subject to the ambassadors and did no political work. They reported any military matters direct to the general staff, a copy of their report being supplied to the ambassador. This method of working did not give rise to difficulties. The attaches also worked on propaganda in conjunction with the ambassadors. In this branch of their activities they received their instructions from Colonel von Heften. In the Allied countries our military attaches had similar tasks. Here, too, they had nothing to do with politics. Their most important duty was to act as liaison officers between our general headquarters and the general staffs of the Allied armies. 7. On the 5th of September the field marshal and I paid our first visit to the West. We travelled via Charleville, where general headquarters had been established hitherto, to Cambrai, the headquarters of the Crown Prince Ruprecht of Bavaria. The Crown Prince came to meet us on our way into Charleville. A company of the famous von Raw Storm Battalion formed the Guard of Honor for the Field Marshal. For the first time I saw a formation in full storming kit, with the steel helmets which had proved so extraordinarily useful. We had not had them in the East. The Crown Prince was greatly pleased at the abandonment of the attacks on Verdun, a course he had long and earnestly desired. He discussed other matters also, and mentioned to me his desire for peace, he did not explain how this was to be obtained from the untarned. In Charleville the field marshal saw the officers of general headquarters. The division of general headquarters into two groups, and the immense distance between Pless and Charleville, had proved very inconvenient in every way. The excellent telephone and telegraph service was no substitute for personal discussion. I would have preferred to have general headquarters entirely in the west, although not at Charleville which was not a convenient place. The German troops in France and Belgium had to bear the burden of the war in its most merciless form and our anxiety to be geographically near them was natural enough. General headquarters was, however, compelled to remain at Pless, as the operations in Romania required that we should keep dose touch with General von Conrad in Teschen. General headquarters was, therefore, moved to the east and established in Pless, Katowice and other towns. The conference in Cambrai took place on the morning of the 7th, while a violent struggle was proceeding on the Somme. we were all obsessed by thoughts of that terrible conflict. The Western Front was not at this time well organized. 
the constitution of the armies into army groups had not yet been carried far enough. The army group of Crown Prince Ruprecht had been created as a result of the Somme fighting in August. It included the 6th Army before Arras, which the Crown Prince himself had hitherto commanded, and the two other armies also engaged, the 1st and 2nd, under Generals Fritz von Below and von Gorwitz. The army group of the German Crown Prince was of earlier origin, it consisted of the 3rd Army near Reims, the 5th at Verdun, led by the Crown Prince himself, and the army detachments A and B in Alsace and Lorraine. Not forming part of any army group was the 4th Army under Field Marshal Duke Albrecht of Württemberg, on the right wing of the army, and the 7th Army, under Colonel General von Schubert, between the two army groups. At first we decided to make no change in these arrangements, beyond putting the 7th Army in the Crown Prince Ruprecht's group and shortly afterwards forming a special army group under the German Crown Prince. There were now only three sections under the direct command of General Headquarters, the wholesale reorganization of the West Front could not be undertaken until there was a pause in the fighting. The Chief of Staff of the 4th Army, General Ilse, and Generals von Kohl and von Lutwitz, the Chiefs of Staff to the Crown Prince Ruprecht and the German Crown Prince's groups, gave us a summary of events on their sectors. Colonel von Losberg in his serious way, and Colonel Bronsart von Schellendorf with his usual vivacity, supplemented General von Kohl's report of the Battle of the Sommer with more detailed and intimate descriptions of events. The loss of ground up to date appeared to me of little importance in itself. We could stand that, but the question how this, and the progressive falling off of our fighting power of which it was symptomatic, was to be prevented, was of immense importance. It was just as necessary to have a clear idea of our fighting capacity as to know whether our tactical views were still sound. The first was an easy matter, the second of extreme difficulty. Opinions vary as much in strategical and tactical as in political and economic questions. It is just as difficult to carry conviction. The symptoms are recognized, but the underlying causes are the subject of controversy. In such circumstances a cure is a difficult matter. The army is a very conservative body. It was so in peacetime, and war made no difference. My mental picture of the fighting at Verdun and on the Somme had to be painted a shade darker in view of what I had just heard. The only relief in it was the heroism of our German men, who had suffered to the extreme limit of human endurance for the sake of the fatherland. I cannot repeat all the moving stories of the battle which I heard. The finest description of the battle has been written by a young officer of the doughty Hamburg regiment, it is an epic in prose. I began to realize what a task the field marshal and I had undertaken in our new spheres, and what a burden we should lay on the leaders and troops in the west, if we drew on them still further for our offensive in the southeast. On the Somme the enemy's powerful artillery, assisted by excellent aeroplane observation and fed with enormous supplies of ammunition, had kept down our own fire and destroyed our artillery. The defence of our infantry had become so flabby that the massed attacks of the enemy always succeeded. Not only did our moral suffer, but in addition to fearful wastage in killed and wounded, we lost a large number of prisoners and much material. The most pressing demands of our officers were for an increase of artillery, ammunition, aircraft and balloons, as well as larger and more punctual allotments of fresh divisions and other troops to make possible a better system of reliefs. The breaking off of the attack on Verdun made it easier to satisfy their wishes, but even there we had to reckon in the future with considerable wastage, if only on account of the local conditions. It was possible that the French would themselves make an attack from the fortress. Verdun remained an open, wasting sore. It would have been better to withdraw our positions out of the crater area. At that time I had not a thorough grasp of the local difficulties of the Verdun fighting. After the summer, the fortress still required the most attention, in spite of that the 5th Army would have to surrender a considerable amount of artillery and aircraft. The other armies would have to be dealt with still more ruthlessly. They would have to hold longer fronts and release divisions, artillery, aircraft and balloons for the battle front. Weak spots would naturally result, but we should have to put up with this, if we intended to hold on the summer. That was imperative, as no rear lines had been prepared. General headquarters could at last count on a few new divisions, which were gradually got ready. Conditions on the battle front as regards artillery and air strength were bound gradually to improve, as the more rapid reinforcement recently introduced began to have effect, only the question of munitions gave cause for anxiety, although I had already drawn heavily on other fronts. It appeared possible, thanks to this better supply of divisions, that Ruprecht's army group would gradually be relieved of the necessity of living from hand to mouth. 
it was then to be hoped that a proper system of putting in and taking out divisions in sequence would result. I had to attach the greatest importance to this, in consideration of the internal organization of the army and in the interests of the men, a supply, both for men and horses, was suffering. After general headquarters had given help in the matter, I firmly insisted that units should not be mixed up. Hitherto this had not been possible owing to force of circumstances. This special arrangement did not get rid of the necessity of continually relieving worn-out divisions by others. A very essential, and indeed, difficult and responsible task of my operations department, was to have divisions always ready which could immediately be made available for the summer battle. The condition of the troops had to be accurately gauged, so that we could arrange for their removal from a quiet front for service on more or less important sectors of the battle line. The reinforcements which were released for the battle could not be sent up to the front line in rotation. The railways were already considerably overtaxed by the ordinary traffic to and from the battle lines. An enormous number of additional trains had to be run. Two or three weeks had to pass before full effect could be given to this new arrangement. In that time all our calculations might be upset by enemy successes and new demands might have to be met. That lay in the hands of fate, not to mention the enemy. For the moment everything had been done which the stress of circumstances made at all possible. In the province of tactics it was necessary to restore the supremacy of the aggressive function of the artillery in getting onto, and destroying, the enemy's guns and infantry before the infantry attack was launched. We had previously had to renounce this on account of our inferiority in guns and ammunition. The barrage had come to be regarded as a universal panacea. The infantry insisted on it, but unfortunately it had come to confuse many sound theories. A barrage is all very well in theory, but in practice only too often it collapses under the storm of the enemy's destruction fire. Our infantry, which had come to rely on the barrage alone for protection, were far too inclined to forget that they had to defend themselves by their personal efforts. The increase in the number of the guns and the amount of ammunition required, first essentials for an effective use of artillery, had to go hand in hand with a more resolute handling of the artillery action by the higher staffs and by better shooting, by means of aerial observation. I and many other officers advocated that the artillery action should in general be directed by divisions in conformity with precise orders from superior authority. This view met, of course, with opposition, it gradually came to be recognized as the only sound one. Every divisional commander was to have a special high artillery officer for the direction and control of this arm. The want of some such arrangement had made itself felt very deeply. Artillery and aircraft were to cooperate more closely. The airman would have to develop a liking for artillery ranging work. A battle high up in the air, with a chance of high honors and a mention in army orders, was decidedly more exciting and wonderful than ranging for the artillery. Comprehension of the great importance of artillery ranging work was only gradually inculcated. As a fighting instrument for use against ground targets, aeroplanes did not then play such a systematic role as they did in 1917, and more particularly in 19x8, but as early as the Battle of the Somme the enemy's aircraft, descending very low, played havoc with our infantry by machine gun fire, not so much by causing heavy casualties as by making the troops feel that they had been discovered in places which heretofore they had thought afforded safe cover. This feeling of apprehension was so strong at first that rifles and machine guns were often not put to that use for which they would have been most effective. In the end of ends, infantry is the deciding factor in every battle. I was in the infantry myself and was body and soul an infantryman. I told my sons to join the infantry. They did so, but, as happened to so many of our young men, the freedom of the air drew them from the trenches. But the fine saying of the old directions for infantry exercise will always remain true in war, the infantry bears the heaviest burden of a battle and requires the greatest sacrifice, so also it promises the greatest renown. Heavy indeed is the burden of the infantry in this as in other wars. They have to endure the heaviest bombardments of the enemy, lying quietly in dirt and mud, in damp and cold, hungry and thirsty, or huddled in dugouts, holes, and cellars, they must await the overpowering assault, until, leaving the safety of their shelters, face to face with death, they must rise to meet the destroying storm. Such is their life. It can be endured only when discipline has prepared the way, and when a deep love of the fatherland and an imperative sense of duty fill the heart. The glory is great. But the highest reward lies in the proud consciousness of having served the fatherland more than all others, and in the sense that one's own courage has wrung victory out of the battle. 
those who have stayed at home cannot picture it to themselves too often. Before such heroism they must bow their head in silence, and not talk. In appraising achievements, equal justice must be done to all those who fought like the infantry, the pioneers, the dismounted cavalrymen, the field telegraphists have equal glory. To all of them the same fine sentence in the training regulations applies. In speaking thus, I do not wish to belittle what the other arms of the service accomplished. They all had the same appreciation and care from general headquarters the airman, too, shares the feeling of victory, the deep satisfaction of knowing that even in the air a man has his worth. But he is not subject to the disintegrating influences of battle. The artillery had to endure the same strain as the infantry. The longer the war lasted, the higher their losses became, in defense as in attack. It became increasingly clear that they were the keystone of the battle and the mainstay of the front. All the same, the artillery need not fight with the infantryman over that sentence in the regulations. He would certainly be right if he contested the suggestion that the infantry is the queen of arms. It was by some error that this statement had found its way into an artillery training manual. There is no queen of arms. They all have equal right to the title, for all are equally necessary. It is impossible to get on without one of them. I attach great significance to what I learned about our infantry at Cambrai, about their tactics and preparation. Without doubt they fought too doggedly, clinging too resolutely to the mere holding of ground, with the result that the losses were heavy. The deep dugouts and cellars often became fatal man traps. The use of the rifle was being forgotten, hand grenades had become the chief weapon, and the equipment of the infantry with machine guns and similar weapons had fallen far behind that of the enemy. The field marshal and I could for the moment only ask that the front line should be held more lightly, the deep underground works be destroyed, and all trenches and posts be given up if the retention of them were unnecessary to the maintenance of the position as a whole, and likely to be the cause of heavy losses. The problems of the reorganization and equipment of the infantry could be dealt with only step by step. The excessive use of hand grenades had come about because these could be usefully and safely employed from behind shelter, whereas a man using a rifle must leave his cover. In the close fighting of some of our own raids, and also in the large-scale attacks by the enemy, where the fighting at any moment came to be man-to-man, hand grenades were readier weapons for unpracticed men and easier to use than rifles, the latter also having the disadvantage of getting dirty easily. One could understand that, but infantry must keep able to hold the enemy off and to fight from a distance. When it came to -to hand-to-hand fighting, the superiority of the enemy in men was much too great. The infantry soldier had forgotten his shooting through use of grenades. He had to relearn it. He had to reacquire confidence in his weapon, and that meant that he must become master of it. That was easier to advise than to get accomplished. In the short training given to our new drafts little could be accomplished even if the attempt were made. Complete training was possible only under the conditions of peace, if the use of the rifle were to be a real protection when war came. In the case of the hostile infantry, the strength of the men bad been greatly increased by their war machine, we, on the other hand, had still to rely chiefly on our men. We had every reason to be sparing of them. An important change, moreover, had occurred, the machine gun had to become chief firing weapon of the infantry. The companies must be provided with new light machine guns, the serving of which must be done by the smallest possible number of men. Our existing machine guns in the machine gun sections were too heavy for the purpose. In order to strengthen our fire, at least in the most important parts of the chief theatre of war, it was necessary to create special machine gun companies, so to speak, machine gun sharpshooters. Already a beginning had been made, it was necessary to consolidate and to increase it. The fighting power of the infantry had to be further strengthened by trench mortars and bomb throwers. The supply of all quick loading weapons had to be increased. Lastly, the formation of storm troops from the infantry, which had begun during the war, had not only to be regularized, but to be adapted to the common good. The instruction formations and the storm battalions had proved their high value both intrinsically and for the improvement of the infantry generally. They were examples to be imitated by the other men. But for this it was necessary to have a training manual prepared and this had not yet been done. The course of the Somme battle had also supplied important lessons with respect to the construction and plan of our lines. The very deep underground forts in the front trenches had to be replaced by shallower constructions. Concrete pill boxes, which, however, unfortunately took long to build, had acquired an increasing value. 
the conspicuous lines of trenches, which appeared as sharp lines on every aerial photograph, supplied far too good a target for the enemy artillery. The whole system of defense had to be made broader and looser and better adapted to the ground. The large, thick barriers of wire, pleasant as they were when there was little doing, were no longer a protection. They withered under the enemy barrage. Light strands of wire, difficult to see, were much more useful. Forward infantry positions with a wide field of fire were easily seen by the enemy. They could be destroyed by the artillery of the enemy, and were very difficult to protect by our own artillery. Positions further back with a narrower field of fire and more under the protection of our own guns were retained. They were of special service in big actions. The decisive value of artillery observation and the consequent necessity of paying great attention to the selection of positions had also become apparent. Here also there was much to be done, so much had changed, so much become completely transformed. At the conference in Cambrai these various matters were merely touched on. I got no more than general impressions, but these were enough to show the necessity of altering the plan of fighting, and of improving the army in tactics and in equipment. Oh the Eastern Front we had for the most part adhered to the old tactical methods and the old training which we had learned in the days of peace. Here we met with new conditions, and it was my duty to adapt myself to them. I have always been interested in questions of tactics and armament, apart from the fact that these subjects formed part of my work in the great general staff at Berlin. Even at that time I had advocated many changes which had now become of the utmost importance. As could clearly have been foreseen, these subjects had now become questions of life or death to the army on the battlefields, and they could not receive too much attention. My responsibility to the army in this matter weighed particularly heavily on me. If, on the one hand, I had perforce to demand the sacrifice of human lives, on the other hand, I had the nobler task, from the point of view of humanity, of doing all I could to save German lives. All this determined me to look more closely into the question of body armor. We did indeed give some out to the troops, but it was never popular, as the men found it too heavy. Our conference at Cambrai had proved profitable. The quiet dignity of the assembled army commanders and chiefs of staff who had now for close on two years been engaged in great defensive battles in the west, whilst the field marshal and I had been winning battles in bold offensives in the east, made a deep impression on me. I was strengthened in my determination to make the government put into the war what war requires. Men, war material and moral resolution were matters of life and death to the army. The longer the war lasted, the more urgent they became. The more the army demanded, the more the country would have to find, and the greater would be the task before the imperial government, and especially the Prussian war ministry. After the conference, we dined with the crown prince of Bavaria. It was only his sense of duty that made him a soldier, his inclinations were not military. Nevertheless, he entered upon his high military position and applied himself to the work it entailed with great devotion, and, supported by his excellent chiefs of staff, the Bavarian General Kraft von Delmenzingen at the beginning of the war, and now General von Kuhl met all the great demands made on a group commander. He, like the German crown prince, was in favor of ending the war without victory either side, but he had no idea whether the Entente would agree to this. My relations with the crown prince of Bavaria were always good. Duke Albrecht of Württemberg, the commander of the Fourth Army, who was also present, was of a more pronounced soldierly temperament than the two crown princes. I seldom had the pleasure of meeting him, and have particularly pleasant recollections of the stimulating conversation I had with him. He was a real personality. In the afternoon we left Cambrai on our return journey through Belgium. The Governor-General, von Bissing, accompanied us part of the way. We arranged with him that the army of occupation in Belgium was to be reduced, as if units were to hold longer fronts in various parts of the West Front in the near future, it was advisable that Landstam formations should be put into line here and there. We also asked for his help in the execution of our plans for the supply of war material. On my way next afternoon I discussed this matter with Herr Duisberg and Herr Krupp von Bolin U. Halbock, whom I had asked to join the train. They considered it quite possible, in view of our stocks of raw material, to increase our output of war material if only the labor problem could be solved. Early on the 9th, we were back again in Pless. I was now at home in my position and understood my sphere of work. It was an enormous field of labor that suddenly opened before me, and many things were expected of me with which I had hitherto had nothing to do. 
Not only had I to probe deeply into the inner workings of the war direction, and get a grasp of both great and small matters that affected the home life of the people, but I had to familiarize myself with great world questions which raised all sorts of problems. Our old offices in one of the knight's houses of the prince's castle were now too small for us. Fresh ones were taken in the administrative buildings of the Principality of Pless. We ourselves occupied the house of Herr Nass, the estate agent of the Prince of Pless. Regular work now began. 8. As was to be expected, the Entente's offensive was continued throughout September and October, and even later, with unremitting vigor. September was an especially critical month. It was not made easy for us to embark on an operation in Transylvania against Romania. The Battle of the Somme, which had started on July 1 with an attempt at a breakthrough on a large scale, had been continued throughout July with the same intention and in the same strength. With the immediate object of wearing down our resistance the Entente had continued to launch big attacks in great strength on all parts of the battlefront. After Romania's declaration of war, these attacks were renewed with fresh vigor, and the Entente returned to their plan of a regular breakthrough. The battles that were then fought are among the most fiercely contested of the whole war, and far exceeded all previous offensives as regards the number of men and the amount of material employed. North of the Somme, the attack was resumed as early as the 3rd of September and lasted until the 7th. The enemy penetrated into our positions more and more deeply. On September 5, south of the Somme, the French also attacked on a wide front and gained ground at several points. On the northern bank, fighting began again on the 9th and lasted until the 17th. We were thrown back still further. Jinchi and Bushevesnys fell into the enemy's hands. The 17th was a day of heavy fighting on the southern bank, we lost Bemi and Dinidcourt. South of the Somme, the fighting was somewhat less fierce, though the hostile artillery fire was kept up. North of the Somme fighting ceased, but the 25th saw the beginning of the heaviest of the many heavy engagements that made up the Battle of the Somme. Great were our losses. The enemy took Rancourt, Morval, Gudecourt and the hotly contested Comles. On the 26th, the Thetful salient fell. Further enemy attacks on the 28th miscarried. The fighting had made the most extraordinary demands both on commanders and troops. The relief arrangements inaugurated at Cambrai, and the new system of reserves projected for the West Front, no longer sufficed. Divisions and other formations had to be thrown in on the Somme front in quicker succession and had to stay in the line longer. The time for recuperation and training on quiet sectors became shorter and shorter. The troops were getting exhausted. Everything was cut as fine as possible. The strain on our nerves in Pless was terrible, over and over again we had to find and adopt new expedients. It needed the iron nerves of Generals von Gorwitz, Fritz von Below, von Kuhl, Colonels von Losberg and Bronsart von Schellendorf, to keep them from losing their heads, to systematically put in the reserves as they came up, and, despite all our failures, eventually to succeed in saving the situation. Above all, it needed troops like the Germans. In October the attacks continued in undiminished force, especially on the northern part of the front. The enemy brought up even more men and material. We sustained losses, yet an effective stiffening of our defense began to be perceptible. The struggle continued in the Shell Hole area on the northeastern front of Verdun. The French were pushing forward and we remained on the defensive. The troops were very exhausted. But there was no change in the general situation there. On the Italian front, between the 14th and the 17th of September, the 7th Isonzo offensive of the Italian armies, and the 8th, from the 9th to the, the 13th of October, had been beaten off by Austria-Hungary. A further attack was to be expected. On the Macedonian front, the Entente had embarked on a counter-offensive during the latter half of September, west of Lake Ostrovo in the direction of Fiorina, and had pushed the Bulgarians back to the positions they had held in August. I had hoped that they would find prepared positions there, but I soon learned quite another story from the staff of the 11th Army which had taken over command there. The Bulgarians had done nothing. The position was, of course, serious, and Colonel Ganchev complained bitterly of the bad impression the fall of Monaster would make on his Bulgarians. But he did not care to think of the far worse impression his Bulgarians made on us. At the moment we could do nothing for them. But I had come round to the view that we should have to get a firmer control of the Bulgarian army, and to this end I proposed the formation of a special army group under German command, but to be subject to the Bulgarian high command. 
This suggestion met with approval. General Otto von Below, with his chief of staff, General von Bockmann, left Courland and took over the command of the new army group in Uskup. During the first half of October the position of the Bulgarian troops on the Macedonian plain was grave. On the Eastern Front, General Headquarters attempted first of all to convey German troops to the Maro sector, in order to give the weak Austro-Hungarian defence a certain stiffening. That was our first task. Next, a clear understanding had to be arrived at regarding the direction of operations against Romania, and new arrangements had to be made north of the Carpathians. As General von Conrad insisted on Austro-Hungarian command in Transylvania, a new army group was formed in Hungary, under the Archduke Charles. He retained General von Siecht as his chief of staff. The Archduke's former army group, with the exception of the troops in the Carpathians, was placed under General von Berm Ermoli who retained his command of the 2nd Austrian Army. The group so formed was placed under the command of the commander-in-chief in the east. North of the Carpathians we had got at last what we had been struggling for so long, a definite organization of command which would meet the requirements of the situation. This had now become urgently necessary. The very exhausted German divisions of General Count von Bothmer's army, which the Russians had been attacking violently for so long, needed to be relieved by those divisions from the old front of the commander-in-chief in the east on which less heavy demands had been made. The work of carrying out the relief meant a very tedious business, as it could only be done train for train. Our forces everywhere were so weak that, in view of the critical situation, whole divisions could not be taken at once from any one place. This was impossible in any case, as the commander-in-chief in the east had continually to release more and more troops for Romania. Archduke Charles' new army group comprised the troops in the Carpathians, which were formed into the Austrian 7th Army, and the two armies to be formed in Transylvania. The northern one, the 1st Austrian Army, under General von Ars, was to be deployed on both sides of Maros Vasahely as far back as Klausenberg, and the southern, the German 9th Army, under General von Falkenhayn, between Karlsberg and Mulbach, with small detachments further south as far as Orsova. In this most important sector General von Falkenhayn had an opportunity of giving practical proof of his military ability as a leader of troops in the service of his country. At the end of August and the beginning of September, in East Galicia and the Carpathians the Russians were putting heavy pressure on what was then the army group of the Archduke Charles. The result was the gradual withdrawal of General Count von Bothmer's army from the Zlota Lipa behind the Narajovka, and a further loss of ground by the Austrian troops in the Carpathians, particularly near the Tata Pass and on the frontier of the Bukowina. As the security of this front was a vital necessity for any operation against the Romanian army in Transylvania, there was nothing for it but to send at least three divisions, which were on their way from the hard-pressed Western Front, to Transylvania, Berm Ermoli and the Archduke Charles army groups on the Dniester and in the Carpathians. I agreed to this with a heavy heart. I remember the bitter feelings which surged up within me against the Austrian army at the thought of our difficult position in the west and the east, and the tasks our troops were called upon to perform on all fronts. But there was no help for it. Our interests were mutual in the matter. After further wavering, our front against the Russians was stabilized by the middle of September. In spite of a prodigious expenditure of men, further violent attacks, west of Lutsk, on the saturchi pustomity line, the Graberka sector west of Brody and the heights of Zborov, as well as Brasesini and our positions on the Narajovka, were all without result. Nor were the Russians able to boast of any notable gains in the fighting in the Carpathians for the Tartar Pass and the crest southeast to Kurlibaba, thanks to the admirable bearing of the German troops. Still, the position about the middle of October was by no means secure, nor was the Russian power of offence in any way broken. Their massed attacks continued with the same courage, and where this failed, the troops were urged on from behind by machine guns. The determination to obtain a victory in Volhynia, East Galicia and in the Carpathians, was still the driving force at the Russian headquarters. The deployment on the Maros was not complete until the end of September. A rapid advance on the part of the Romanians would have utterly upset it. The Romanian army moved forward at a snail's pace, partly because their attention had been diverted by Field Marshal von Mackensen's great successes in his invasion of the Dobruja, and also because they were waiting for the Russians to cross the Carpathians. Their left wing remained between Orsova and Hermannstadt, where there was a rather stronger concentration. The bulk of their army was debouching from Kronstadt and the frontier mountains of Moldavia on an east and west line, in close touch with the Russian left wing. 
It appears to have been the intention of the Russians and Romanians to descend into the Hungarian plain on a continuous line between the Carpathians and the Danube. But if this were to be accomplished very strong Russian forces would have to be brought through the Carpathians. The Romanians were to open the Carpathian passes for the Russians from the rear, by a vigorous eruption into our concentration area. They did the opposite. Unaccustomed to war on a large scale, they made no use of the chances offered them again and again of forcing our divisions up against the Dniester and the Carpathians. They advanced extraordinarily slowly and lost time. Every day was a day gained to us. The Russians, too, showed no capacity. They preferred to storm the ridge of the Carpathians instead of making a thrust at our open flank through Moldavia. Romania's participation in the whole campaign followed no definite plan. No common scheme of operations had been settled. After the first German troops from the west, which had been intended for Romania, had been moved to East Galicia and the Carpathians, we had to transfer to Transylvania divisions from the front of the commander-in-chief in the east. We had to take the risk of weakening the front there. But the appearance of these troops in Transylvania could not be counted on before the middle of September. The poor railway communications in Hungary caused still further delay. The Austrian troops, too, were long in coming up. General von Conrad did not dare to weaken the Isonzo front any further. He only let us have some mountain brigades from the Tyrol. Even these, too, could not be on the spot until very late. I therefore offered the Austrian general headquarters in Teschen several Austrian divisions of Linzingen's group which could no longer be employed against Russian troops. They were thankfully received. These divisions could hold part of the line, but certainly could hardly be used for attack. In the second half of September the forces which we were concentrating in Transylvania gradually increased in numbers, though they were still very weak in comparison with the enemy. At the best, it was all a question of a few divisions. The Austrian First Army had little fighting value. The Ninth Army was capable of too offensive, and it was the center of gravity of the whole operation. As soon as their concentration was completed, about the end of September, both armies were to start off, the Austrian First Army passing north of Schasburg, in a direction due east, and the bulk of the GTH army making for a line from Hermannstadt to Kronstadt. The Romanians were to be attacked and thrust back towards the east. In executing this movement, the GTH army was to keep its right wing close to the north side of the Transylvanian Alps, so as to cut off the Romanian army in Transylvania from its communications with Wallachia. The operation automatically secured the right flank of the army. The three divisions of the GTH army concentrating around Mulbach could be enveloped from the region of Petrosini through the Vulcan and Serdic passes, if the Romanians decided to force their way past Hermannstadt and northwards over the Maros. This possibility was to be dealt with first. It was important that we should throw back the Romanians near Petrosini over the mountain ridge. The first German troops that came up were successful in doing so on the IGF of September. When these had been brought back to join in the forward movement from Mulbach to Hermannstadt, Austrian troops took over the defense of the passes. The Romanians succeeded in recovering them on the 25th, but by then they had lost some of their importance. In front of the First Army the Romanians had pushed their way into the Gorgony Mountains in the bend of the Upper Maros, and had driven in the Austrian posts on that river above Maros Vasahali. Further south they had reached the neighborhood of Sakelli Advahali and east of Fagaras. The Hermannstadt group, two or three divisions strong, had not moved. Weak Austrian troops, stiffened by the Transylvanian Cavalry Brigade which had been formed out of three cavalry regiments specially for this purpose, were holding a thin line between Schasburg and Hermannstadt. The operations were to begin with a shattering blow at the Hermannstadt group by General von Falkenhayn. The exit from the Rotenturm Pass was to be closed, and Beth armies were to strike eastwards. The Hermannstadt blow succeeded. By the 26th of September the Alpine Corps, in a long flanking march, had pushed forward to the Rotenturm Pass in the rear of the enemy, whereupon the main body of the 9th Army attacked on both sides of Hermannstadt. Our force was weak and the battle lasted until the 30th. The Romanians offered an obstinate resistance and also attacked the Alpine Corps from the south. However, the Romanian main forces moved too late, and could not prevent the complete overthrow of a part of their army at Hermannstadt. The Alpine Corps, reinforced by Austrian mountain formations which were now arriving, took over the duty of covering the right flank of the army at the Rotenturm Pass. 
General von Falkenhayn himself immediately started his army on its eastward march, keeping to the north of the mountain ridge. To add to the pressure here, the 89th German Division of the 1st Army was pushed forward past and to the west of Schasburg, to join the 9th Army. General von R. started off simultaneously. The opposing armies were thus converging on one another. At the outset the Romanians were able to record a success in the centre. They were, however, beaten by the 9th Army south of Fagaras, and in a brilliant pursuit, lasting to the 10th of October, were thrown back through the Geister Forest and Kronstadt to Kampulung, Sinaya and Buzor in the mountains south of Kronstadt. The pressure which the 9th Army thus brought to bear was so strong that the Romanians further north also began to retreat, and the Austrian 1st Army was enabled gradually to ascend from the region in which the Aluta and Maros rise, to the frontier mountains of Moldavia. Meanwhile the attack of Field Marshal von Mackensen against the Romanians had resulted in a brilliant success. Whilst a weak force marched along the Dobruja railway on Dobrik, the Field Marshal, with the rest of his army, attacked the fortress of Turtukai in the early days of September. Thanks to the decisive help of Bode's weak German detachment, the result was amazing. After a slight resistance, the best part of two Romanian divisions surrendered on 6 September. Silistria was rushed on the 9th, Dobrik had already been taken on the 4th. It was not possible to press forward beyond this place, as the Romanian troops here were very quickly reinforced by a Russian division and a division composed of Austro-Hungarian prisoners of war. There was a certain apprehension in Sofia as to how the Bulgarian troops would behave against the Russians, but this proved unfounded. The Bulgarians made no distinction between the Russians and the Romanians. Unfortunately their capacity for attack or maneuver was not great. The 3rd Bulgarian Army gave the German command much trouble at times. Field Marshal von Mackensen kept his left wing close to the Danube, and exerted his chief pressure at this point. The enemy forces which were assembling on the Kara Oma, 10 km northeast of Dobrik, Lake Altina line were to be pinned against the Black Sea. Bode's German detachment, which was on the left wing, broke through this position in one great rush, and pressed onwards down the Danube. The Bulgarians, however, were not quick enough. They attacked, it is true, but the enemy withdrew on 15 September in an orderly manner. The 3rd Bulgarian army had let slip the chance of a great success. The enemy managed to take up the new line Rasova Kobadinu Tuzla, which had been fortified before the war began. Attempts to take this position as well had soon to be abandoned. The strength of the Bulgarian Turkish troops at hand at the time was insufficient. Communications had to be restored and extended, so that the necessary ammunition could he brought up for the attack. All this took time. Field Marshal von Mackensen begged, as early as the latter half of September, for a German division, he could not carry out the attack without it. But the decision whether or not this request could be granted had to stand over for the time being. While preparations for the resumption of the attack were in full swing, we were suddenly surprised on 1 October by news from Sofia that the Romanians had crossed the Danube near Rahovo, northeast of Ruschuk, in strength. The forces watching the Danube were weak, there were no other troops handy. Field Marshal von Mackensen threw against them everything he could scrape together and by 3 October the Romanians were compelled to retire again to the north bank of the Danube. The Austrian Danube flotilla had co-operated effectively. What the Romanian high command really intended to achieve by this enterprise has never been made clear, it could certainly not affect the course of events in Transylvania and the Dobruja. By the middle of October the general situation had improved. On the western front it remained grave in the highest degree, but the crisis had been overcome by the strenuous efforts of the troops there. On the Italian front two strong enemy attacks had been beaten off. In Macedonia a reverse was still to be feared. The Romanian army in the Dobruja and Transylvania had received a sharp setback, there was no change on the rest of the Eastern Front. The plan of the Entente to overwhelm us once and for all in the autumn of 1916, a plan which in August and September still seemed possible of realization, was foiled for the time being. But the fighting on all the fronts was not yet over. At that time we did not know, as we do now in the light of subsequent events, whether the enemy's endurance or our own would give out first. Romania was not yet beaten. As I now saw quite clearly, we should not have been able to exist, much less carry on the war, without Romania's corn and oil, even though we had saved the Galician oil fields at Drohobych from the Russians. Since the field marshal and I assumed the supreme command, we had made one great step forward, 
but a second was still to be taken. It meant the continued holding of the fronts, and, if we were to survive, a victory over Romania. The year 1917 opened with this goal still before us. The Great Entente Offensive of 1916, with its attendant perils, had been successfully dealt with. We could dismiss it from our minds, but we found ourselves faced with a future fraught with new anxieties. 9. The second step to which we had to make up our minds in the middle of October was extremely serious. It was difficult to strike at the Romanians through the frontier mountains or across the Danube, still more difficult to provide new troops for the continuation of the operations. Of course, we had given prolonged consideration to the question of how to continue the operations against Romania. The most profitable operation would be the simultaneous advance of both army groups, with their inner wings on Galatz, or rather, if Mackensen's army could push up to the mouth of the Danube below Galatz, while the Archduke Charles' army group pressed forward to the Sereth above Galatz, taking care to secure their inner flanks. The result of this would be the annihilation of the bulk of the Romanian army in Wallachia and the occupation of an area rich in just those warlike resources which we lacked. This splendid idea had occurred to the minds of the commanders on the spot, as well as my own. Field Marshal von Mackensen received the division he had asked for, the 217th, in time to enable him to attack the enemy's Tuzla Kobadinu Rasova line, and continue his advance to the Danube. In view of the resistance, varied with violent attack which the Archduke Charles' army group met within the frontier mountains from Orsova to the Bukovina, it was soon apparent that the 9th and the Austrian 1st armies had come to a standstill. A continuation of the attack here was no longer possible. Other plans had to be adopted for the entire operations. Field Marshal von Mackensen had to beat the enemy in the Dobruja with the help of the German division which was coming up, though slowly, follow him up with part of his forces, and with the rest effect a crossing of the Danube south of Bucharest. The 9th Army of Archduke Charles' army group was to cross the Transylvanian Alps into WA.11A Dokia. Both armies were then to defeat the enemy and try to effect their junction. It was not yet certain whether Field Marshal von Mackensen would cross the Danube near Tortukai, Ruschuk or Sestova, and whether General von Falkenhayn, with his main concentration near Orsova, would invade Wallachia by way of the Serdok or Rotenturm passes. In any case, the troops which had opposed the Romanians up to now no longer sufficed. The Romanian army was strong, help was to be expected from Russia. Of course, both army groups would have every available man ready for the invasion of Wallachia. I would willingly have reinforced Field Marshal Mackensen with anything that could be spared, so as to make his front the center of gravity of the whole operations. It was easier to cross the Danube than the mountains, where, moreover, snow had already fallen. Besides, the enemy's whole attention was concentrated on the mountain sector. But the condition of the Bulgarian railways precluded any reinforcement of Field Marshal von Mackensen. We had therefore to decide to force the mountain barrier as the first part of the operation, only when this was done and we were well into Wallachia could the field marshal cross the Danube, otherwise, with his small force his position would have been dangerous. The broad outlines of our plan were adhered to, but the knotty question had still to be decided whether the necessary troops for this operation were really available. I had a severe inward struggle. The wastage on both the long east and west fronts had become very great, and the fighting was not yet over. I shut my eyes to all dangers on other fronts, the commander-in-chief in the east had once again to give up two or three infantry divisions and two cavalry divisions. Besides this, the 7th Cavalry Division was withdrawn from the general government of Belgium. With this reinforcement the operation could at least be ventured on, and in the middle of November initiated, whether it could prove successful was, in view of our great weakness, doubtful. Whilst the new campaign against Romania was in full swing at the end of October and the beginning of November, and events in that quarter took their course, the battles on the other fronts continued. The Battle of the Somme continued throughout October with great bitterness. On the north bank of the river the 13th, 18th and 23rd of October were days of pitched battles of the fiercest description, an unusually severe strain was put on the troops, but on the whole they stood their ground, our resistance had stiffened. A violent onslaught on the 5th of November, between Bouchevesnys and Lassars was also beaten off. But in the bitter fighting that followed the French were once more successful. On the 13th of November the English, too, penetrated our positions on both sides of the Ankara, a particularly heavy blow, for we considered such an event no longer possible, particularly in sectors where our troops still held good positions. On the 14th of November the English were again successful at this point. 
The 18th was another day of heavy fighting, but, in spite of the enemy's great expenditure of men, ended on the whole favorably for us. There had also been fighting on the south bank of the Somme. From the 10th of October onwards the attacks south of the Roman road became still heavier, and later fierce fighting also developed to the north. Here, on the 29th of October, we were successful in our attack on La Maisonette Farm. This caused general satisfaction, although in itself not of much importance, still, it meant a successful attack for once on the Western Front. It is easy to understand the feeling of troops who take part in an offensive action, after being subjected to enemy drum fire for days on end, and managed to make a success of it on a battlefield which had hitherto witnessed defence only and many a disaster to German arms. As fighting on the French sector of the Somme battlefield died down, the position before Verdun again became critical. The French attacked on the 24th, we lost Fort Dormant, and on the 1st of November were obliged to evacuate Fort Vos also. The loss was grievous, but still more grievous was the totally unexpected decimation of some of our divisions. The tension on the West Front was particularly trying at a time when the second deployment against Romania was not yet complete. Nevertheless, uncertain though the situation was, General Headquarters endured this new trial to carry through what had been recognized as the only sound plan, the defeat of the Romanian army and the occupation of Wallachia. From the middle of November onwards we awaited, with great anxiety, the further violent enemy attacks on the Somme and at Verdun which our invasion of Romania was likely to provoke. But the lull in the fighting which became noticeable on the south bank of the Somme from the beginning of November, and on the north bank towards the end of the month, continued. For the time being the Entente had no longer the strength, nor probably the ammunition, to develop further attacks. On the 14th, 15th and 16th of December, however, there was again very hard fighting round Verdun. France attacked so as to limit still further, before the end of the year, the German gains of 1916 before this fortress. They achieved their object. The blow they dealt us was particularly heavy. We not only suffered heavy casualties, but also lost important positions. The strain during this year had proved too great. The endurance of the troops had been weakened by long spells of defence under the powerful enemy artillery fire and their own losses. We were completely exhausted on the Western Front. On the Italian Front fighting was renewed at the beginning of November. On the 7th and 9th Italian Isonzo offensive had to all intents and purposes been repulsed. For the time being there was a lull in the fighting there. Italy also was not strong enough to relieve the pressure on her ally Romania. The Austro-Hungarian troops on that front were themselves so exhausted that new forces could not be spared for use against Romania. The situation on the Macedonian front, too, was not to develop in our favour. Rear communications with the Macedonian plain and the mountains on both sides of the river Sema were still far from complete, there was too much leeway to be made up. The German army command had but little prospect of establishing the Bulgarian army firmly in the position from which they started. At an early stage it began the construction of a rear position north of Monastir, across the plain and over the wild and rugged mountains on both sides of the Sema. In the middle of October the Entente succeeded in crossing the river near Brod in capturing key positions in the mountains. This caused the staff of the 11th Army to move their line further back towards Monastir. When, about the middle of November, the Entente renewed their attacks, the Bulgarian army gave ground again and again, and had to withdraw fighting to the position north of Monastir. On the 18th the town was occupied by the Serbs. The Bulgarian army had been considerably shaken, and we were obliged to make up our minds to bring up to the Macedonian mountains the three or four Jagger battalions which were really intended for Orsova. There could now no longer be any question of taking further Bulgarian troops from this front for the campaign against Romania. As an immediate effect of our invasion of Wallachia at the end of November and beginning of December, the Entente began heavy relief attacks on our new positions, which we held, however, in fierce fighting. By throwing in our last ounce of strength we victoriously beat off further attacks in the second half of December. Communications improved and supply got better. The position on the Macedonian front again became more stable, unfortunately not without our employing some, even though only a few, German battalions, whose absence from Romania was of course sorely felt. By the occupation of the Piraeus and Athens in October, the Entente had in the meantime gained control of Greece and her railways. They promoted the formation on a larger scale of contingents of Venizelist troops. 
Wherever the Entente went they increased their resources for carrying on the war, and this object was the deciding factor in determining their attitude towards Greece. The royalist troops were withdrawn from Thessaly in November. Between Fiorina and Valona a continuous line was gradually being established. On the front of the commander-in-chief in the east the Russians made one more powerful but abortive attack, west of Lutsk, on the Postomity satatsi front, about the middle of October. Then their attacks here gradually died down. Along the Narajovka they continued into November. Russia was at last exhausted. We were still strong enough to make some local attacks that required little preparation, the most important of which took place on the front of Wojcia's army group on November 9. It was quite on western lines and was completely successful. We, too, had now come to the end of our strength. In connection with the battles in Romania the Russians continued their attacks in the Carpathians from October well into December. At the same time an extension of the Russian front to the south was perceptible. Russians and Romanians attacked on the eastern frontier of Transylvania and Romania. Our advance in Wallachia provoked even fiercer bat lies, and brought upon us strong Russian massed attacks, which again produced local crises, and tried our nerves highly. The Austrian First Army, in the Transylvanian frontier mountains, was particularly heavily attacked, until Bavarian troops restored the position here too. 10. At the end of October and the beginning of November, whilst the fighting on all fronts was still at its zenith and the end was not yet in sight, our second concentration against Romania was in full swing. It was no simple task. It took a long time, during which we had ample opportunity to reflect over the wisdom of our decision. It would be justified by success. But if it had failed what would then have been the verdict passed on the campaign against Romania? After endless supply difficulties had been surmounted, Field Marshal von Mackensen's preparations in the Dobruja were complete by the middle of October. His chief of staff was General Tappen who had been director of operations at General Headquarters until the beginning of September. He applied himself with zeal to his new and important work and displayed great foresight. The attack began on the 19th of October. By this time the 217th Infantry Division had also come up and been given the place of honor, to Prazer, which it was to storm. Once more German blood had to flow because our allies were not equal to the demands made by this war. The enemy had been considerably reinforced, and, at the beginning of October, attempted to strike at the German-Bulgarian-Turkish army in the Dobruja. However, his attacks were not coordinated nor pressed with sufficient determination. He let slip the opportunity, of which he might have made good use. Field Marshal von Mackensen's attack resulted, after three days of heavy fighting, in a brilliant breakthrough. The hostile army was thrown back in disorder northwards over the Constanza Semivoda railway. The pursuit was relentlessly taken up. By the 23rd Constanza, with its rich stores of oil, was in our possession, and soon afterwards Semivoda also fell. The pursuit was not relaxed until we were 20 kilometers north of the railway. Of course the question was raised whether the army should not exploit its victory further and press on northwards right to the Danube. I vetoed this as the check to the Archduke Charles attack in the Transylvanian mountains had, meanwhile, become an irrefutable fact. Even if the third Bulgarian army, with its inadequate communications, had pressed forward to the Danube, it would only have been isolated there. It could not have been brought in to cooperate with the Ninth Army in its invasion of Western Wallachia, yet that cooperation constituted a condition precedent to the success of the whole operation. Much though General Headquarters regretted it, orders were issued for Field Marshal von Mackensen to cease his advance, prepare to cross the Danube south of Bucharest, and effect the crossing in the greatest possible strength in the latter half of November. The Field Marshal, on his own responsibility, left only a particularly weak force in the northern Dobruja. It entrenched a line here and of course its position continued to be very precarious. The bulk of Mackensen's army was transferred to Rustchuk, partly by forced marches and partly by the very inadequate Dobruja railway which was gradually getting into working order again. Field Marshal von Mackensen chose Sistova Simnitsa for his crossing place. For us, in Pless, this westerly point was convenient, as the Danube Oni was thus brought nearer to the parts of the Ninth Army which were forcing their way into western Wallachia. The region of Orsova, the Vulcan and Serdok passes, or the Rotenturm Pass, presented themselves as gateways into Wallachia from west and north. Just south of the Rotenturm Pass General Kraft von Delmenzingen, with his Alpine Corps, reinforced by two Austrian mountain brigades, 
had, after the Battle of Hermannstadt, met with a very stubborn resistance in covering the flanks of the Ninth Army which was pressing forward towards Kronstadt. In order to attract the enemy to his front, and so relieve the burden on this army, he had adopted a fence as the best means of defense. In spite of violent fighting, in which the Romanians often counterattacked, the Alpine Corps was able to gain but little ground south of the pass by the end of October. It was a case of true mountain warfare in winter, in all its characteristic forms, with all its stupendous difficulties. The troops, including the Austrian mountain brigades, fought admirably, but it was a terribly slow business. An attempt by the bulk of the Ninth Army to force the crests at the highest and broadest part, in face of a strong enemy who could no longer be surprised, would also have been hung up, as had been the fate of a similar attack in October, south of Kronstadt. We did not like having to select the western end for our attack, as in this way the strategical possibilities would be diminished, but this could not be helped. The first thing was to get over the mountain somehow. The Ninth Army had made an attempt, at the end of October, to advance south of the Vulcan and Serdok passes. This had been foiled by a sudden change of weather and by the vigilance of the enemy. The troops had to be withdrawn as far as the heights overlooking the pass. We had got some idea of the ground and had come to the conclusion that the forcing of the mountains, at this particularly narrow spot, was quite practicable. I also relied on the assumption that the Romanians would not expect here the repetition of an attack which had cost us so heavily, so General Headquarters decided to choose this position in the mountains as our point of sortie. It seemed more favorable than the region of Orsova, where the passes were still to be won. Profiting by our dearly won experience, we made thorough preparations, even to the smallest detail, and the troops were supplied with complete mountain equipment. Particular attention was given to the improvement of the mountain roads and the accumulation of material, so that there might be no delay in pursuing the enemy. Motor trolleys, for use on the Romanian railways, were also held in readiness. Our communications in Wallachia would be very difficult, in spite of all our foresight, so long as only the road through the Serdok Pass was at our disposal. On the 10th of November General Kuhn had completed his preparations, and the opening of operations was fixed for the 11th. This group, with four infantry and two cavalry divisions, under the command of General Count von Schmetto, was to break out here, and push forward vigorously through Kariva to the river Aluta. This would mean that they would take the defences of Orsova on the east and the Rotenturm Pass in the rear. At Orsova a weak brigade, including German cyclist troops under the Austrian Colonel Sivo, was to attack simultaneously. General von Kraft, who was reinforced, and the troops south of Kronstadt were to continue their attacks. The 11th of November brought complete success to General Kuhn, now at last we reaped the benefit of our raid at the end of October. General Kuhn crossed the mountains, defeated the opposing Romanian divisions in the Battle of Targu Ju, on the 17th of November, and had occupied Kariva by the 21st. On the 23rd General Count von Schmetto, with his cavalry divisions, had reached the Aluta east of Caracal, the Aluta bridge at this point was in his possession. Further north our infantry had reached the Aluta opposite Slatina. Here, as further upstream, the bridges had been completely destroyed. On the same day, in a thick fog, Field Marshal von Mackensen had gained a footing on the north bank of the Danube, near Simnitza. Here again the operation had been very well prepared. This is the day we had fixed on to get the armies working in cooperation by exploiting all the possibilities of the situation. Apparently we had been successful, but we were not yet at the end of our difficulties. Meanwhile, General von Kraft had fought his way further through the mountains, but had not yet debouched into the plain at Rimniku Valsea and north of Curtia de Arjts. In the rear of General Kuhn's forces the Romanians, fighting bravely, had withdrawn from Orsova down the Danube, and were still retreating, keeping close to the river. Though surrounded on all sides, they did not lay down their arms until they had reached the confluence of the Aluta at the beginning of December. Their hope that an attack on the Danube army by parts of the Romanian army from Bucharest would save them was not fulfilled. In the operations east of the Aluta the orders were to press forward relentlessly and effect a junction of the two armies with their inner wings in the direction of Bucharest. I attached special importance to a rapid crossing of the Aluta by General Kuhn's group, in order to secure the left flank of the Danube army. The other task of the Ninth Army was to press up north from the plain towards the mountain frontier, thereby opening the mountain roads and enabling more of our troops to come down south. Field Marshal von Mackensen was to take over the command of the Ninth Army also, as soon as the armies had really effected a junction, and proper liaison had been assured. 
the Danube army was placed under the orders of General Koch. The 9th Army was to be detached from the Archduke Charles group. Until all this was done the German general headquarters had to exercise direct command in the conduct of the operations. The Danube army started its forward march on November 25. On the 26th they crossed the Vadia, and on the 30th their left wing, after heavy fighting, forced its way across the valley of the Nejlov southwest of Bucharest, while the right wing, keeping level with them, advanced down the Danube. On the 27th the Alpine Corps had fought its way out of the Rotenturm Pass into the plain, had entered Potesti on the 29th, and on the following day, by exerting their main pressure north of the Arges, gained ground to the southeast. This made it possible for the right wing of the Kronstadt Group, which was involved in heavy fighting north of Campulung, to debouch from the mountains. Further back stood General Kuhn. His infantry divisions had made terrific efforts to force a crossing at Slatina, instead of immediately crossing farther south near Caracal, as the cavalry corps had done, and thus gaining time, in spite of having to make a detour. They only crossed the Aluta in the course of the 27th, and on the 30th were still about 80 kilometers from the left wing of the Danube army and the right of Kraft's group. The Romanian high command had intended to hold up generals von Kraft and Kuhn, and attack the Danube army. Their first object was apparently to hold these two groups on the mouths of the mountain passes at Curtia de Arges and Rimnico Valsea and the line of the Aluta. When this was no longer possible, they tried again and again to make their first army, fighting hard, stand on some line further back, so as to take full advantage even at the eleventh hour of their situation with regard to the Danube army. On December 1 the left wing of the Danube army was very heavily attacked southwest of Bucharest and pushed back. The German troops who had already crossed the Nejlov were cut off. The situation was certainly very critical. The enemy's enveloping movement was only stopped by a Turkish division, which was marching in the second line. The Romanian attack was not pressed home, the right wing of the 9th Army was brought up with all possible speed to meet it. On December 2 the cavalry of the 9th Army was in position on the action front of the Danube Army. On the 3rd we had infantry as well within reach and so the crisis was overcome. On the 4th we started a counter-attack, which was skillfully evaded by the Romanians. In the meantime, General Kuhn's left wing had effected a junction with General Kraft's group and forced back the Romanian 1st Army eastward across the Arges. Henceforward the Danube Army and the 9th Army fought side by side. The success of the operation was assured. It had not been easy to bring the two armies into close tactical cooperation. At the last moment, on the 1st of December, the attempt had almost miscarried. Even in war, accidents of all kinds have to be reckoned with. No sooner had this crisis been surmounted than we found ourselves faced with another. Would Bucharest be defended as a fortress or not? Such a defence would have been very awkward for us, for it would have prolonged the campaign in Romania considerably. The season was already far advanced. We had to make preparations for the following year. All kinds of material necessary for attack had been placed in readiness, and everything possible had been done to hasten the fall of the fortress. A great load was taken off my mind when, on the 6th, the report was received that our cavalry divisions had in the night of the 5th the 6th of December found the northern works of the fortress unoccupied and blown up. On the 6th we were in possession of Bucharest, Ploesti and Campina. The Romanians, under English orders and directions, had effected a very thorough destruction of the oil fields. So far the Russians had not taken any serious part in the fighting. A Russian thrust on December 5, southeast of Bucharest, was of no importance. It is not easy to understand why they let the Romanians be beaten before they came in, they could very easily have sent forces to Wallachia. It was only because the Russians were not there that we were successful from this time onwards the Russians brought up reinforcements. They now seemed to fear for their own flank. They reduced their forces in the Dobruja in order to be stronger in Wallachia. For the rest of the campaign the object in view was to strike an even more crushing blow at the Romanians, defeat the Russians, whose arrival was now a certainty, while they were assembling, and bring the operations to a conclusion by reaching the mouth of the danube serif trotus line. This was the shortest line we could take up. Our military economic situation made it imperative that we should secure it. Mackensen's army group was to exert its main pressure in the direction of Buz or Foxani, break any attempts at resistance in the plain by an enveloping movement from the mountains, and for the rest, push forward down both banks of the Danube. 
General von Conrad had agreed that the right wing of Archduke Charles' army group should later join in the attack on the Trotus. The battles east of the Bucharest Ploesti line now assumed a different character from their predecessors. Our troops were tired and could only attack the enemy frontally. The possibility of outflanking the enemy was only slight as he was increasing his forces, especially in the mountains. The Russians were soon in great strength, they fought better than the Romanians. The supply of ammunition, which was now needed in larger quantities, was a slow business as communications had become much worse. Heavy rain set in, and was followed towards the new year by an unusually severe frost. On December 10 the Danube Army and the 9th Army, on the Jalamnitsa and at Missal, southeast of Buzor, were facing the Romanian and Russian troops in prepared positions. Yet they succeeded in quickly breaking down their resistance, crossing the Jalamnitsa on the 12th, and taking Buzor, after hard fighting, on the 15th. On the 17th this army group was already in the plain before another strong position between the Danube, near the mouth of the Kalmatuyu, and the mountains to the southwest of Rimniku Sharot. In the mountains west and northwest of those positions the Romanians were in close touch with the troops facing the Archduke Charles army group. Field Marshal von Makensen had meanwhile ordered the Bulgarian Third Army also to advance up the right bank of the Danube. Without meeting any serious resistance, it pushed on as far as the mouth of this river, which was actually reached on the 24th of December. It then wheeled in the direction of the Brailer right bank bridge head, at and downstream from Makin. In the plain west of the Danube the army group could not attack until ammunition had been brought up. After a very violent struggle, the 9th Army broke through the Russian and Romanian positions at Christmas and forced the enemy to withdraw his whole front towards the upper Sereth, more particularly in the direction of Brela and Foxani. South of the Sereth, however, the enemy's resistance was in no way broken and fighting in Wallachia went on well into January. Our men were in sore need of rest. I was worried as to how I was to get them out of this corner again to the larger theatres of war. Everything possible had been done to put the Romanian railways into working order again, but they could only cope with a very limited amount of traffic. We also made preparation to transport troops by way of the Danube, but with an unusually severe winter setting in, we had to reckon with the freezing up of the river. In spite of all our efforts, it would in any case take a long time to get all our troops away. At last, after another violent battle, the Danube army took Brela on January 4. It reached the Sereth, downstream to the confluence of the Buzor. Keeping touch with the Danube army, the 9th Army had pushed forward to the Sereth in the course of continuous engagements in which the Russians pressed us particularly hard on the 6th. On the 8th, the 9th Army captured Foxani and the region north of the town as far as the Putna. The attacks which the Archduke Charles' army group had initiated about Christmas towards the Trotus had made no progress whatever. The great exhaustion of the troops, time and weather, all demanded the conclusion of the campaign. The line which Mackinson's army group now occupied was approximately the one we had intended to reach. The attack was broken off. The armies dug themselves in on the line on which they stood. The second stage of the Romanian campaign was over, thus bringing it to an end. It had been an operation rich in great deeds of valor of our brave troops, in tremendous decisions of the leaders, from junior officers to general headquarters itself, in terrible anxieties also, which no one felt more intensely than I. We had beaten the Romanian army, to annihilate it had proved impossible. We had done all that was possible, but found ourselves obliged to leave forces in the Dobruja and Wallachia which we had been able to use on the east and west fronts and in Macedonia before Romania came into the war. In spite of our victory over the Romanian army, we were definitely weaker as regards the war position as a whole. With the termination of the campaign in Romania, the fighting of the autumn of 1916 was decidedly to our advantage. This triumph was obtained, not only on the battlefields of Transylvania, Wallachia and the Dobruja, where it had found its outward expression, but also in the struggle on the Western Front, on the Isonzo, in Macedonia and the East. It had been a concentration of our whole war strength with one aim, to ward off the Entente's onslaught and to retain the possibilities of existence. This onslaught had collapsed, and the resources of Wallachia were at our disposal. The immense superiority of the Entente in men and war material had been overcome by the bearing of our troops and the assurance and initiative of our leadership. In defence, the German troops, in spite of many reverses, had proved their worth, the Austrian troops had succumbed to the Russians, the Bulgarians had frequently disappointed us, and the Turks had done what we expected of them. 
In the battles of movement of the Romanian campaign German leadership had once more manifested its superiority. The German troops, carrying their allies with them, had beaten a strong enemy through bold, independent action. Where we were on the defensive, the enemy had been successful only by employing masses of technical war material. Where that factor was absent, the German once more proved his superiority. On all sectors of the vast front the German army, as indeed every man individually, had given of its best, literally to the last ounce. This alone had made victory possible, a victory the laurels of which world history will award to the German soldier. We now urgently needed a rest. The army had been fought to a standstill and was utterly worn out. The enemy, too, seemed weary. But they still had the strength to deliver their so successful blow near Verdun. Their superiority in numbers enabled them to relieve their troops more frequently. We had to reckon with their speedy recovery. Chapter The Position at the Close of 1916 and Beginning of 1917 1. Notwithstanding the successful dose of the year 1916, the outlook for the coming year was exceedingly grave. It was certain that in 1917 the Entente would again make a supreme effort, not only to make good their losses, which they were certainly in a position to do, but to add to their strength everywhere and swell their superiority in numbers. Though they had not yet recovered, our worn-out troops would have to take the offensive as early as possible, and on a greater scale than in the autumn of 1916, if they were to achieve ultimate victory. France had already given her children. The battalions now consisted of three, instead of four companies. But she possessed in her colonies extraordinary resources in manpower, on which she drew in ever-increasing measure. England brought her army up to strength and set about increasing it. Russia, in particular, produced very strong new formations. Divisions were reduced to 12 battalions, the batteries to 6 guns, and new divisions were formed out of the surplus 4th battalions and the 7th and 8th guns of each battery. This reorganization meant a great increase in strength. The Romanian army was to be reorganized and trained by French officers. Thanks to the natural affinity of the two races and the influence of France on Romanian thought, and particularly on the Romanian army, it was only to be expected that the French officer would soon become familiar with the psychology of the Romanian army and accomplish a great deal. We had to reckon with new formations of Austro-Hungarian prisoners of war and Venizelist Greeks. Against this Germany and her allies had nothing to throw into the scale. The increase in the artillery which General Headquarters had in view and the creation of 13 new divisions which was under consideration, were not a real addition to our strength, as they weakened the existing formations. We could only form the infantry battalions by drawing on current reserves and reducing battalion strengths. The creation of a Polish army would have been a real reinforcement, but it was soon seen that this would not be possible. There was nothing for it but to drain Germany and the Allied countries of all their manpower that was in any way available. An additional danger was added to the enemy's numerical superiority by the ever-increasing devotion of their industries to war purposes. Far-reaching restrictions on labor were passed into law in the Entente countries and accepted without serious protest, ample labor was available and there was no shortage of raw materials, the output per man had not fallen, and life, in short, pursued its normal course. The seas of the world were open to the Entente. The United Slates were now giving help on the largest scale and breaking new ground. The technical equipment of the Entente armies was continually increasing in quality as in quantity, reaching indeed an unprecedentedly high level. This was demonstrated with pitiless clarity on the Western Front. In the East, too, the campaign of 1916 had brought a very great increase in technical war material, especially in ammunition. Russia had established a war industry of her own, in part in the Donetsk coal basin, and had greatly increased her output. Japan was steadily giving better deliveries. With the completion of the Merman Railway and the improvement of the Trans-Siberian Line, an increased import from Japan, America, England and France was inevitable. In every theatre of war the Entente was able to add to her numerical superiority enormous additional resources in every department of technical supply, and to destroy our troops on a still greater scale than had been achieved on the Sommer and at Verdun. Much could be done, and had to be done, by our industries to increase our resources, but plainly no little time would elapse before any arrangements to this end could be carried into effect. 
It was clear that our munition factories, in spite of their immense output, and whatever labor they had at their disposal, were never in a position to overtake the enemy, so long as the enormous industrial areas of the latter continued to work undisturbed under what were virtually peace conditions. In the then circumstances, it seemed impossible to get on equal terms. With our serious inferiority in numbers and equipment, training for defensive warfare became more important. It was obvious that we must strain every nerve to equip, organize and train our army. Everything possible was done. We knew, however, that the enemy would soon adapt himself to our new tactics, and that our advantage was only temporary. General headquarters had to bear in mind that the enemy's great superiority in men and material would be even more painfully felt in 1917 than in 19x6. They had to face the danger that summer fighting would soon break out at various points on our fronts, and that even our troops would not be able to withstand such attacks indefinitely, especially if the enemy gave us no time for rest and for the accumulation of material. Our position was uncommonly difficult, and a way out hard to find. We could not contemplate an offensive ourselves, having to keep our reserves available for defense. There was no hope of a collapse of any of the Entente powers. If the war lasted our defeat seemed inevitable. Economically we were in a highly unfavorable position for a war of exhaustion. At home our strength was badly shaken. Questions of the supply of foodstuffs caused great anxiety, and so, too, did questions of moral. We were not undermining the spirits of the enemy populations with starvation blockades and propaganda. The future looked dark, and our only comfort was to be found in the proud thought that we had hitherto succeeded in defying a superior enemy, and that our fine was everywhere beyond our frontiers. 2. The field marshal and I were fully at one in this anxious view of the situation. Our conclusion was no sudden one, but had gradually grown upon us since we took over our posts at the end of August, 1916. Accordingly, the construction had been begun as early as September of powerful rear positions in the west, the Siegfried Line, running from Arras, west of Cambrai, Saint Quentin, La Fere, Vale sur Aisne, to get rid of the Great Albert Roy southwest of Noyon Soissons Vale sur Aisne salient, in which the Somme fighting had made a large indentation, and south of Verdun the Michael Line, in front of the Eating Gores Line, to straighten out the salient of Saint Mihiel. These strategic positions had the advantage of shortening the front and economizing men, and their occupation according to plan was prepared. Whether we should retire on them, and how the positions would be used, was not of course decided in September, 1916, the important thing then was to get them built. This made comprehensive measures necessary and I made heavy demands for labor from home. All this, however, only sufficed for the west, and corresponding positions in the east had to be left unbuilt. The construction of positions, the training of the army for defensive warfare, and the exploitation of home resources were of vital importance for carrying on the war. They were sufficient to postpone the decision, if the government once succeeded in bringing the people wholeheartedly to support the war, but they could never lead to victory. The future was thus full of obscurity. The soldier dare not rely on chance, so that the questions of peace and submarine warfare became of tremendous importance. There was the problem of obtaining peace, the chance of defeat without unrestricted submarine warfare and the possibility of victory by means of such a campaign, accompanied by an attack by our surface fleet and a defensive war on land. The term unrestricted submarine warfare is not wholly apt, any more than is submarine warfare without regard to consequences, 1. In September, 1916, the Chancellor was giving consideration to the proposed mediation of President Wilson with a view to peace. Such a step was regarded in many quarters in Germany with the greatest disfavor, as the attitude of benevolence adopted by the USA towards the Entente had roused increasing bitterness among us. The government could not lightly disregard this feeling. The Chancellor nevertheless proposed to His Majesty that instructions should be given to Ambassador Count Bemstorff to induce the President at the earliest possible moment, and in any case before the presidential election at the beginning of November, to make a peace offer to the powers. I was fully in agreement with the suggestion, and inwardly very pleased that it was made although I was skeptical of success owing to my view of the enemy's desire for our destruction. Their prospects for 1917 were so much more favorable than ours that, even while I hoped for it, I had grave doubts as to the success of any step by President Wilson. I waited with the greatest anxiety to learn whether he would make a proposal in October, but his re-election in November and the whole of that month passed without his making up his mind to it. I now relied no longer on his intervention. 
Baron Burian now came forward with the proposal that the Quadruple Alliance should itself take action and make a direct offer of peace to the enemy. I was equally skeptical as to the success of this scheme, but thought that it should be tried, only it was essential to avoid anything that looked like weakness. This would have had a very bad effect on the army and the public, and would have encouraged the Entente to redouble their efforts for our destruction. So far as he permitted, I cooperated with the Chancellor in the matter. In order to avoid giving the enemy the false impression that weakness was our motive for the proposal, I asked that it should not be carried out until the campaign in Romania had been brought to a conclusion. Bucharest fell on the 6th of December, and with that I regarded the military position as so secure that I had no objection to the publication of the peace note. The proposal for compulsory auxiliary service, which had meanwhile been passed into law, gave the appearance of a determination to continue fighting if our offer were rejected. His Majesty took a most earnest interest in the peace offer, displaying clearly his high sense of his responsibility to bring peace to the world at the earliest possible moment. On the 12th of December, the peace offer of the Quadruple Alliance was made. There followed an exchange of views as to the peace terms which we should be prepared to offer which was destined to culminate in the despatch to Count Bekrenstorff of the 29th of January 1917. The reception of our offer by the Entente Press was wholly unfavourable. It soon became clear that it would be impossible to come to an understanding. The Entente had their hands tied by arrangements and secret agreements that could only be carried out if we were completely defeated. The answer of the Entente, given on the 30th of December, was such as to leave no doubt of their intention to annihilate us. Their objection, that the tone of our offer had from the first made any acceptance impossible, will not hold water. Our whole position compelled us to adopt a tone of confidence. I advocated this from the military point of view also. Our troops had done marvels, what would they do if we adopted any other tone? It was essential that the peace offer should not impair the fighting capacity of the army, and it did not do so, for it was only an episode, and the moral of the troops was still good. If the Entente honestly desired a peace of justice and reconciliation, they could and should have entered into negotiations and brought forward their demands. Had negotiations broken down before any demand for annexations on the part of the German representatives, it would have been easy for the Entente, in view of such an attitude, to rouse their peoples to renew the war. We, on the other hand, in such a position would have been quite unable to reconcile the German people, already longing for peace, to any further fighting. Still less would our weary allies have continued to fight at our side. This simple reasoning shows convincingly that when we made our offer, we were genuinely ready for a peace of justice and reconciliation. The Entente's rejection of our advances, on this and every subsequent occasion, shows equally clearly that they did not want negotiations that might reveal to the world our sincere desire for peace. They feared that this would lead to a weakening of the desire for our destruction in their own camp, and wished also that peace, when it came, should be definitely a peace of defeat and prostration for us. Meanwhile President Wilson had at last, on the 18th of December, addressed a note to all the belligerent powers, inviting an expression of their views as to the terms on which the war could be brought to an end. The President apparently desired to compare the demands of both sides and arrive at a compromise. He had in mind a peace without victors or vanquished. The note was delivered on the 21st of December. The German government had been informed of the President's intention in November. After his long hesitation they were by this time in doubt as to whether the president would in fact carry out his intention. I do not, however, know their line of reasoning in any detail. As early as the 26th of December the governments of the Quadruple Alliance proposed an early conference of representatives of the belligerents in some neutral country. They were at variance with Wilson's proposals to the extent that they preferred direct negotiations with their opponents, this may well have been, in part, due to regard for the strong trend of public opinion in Germany against the United States. The Entente, however, remained wholly unconciliatory. Their answer of the 12th of January was a confirmation of the note of the 30th of December, perhaps even still more strongly imbued with their lust of destruction. This answer voiced the iron will of Lloyd George who at the beginning of December had formally taken over the reins of government in England. It is useful to re-read the Entente notes on our offer of peace and Wilson's note. The judgment of many people as to the possibility of a peace of understanding will then become clearer. Thus failed the two efforts to bring peace nearer. By the will of the Entente the war had to continue and to be decided by force of arms. It was to be victory or defeat. 
the results were further preparations on a large scale, the maintenance of our determination to fight, this our proposals were designed to achieve, and at the same time the employment of every weapon in Germany's arsenal. 3. The field marshal and myself, in our view of the whole situation and in our skepticism, unfortunately justified, as to the success of the peace proposals, had already had under consideration, as part of our military problems, the possibility of carrying on submarine operations in the intensified form of the war zone campaign. Unrestricted submarine warfare was now the only means left to secure a victorious end to the war within a reasonable time. If submarine warfare in this form could have a decisive effect, and the Navy held that it could, then in the existing situation it was our plain military duty to the German nation to embark on it. As has been mentioned, we had both spoken against the proposal for unrestricted warfare on the 30th of August, on the ground that the time was not yet ripe for it. Chancellor von Bethmann stated this quite clearly at the time and added that thenceforth the decision to carry on the submarine campaign in the form of a war zone would depend on the declaration of the field marshal, that is to say, unrestricted submarine warfare was to start when the field marshal wished it to start. The Chancellor spoke to the same effect in the Reichstag on the 28th of September. The question of the expediency of the submarine campaign had meanwhile led to grave differences of opinion among the political parties, and had roused unusually strong feeling. While the parties of the right were enthusiastically in favour of its adoption, the left, which was more in touch with the government, was equally strongly opposed. Von Bethmann's statement for the first time brought general headquarters into the field of politics to support the government. This I regretted deeply. It ought not to have happened. General headquarters had consistently held aloof from all political activity and had no wish to alter its policy in this respect. This made the political excitement roused by von Bethmann's step all the more embarrassing to the field marshal and myself. Nevertheless, general headquarters came, in fact, more and more to be regarded as responsible for the adoption or non-adoption of unrestricted submarine warfare. At the beginning of October we had discussed unrestricted submarine warfare with the chief of the naval staff, also the question when to begin it. In the course of the correspondence opened by the Chancellor on the matter, we again urged him on the 5th of October to settle the question of responsibility. He replied on the 6th, with the statement that the decision really lay with the Emperor, as war lord of the Empire, but that it was also a question of foreign policy, owing to its effect on neutrals. The Chancellor was therefore, constitutionally, the only person responsible, and could not transfer the burden to anyone else, but the judgment of the Field Marshal would naturally have the greatest weight with him. This standpoint was incontestable. The Field Marshal was not in a position to relieve the Chancellor of any of his responsibility, and had never even thought of doing so, I fully agreed with Millimeter. The Chancellor's declaration was, however, a substantial change of front when compared to his earlier statements which had been made on the assumption that we were opposed to the submarine warfare. In October, 1916, submarine cruiser warfare began, ships being stopped and searched. This met with good success, and had an embarrassing effect on the economic situation of the enemy. It spoke well for the submarine weapon. Soon however the enemy's defensive measures against our boats were improved, and results fell off considerably. In estimating the economic effects of the various forms of submarine warfare we were compelled to rely on the judgment of the Chief of the Naval Staff and of the Chancellor. General Headquarters was in constant communication with both these authorities on the whole matter, and in particular on the question of the expediency of unrestricted warfare. After our victories in Romania, General Headquarters no longer expected that either Holland or Denmark would enter the war against us. It was, however, unwise to take any risks, the unrestricted campaign could obviously not be begun before the Romanian campaign was at an end and our troops there had returned home and arrived on the western and eastern fronts. It was soon clear that this would not be the case before the beginning of February. It also seemed plain that we should have to hold our hands to see, first, whether any success would be achieved by the intervention of President Wilson on the lines on which our government had invited it in September, and also the effect of our own offer of peace. If the end of the war should appear to be in sight, submarine warfare on the lines proposed would be no longer necessary. All discussion was to no purpose. The result of our efforts for peace would be sure to be known by the end of December or early in January, and this, too, pointed to the beginning of February as the date for opening the unrestricted campaign, if that should prove necessary. The government had by now lost its earlier anxiety as to the attitude of Holland and Denmark, and none was felt as to Switzerland, Spain, Sweden or Norway. 
On the other hand, it was regarded as practically certain that the United States would come into the war against us. General headquarters had to take into account, in dealing with the military situation, the views thus expressed in responsible quarters. It would involve an addition to the armed forces of the Entente of five or six divisions in the first year after America entered the war, and later on, if the submarine war failed, a serious, indeed a vital, increase in the strength of the enemy. It could not be doubted that America, if she came into the war, would arm herself in the same way that England had done, and that the Entente would lead the United States from one energetic step to another. I had, however, no serious fear as to any increased output of munitions in the States. They were already working with all their might for the Entente. The chief of the naval staff, a friend of the Chancellor, but at the same time a warm partisan of the unrestricted submarine war, was confident that the campaign would have decisive results within six months. The loss of freight space and the reduction of overseas imports would produce economic difficulties in England that would render a continuance of the war impossible. In forming this view he did not rely merely on his own professional judgment, but was also supported by the opinions of distinguished German economists. The shortage of shipping would cut down the transport of munitions, and in particular the huge transport of war material from England to France which could also be attacked directly. The number of submarines in commission was sufficient for this work and our admiralty was also of the opinion that construction, if it was pressed onto the utmost, would amply cover losses. In 1916, after submarine warfare had been abandoned in principle, construction had not in fact been pressed on very vigorously. The question of crews could, it was thought, be solved. They would have to be drawn mainly from the second line fleet, which consisted of the oldest ships, but the other vessels also would have to release officers and engineers of a certain seniority. The surface fleet was not, of course, to fall below a certain standard of strength. In face of the enemy sea power, which was continually being increased by new construction and might be further increased by the entry of America into the war, it was essential that our fleet should be maintained at sufficient strength to ensure the effective carrying through of the submarine campaign. It had the duty of ensuring the passage of the submarines through the enemy mine fields. It remained, at the same time, sufficiently formidable to thwart every attempt of the enemy to interrupt sea traffic in the Baltic. The chief of the naval staff also hoped that the Declaration Zero unrestricted submarine warfare would frighten neutral shipping which had, up to then, been of great assistance to the Entente he was quite convinced of the necessity for the strongest support, in political quarters, on this point, which, as it turned out, he did not always obtain. The amount of shipping necessary for the transport of troops from America to France and for the supply of reinforcements was discussed. Our Navy reckoned that the freight space required for the transport of an army with supplies and reinforcements amounted to at least five British register tons per man. This estimate was confirmed by our experience in the attack on Easel in the autumn of 1917. Calculations pointed to a result favorable to us. It would thus be necessary, in order to transport one million American soldiers in a reasonable time, to employ five million tons of shipping space. Such a quantity of shipping, in view of the necessity for maintaining supplies to the Western powers, could not be spared, even temporarily. The economic value of the campaign was the subject of varying opinion in our government. The Ministry of the Interior gradually came round, only after the campaign had begun, to, a favourable view, in which the Imperial Chancellor supported them. With my knowledge of the military situation and my high opinion of the enemy's determination, I did not accept literally the estimates of our admiralty as to the probable effects of unrestricted submarine warfare. I knew, moreover, that questions of transport and of economics generally are very difficult to determine. I did, however, think it safe to reckon that it would at least have a decisive effect within 12 months, that is to say, before America could throw her new armies into the scale. I hoped that, with the measures already taken and to be taken, we could hold out for this period on land, assuming that the submarine campaign caused sufficient disturbance of the enemy's industries to reduce their output of war material and cut down substantially their shipments of munitions to fiancé. For the first few months I attributed the greatest importance to this. I was greatly impressed with the seriousness of the position by a tour which I took of the Western Front in the middle of December, with a view to reviewing the whole situation. I telegraphed my views to Berlin. At that time I had already abandoned hope of any success from our offer of peace. On the 23rd of December, the field marshal, in the presence of the Chancellor, expounded more fully his view that the adoption of unrestricted submarine warfare was essential. 
the latter, on the 24th, stated that he was ready to initiate discussion on the matter so soon as the answer expected from the Angtan to our peace proposal had brought the matter more or less to finality, he repeated, however. His declaration of the, the 6th of October to the effect that the adoption of the campaign was a question of foreign policy and that he and he alone bore and could bear the constitutional responsibility for the step. Our view of this question had not changed. The Chancellor had his responsibilities and we had ours. In a telegram to von Bethmann the Field Marshal, made his position clear in the following words. Your Excellency as Chancellor can, of course, claim the sole responsibility, but I must clearly work, with all my strength and with a full sense of my responsibility, for the victorious end of the war, to secure that everything is done which I hold as proper for the achievement of that end. That was the right and duty of General Headquarters, just as it was the right and duty of the Chancellor, in this difficult and momentous question, to support his own opinion with all the prestige of his high office. If there were differences of opinion, the decision lay with His Majesty. As it seemed probable that the answer of the Entente, both to our offer of peace and to Wilson's proposal for intervention, would be a refusal, the Chancellor came to Pless to discuss the question as early as the end of December, but nothing definite was then decided. The actual decision was arrived at on the 9th of January, at a meeting presided over by His Majesty, after the receipt of the answer to our peace offer, and in the certainty that a like reply would be given to President Wilson. The chief of the naval staff expressed the view stated above, he advised that the campaign would be decisive in a few months and urged its adoption the field marshal reported our view of the situation, and also advised its adoption. The chancellor stated the effect the use of this weapon might have upon neutrals, and in particular upon the United States. He thought it possible, and indeed probable, that the states would enter the war, and anticipated difficulties with regard to the provisioning of Belgium by the Entente. He regarded our offer of peace as having failed, he saw no other possibility of achieving peace, not even by a new attempt on the part of Wilson, the note of the, the 18th of December might be taken to have failed. He had no hope of a separate peace, and he did not anticipate any improvement in our position through the collapse of one of our enemies, such as subsequently happened in the case of Russia. The likelihood of this happening would, of course, have altered the whole situation, and would have had the greatest weight with us in our decisions. The Chancellor's judgment as to our military position was the same as our own. While we felt compelled resolutely to draw the inevitable and serious inference, and act on it, the Chancellor, as his nature was, remained undecided and came to such conclusions as, the decision to embark on the campaign depends on the effects which are to be expected from it, and, if the military authorities regard it as essential, I am not in a position to withstand them, and, if success beckons, we must act. However, with a full sense of his political responsibility, the Chancellor did advise the adoption of the campaign, as did His Majesty's other advisers. The Emperor fell in with their views and commanded that the campaign should open on the, the 1st of February. He directed, however, that time should be given to neutral vessels in the blockaded area to leave it, and to neutral vessels on their way to the area to complete their voyages. The Chancellor then prepared, in cooperation with the Chief of the Naval Staff, the notes to neutral powers as to the declaration of the blockade area around England, along the west coast of France and in the Mediterranean. These were to be delivered on the, the 31st of January. The chief of the naval staff gave the detailed instructions for operations in the blockade area, making various concessions to the wishes of the Foreign Office in order to lessen the danger of a rupture with America. We were, of course, quite in agreement with such a course. General headquarters on its side took certain precautionary measures in the Northern Army District, in order to be ready for all eventualities, although the Chancellor had no anxiety as to the attitude of Holland and Denmark. The construction of defensive positions in Northern Schleswig had made good progress and there was no need to do more than reinforce the frontier guard with a few cavalry. An Army Corps staff was moved thither temporarily, in order to obtain information as to local conditions. On our Dutch frontier the frontier troops were grouped in divisional formations and placed under an Army Corps staff that was stationed at Munster. The construction of defensive works was here much in arrears. Not too much had been done, either, on the Dutch-Belgian frontier, owing to shortage of labour. For the rest, our defensive measures were merely worked out on paper. The troops released from the operations in Romania were to carry them out only if necessity arose, and were otherwise to be employed on the Western Front they were in the first instance moved into Belgium. 4. 
In the middle of January General Headquarters received from the Foreign Office a transcript of a dispatch from Count Bemstorf of the late January, to the effect that the note dealing with armed merchant vessels would frustrate President Wilson's proposals for intervening to negotiate peace. This surprised me, as all idea of any definite intervention by the President had vanished. Count Bemstorf could not be referring to anything else than the step taken by the President on the 18th of December, which was not officially answered by the Entente until the 12th of January, but was definitely put an end to by that answer, as we had anticipated. I was unaware of any new step or proposal, and so was the Chancellor. He accordingly replied to Bemstorf on the, the 16th of January, we are resolved to take the risk, of rupture and possibly of war with the United States. This cablegram had probably not reached Count Bemstorf when he cabled again to the Foreign Office, unless military considerations are absolutely decisive, it would be highly desirable to postpone the unrestricted warfare. Wilson believes he can secure peace on the basis proposed by us of equality of rights for all nations. In forwarding us this cablegram, the Secretary for Foreign Affairs wrote that he had urged the Chief of the Naval Staff to lessen the danger of a rupture with America by fixing certain definite periods of grace for neutral ships, which the Ambassador had proposed. I at once replied that we agreed to this. It is clear that the Foreign Office had not concluded, even from this second communication from Bernstorff, that there was any modification of the general situation, for the Secretary would otherwise have mentioned it. I never had a clear understanding of the correspondence between the government and the ambassador, indeed, I only learnt of it by degrees. I knew nothing of the progress of the negotiations with the United States. The Chancellor and the Secretary for Foreign Affairs complained of the difficulties of communication with the ambassador and of the resulting ambiguities. They had, of course, to do everything possible to avoid a rupture with the United States, in spite of the existence of the unrestricted campaign. On the 29th of January, unexpectedly, so far as I was concerned, Chancellor von Bethmann and Secretary Dr. Zimmermann arrived at Pless. We were summoned to a discussion with the Emperor over a new proposal for intervention by President Wilson. The Chancellor read a dispatch which he had drafted for transmission to Count Bernstorff, in which he proposed that we should declare for peace on the status quo ante basis. So far as I remember, the dispatch proposed the submission to President Wilson, then or on some later occasion, of the following claims as the basis for possible peace negotiations. Restoration of the portions of Upper Alsace occupied by France. A frontier securing Germany and Poland strategically and economically against Russia. Restoration of colonies on the basis of an agreement securing to Germany colonial possessions corresponding to her population and her economic interests. Return to France of the territory occupied by Germany, subject to strategic and economic rectification of frontiers, and to financial compensation. Restoration of Belgium, subject to definite guarantees for Germany's safety, which would be negotiated with the Belgian government. Economic and financial adjustment on the basis of the exchange of conquered territories given up by either side to the other on the conclusion of peace. Indemnity to German concerns or private persons injured by the war renunciation of all economic measures or treaties calculated to interfere after the conclusion of peace with normal trade or communication, and the conclusion of the commercial agreements necessary thereto. The guaranteeing of the freedom of the seas. These are the only German conditions which ever reached the enemy from our side with any cooperation on my part. The Chancellor did not suggest a postponement of the unrestricted campaign, but the Ambassador was authorized to explain that our government was ready to order the cessation of the campaign immediately any basis for peace negotiations was worked out that offered any real hope of success. The Field Marshal and I agreed to this. The whole discussion took place in one of the Emperor's rooms, and occupied but little time. The Emperor's birthday presents were still lying about, and I remember in particular a fine picture of the cruiser and den. I know no more than the above as to the circumstances surrounding this diplomatic step, nor the course which it followed. I mentioned to the field marshal, after the discussion was over, my resentment at the manner in which our cooperation in these tremendously important decisions had been obtained. Although we had no clear knowledge of the situation, we had to bear the moral responsibility. On the 31st of January our note as to the declaration of the submarine campaign was delivered in Washington, as also, I assume, was the government's above-mentioned proposal of the, the 29th of January. After the, the 9th of January there were no military reasons whatever to cause either the field marshal or myself to modify our views as to the urgent need for the unrestricted campaign.
According to a report from the chief of the naval staff in Vienna, the Austro-Hungarian government also decided to wage unrestricted warfare with their submarines. I welcomed with gratitude this loyal act on the part of our allies, which I had, of course, confidently expected. The new campaign could only be really effective if it included the Mediterranean, where prospects of success seemed particularly good, the important tiling was to sink as much shipping as possible. General von Conrad had also advocated the adhesion of Austria to the campaign. When later, in 191s, Count Chernin stated that Lai had adopted this policy in order to avoid a quarrel with Germany, he stated something that was quite new to me. There was never any idea of bringing military pressure to bear on Austria-Hungary. In judging public opinion on the matter at home, I regarded as a very important element the sitting of the Reichstag of the, the 27th of February, in which it appeared that, after the failure of our peace offer, the German people were practically unanimous in supporting the government. The leader of the majority socialists, Herr Scheidmann, while refusing any responsibility for the submarine campaign, spoke as follows. Everyone will understand the deep satisfaction which we felt when we learned that the government had made an offer of peace to the world, based on arguments similar to our own. When the enemy's notorious reply to Wilson stripped the veil from their plans for conquest and annihilation, the determination to defend our country resolutely was again restored. The people cried with one voice, anything rather than such a peace. No one had expected that the enemy would accept the German when I received a letter from Chancellor von Bethmann, to the effect that offence had been caused in Vienna by my reference to the campaign of 1866. He begged me to prevent it being reported, but that was already impossible. I was as much surprised by the attitude of the Vienna court as by the letter from Berlin. The 1866 campaign, it appears, had left a deep and permanent impression on the Emperor Francis Joseph. In that campaign he had lost his confidence in his army, and he never fully regained it, although he worked hard for it, and held high the old traditions of his imperial army. His death was an irreparable loss to us. The murdered heir, the Archduke Francis Ferdinand, was not the man of action he was commonly held to be. Indeed, he was naturally vacillating and irresolute, and by no moans friendly to Germany. Our emperor made great efforts to turn the Archduke and his wife to a friendly attitude to us. His death was a tragedy and its results have been disastrous. They have brought on Austria, after four years of war, the fate that Russia, the real author of the tragedy, intended. True, Russia has ruined herself in the process. The murdered heir would not have been the man to have taken over the guidance of the dual monarchy after the death of the aged emperor, the separatist tendencies had grown too strong during the war. Mismanagement had increased. In many quarters there was bad feeling both in the army and at home. War weariness was growing, and the longing for peace was greater every day. It would have required no ordinary man to restore the fighting spirit of the dual monarchy and bring new life into the Austro-Hungarian army. I first saw the Emperor Charles, when he was still only Archduke, in December, 1914. He gave an impression of extreme youthfulness. At the beginning of November, 1916, I saw him again. He had developed and become more manly. He spoke well on military subjects. The burden of his new and high position was, however, to become too heavy for him. Troubles began to crowd in on him. He attempted much, and at the same time gave way to many men and in many matters. He was conscious of the internal political difficulties of the dual monarchy, and had plans for a League of the Peoples of Austria under the House of Habsburg, at the same time he was unable to persuade the Hungarians to a less selfish policy, and could not make them abandon their food blockade against Austria. It was characteristic of him that he pardoned the Czech leaders who had openly worked against the monarchy, his fear of the Czech movement, and the whole weakness of the government and the monarchy, were rendered notorious by this conduct. The only consequence was an encouragement of the separatist tendencies among his non-German peoples, and grave mistrust among his Germans, who stood firm in their loyalty to their imperial house. The army, too, felt it as a slight, especially the German officers and men, who were fighting courageously for the imperial house and the dual monarchy. Countless numbers of their German brothers had met their death on the field of battle through Czech troops going over to the enemy. The Emperor Charles, although by no means a convinced supporter of the alliance, held firmly to Germany. He wanted peace, but in his anxiety to achieve it he went too far in his letters to his brother-in-law, Prince Sixtus. The Emperor Charles attached great importance to his position as supreme warlord of the Austro-Hungarian army. 
At his wish the arrangement we had come to as regards a unified command for the forces of the Quadruple Alliance were altered and somewhat weakened. Without being truly soldierly, he wanted to give his best to his army. The Empress Zeta, who had great influence over her husband, had strong political opinions. She was unfortunately wholly unfriendly to us, and in the hands of the clericals who were not well disposed to Germany. The Minister for Foreign Affairs was Count Chemin, a clever man of wide experience. He was an educated and amiable personality, and far above the Wilhelmstrasse. In the main, he pursued the same path as the Chancellor in Berlin. He desired peace, but only hand in hand with Germany. He must be given this tribute of praise, that he was loyal. At the same time he always upheld, and with uncommon ability, the interests of the dual monarchy. In dealing with his imperial master he showed calmness and firmness. Nevertheless, he lent his authority to the pardon of the Czechs, and to the emperor's vacillating policy toward the subject peoples. He remained in office, although he did not approve of the pardon, and although this step, symptomatic as it was of the impending collapse of the dual monarchy, was bound to make peace more difficult, and to strengthen the hopes of the Entente for victory. Personally I had a great liking for the Count, and took no little pleasure in his conversation. Unfortunately he was too ready to repeat the Wilhelmstrasse gossip about my dictatorship. I often explained to him how unfounded this supposition was. His political confession of the 11th of December 1918 was no surprise to me, having regard to his general view of the war. General von Ars was made chief of the general staff of the Austro-Hungarian army, in the place of General von Konrad, who took over the command of the army group on the Tyrol front. I had always been on terms of the greatest confidence with General von Konrad, so that from the personal point of view I saw this great general leave his office with unmixed regret. My relations with General von Ars were, however, to become even more intimate. He was a convinced friend of the German Empire and the German army. During the summer campaign of 1915 he had commanded the 6th Austro-Hungarian Army Corps as part of the 11th Army, and in close cooperation with German troops had led it with such ability as to earn for himself and his corps the highest German regard. As commander of the 1st Army in Transylvania he did everything that was humanly possible in view of its composition. He endeavoured to establish cordial relations between the German and the Austro-Hungarian troops in his army, and devoted himself wholeheartedly to their training. Perhaps not so agile of mind as General von Konrad, he was a soldier of sound grasp, who did his utmost to improve the Austrian army, and make the country give it everything it needed. He did all that could be done, though that was not in any sense decisive. He improved, the longer he remained in office. General von R. selected as his director of operations General von Waldstatten, a capable and ambitious officer, who earned the confidence of his chief and the army. Satisfactory cooperation between ourselves and the Austrian headquarters was thus a certainty for the future. Chapter The Basis of Future Operations and Our War Machine the war called on us to gather together and throw into the scale the last ounce of our strength, either in the lighting line or behind the lines in our war industries or other work at home, or in government service. Each citizen could only serve his country in one post, but in some way his strength should be used to that end. Service to the state was the important thing. In general the distribution of manpower between the army, the navy, and home services was carried out by the general staff in cooperation with the civil officials concerned. The former alone could supervise the whole matter in detail, for even the Prussian minister of war had but an insufficient and partial view of the forces at the enemy's disposal and the needs of the situation. Up to this time, the army in the field had received adequate reinforcements from returned wounded, of whom, thanks to our admirable medical service, a very high proportion came back to the line, from the yearly classes as they were called up, and from re-examinations and comb-outs. We were forced to send men of 19 to the front, younger men could not be sent. The medical standards were reduced, and the vast majority of the available men called up. It was still necessary, however, not merely to send into the army all the men then available, but also to find some new source of supply. In particular it was vital to reduce the numbers of exemptions. At the same time, we had to find the labor needed for the work behind the lines, where the construction of positions was of simply incalculable importance, and to keep up the war industries at home. Fit for garrison duty only was always a thorn in my side, when everything was at stake, why should not the garrison duty man, who was employed in the field, carry a rifle as much as the general service man? 
The men, however, looked on their garrison duty classification as a sort of passport to safety. General headquarters never succeeded in adjusting this conception to the urgency of the army's needs or in getting rid of the ill effects of this expression. An order of the Minister of War, issued in the autumn of 1918, was too late to do any good. In the meantime, the standard of fitness for general service had been again revised, and below the class of garrison duty in the field or at home there was created another, labor duty. The system of re-examination and control generally at home seemed to me to be defective. Complaints of the most incredible shirking were always being made. I urged the war ministry to act energetically, which was only bare justice. I was never able to feel, however, that in this respect things were as they should be, having regard to the spirit of the army and the public. The law left untouched labor that should have been devoted to the state. The duty of service was only laid on men between 17 and 45. I regarded this limitation as quite inappropriate in view of the iron necessities of the war. As early as September, 1916, the Chancellor received the first demands of General Headquarters for the ruthless requisition of all our manpower. We insisted emphatically on the point of view that in war the powers of every citizen are at the disposal of the state, and that accordingly every German from 15 to 60 should be under an obligation to serve, an obligation which, with certain limitations, lay on women too. The duty could be fulfilled by service at the front, or by work, in the widest sense, at home, and was in no sense limited to workmen in the ordinary meaning of the word, although it, of course, fell mainly on them. The introduction of compulsion for war services was of the greatest moral importance, placing as it did every German at the service of the state in these anxious times, in accordance with the oldest principles of German law. It should also have had the great practical advantage of giving the government the control over rates of wages. It was one of the most crying injustices of the war, and must have been so felt by the troops, that they, who were risking their lives daily, were much worse off than any of the workmen who lived in safety. While the soldier was fighting for himself, his wife and children, he could only think with anxiety of his future and the maintenance of his family. The separation allowances were in no way sufficient. The longing to get back home, which could be sufficiently explained by the desire for personal safety, had also a higher motive in family affection. The same feeling kept many a man at home, and gave to service at the front an air of punishment. This was a thoroughly unsatisfactory position. The pay of the fighting men should have been raised, and I attempted, without any real success in the face of official opposition at home, to have it raised, and the wages of workmen should have been kept down to a reasonable level. This would, of course, have involved the limitation of war profits also, for wages and profits necessarily stand in dose relation to each other. Such a course would have saved considerable sums, thus easing our budget and conserving our capital. I was not unaware of the difficulties of the problem, having regard to Tin's universal rise in prices due to the shortage of raw materials, but I hoped that the home country would solve it and discover a method of reaching a sound position. A law establishing the general duty of service would have shown the way. The introduction of general conscription, coupled with that of compulsory labor, was not of itself sufficient. It was essential, too, to secure that the labor thus obtained was profitably used, and that the state did not lose the benefit of it. It was quite clear to me that measures of this sort would involve far-reaching interference with administration, trade, and private life. It was also not to be forgotten that too many restrictions tend to stultify individual effort. Opposition was bound to arise, even when the demands made did no more than correspond with the iron necessity of the war. Self-seeking and profiteering were already firmly rooted. We had, however, to show the people the way to victory, to make them see the facts clearly and settle their own destiny. The Reichstag, and with it the whole people, had to share the responsibility. On the 30th of October 1916, the Chancellor was urgently requested to work for that end. I hoped that the government would be prepared to adopt the great principle of universal service, and to bring the people to consider what further powers and resources they could yet devote to their country. It required an unselfish understanding on the part of the people to shake themselves free from the self-seeking of domestic politics, to devote themselves wholly to the war, and to translate into action the proposals of general headquarters. The government did not take these steps. I had still at that time unlimited confidence in the German people and the German working class. The war was life and death for us all, this should be made clear to the workers, and then, as I believed, they would be certain, in their knowledge of the great danger threatening them and their country, to range themselves behind general headquarters, and give even more than they had done. 
the German workman had already done wonders, but he could still do more. Just as troops, in the hour of peril, are enabled to do their utmost through patriotism inculcated by discipline, so in a long war the nation is held together and kept on its feet by firm leadership and a clear conception of the danger threatening the country. The enthusiasm of the moment passes. That is inevitable, and it must be replaced by discipline and understanding. That this could be achieved, I had no doubt. Even without any new legislation the government could help us. The state of siege and war services laws gave the necessary powers to obtain the labor required, but resolution was required to apply them properly. The government lacked that resolution. The administration of these laws, however, would amount to a mere application of force, from which, on reflection, I saw little hope of real success. I thought that it would be better to have a special law supported by the approval of the whole people, one which would make plain to the whole world our determination to hold out. This, too, I explained to the Chancellor. At last, after two months' delay, and prolonged and unedifying pressure from general headquarters, the government made up its mind, in November, to introduce into the Reichstag the Auxiliary Service Bill, which was passed on the, the 2nd of December. It was neither fish nor fowl. We wanted something wholesale. The bill departed, too, from the principle of universal liability to service, which we had laid down in September, and gave no security that the labor power obtained would be so employed as to produce the maximum results. In practice the law, largely owing to the manner in which it was administered, was but a shadow of the reality we desired, a reality which would have devoted the whole strength of the nation to the nation's service, and so supplied reinforcements for the army and labor for the army and home industries. In the whole text of the statute the first paragraph alone bears any resemblance to what general headquarters had aimed at. The provisions did not even cover women, although there were many available to replace men at their work and release them for the army. In spite of everything, I gave the law at first a warm welcome. Friend and foe alike attributed to it, as a sign of our determination, a far higher value than it really possessed. In connection with our successes in Romania, it was bound to have considerable moral effect. I followed the course of the discussions in the Reichstag with unmixed regret. This was the first time in the war that I had the opportunity, and also, in my position as first quartermaster general, the duty, to do so. General headquarters obtained by this means an insight into the state of public opinion that was of decisive importance for the issue of the war. It was certain that the government was in a very delicate position in dealing with the difficult labor questions. It should have followed a strong war policy, instead of a weak and submissive domestic policy. Why did it not boldly and clearly make the whole people share the responsibility for the result of the war? Certain parties in the Reichstag seemed unable to realize the necessity of postponing party interest for the general good in the hour of peril. The government, the Reichstag, and a large part of the nation had never yet understood the character of modern warfare, which demands the devotion of all its resources, nor had they ever realized the importance to ultimate victory of their full cooperation in the fight. The general staff had again and again to emphasize that the war meant life or death to Germany. It soon became clear that the auxiliary service law was not merely insufficient, but positively harmful in operation. It was particularly irritating to the troops to find auxiliary workers, though employed on the same work and in the same positions, being far better paid than the men who had been called up for service under previous legislation and were now soldiers under military discipline. These grievances were increased by the circumstance that exempted men were paid the same wages as free workmen, that is to say, as the auxiliary workers. This was wholly unjust and unfair. On the lines of communication there were still greater contrasts. Troops withdrawn from the heavy fighting at the front saw auxiliary workers and women workers working in peace and safety for wages far higher than their own pay. This was bound to embitter the men who had to risk their lives day by day and to endure the greatest hardships, and of necessity increased their dissatisfaction with their pay. The employment of highly paid auxiliaries on the lines of communications was thus a two-edged sword. There was something fundamentally unsound in such a situation. The measures introduced in September with a view to employing all our available manpower had thus had but a very scanty result. The latent qualities of the nation had not been properly made available, partly because they were not used at all, partly because they were wasted. Too much was left at home which should have been given to the army. The efforts of general headquarters had failed, the conviction was forced upon us that the German people was no longer sound at heart. 
To increase the esteem in which war work and auxiliary service were held, I proposed the institution of the Auxiliary Service Cross. Later on, I was one of the first to receive it, and, having regard to the tremendous importance I attributed to the satisfaction of General Headquarters' demands, wore it as proudly as my other decorations, even if with a certain melancholy. I was thinking of the working of the Auxiliary Service Law, which disappointed me more and more heavily as time went on. To obtain the necessary skilled workers for the increased production of war material, General Headquarters had to draw heavily on the army, weakening the fighting forces correspondingly. In the winter of 1916-17 alone, 125,000 men were sent back home, to be returned to the army so soon as they could again be spared. I pressed persistently for arrangements to be made as rapidly as possible between the military and the industrial world for the formation of a body of substitute skilled labor, and for the employment of disabled men and of women in such work. It is time that a great deal was done, but nowhere was the energy shown that our position demanded. In the end it came to this, that the exempted men formed a privileged class, and it was no longer possible to exercise any control over them. The increase of our war industries no doubt brought enormous material reinforcement to the army, but it also cost us heavily in manpower. The longer this situation lasted, and the greater the need of men became owing to the constantly increasing strength of the enemy, the more did General Headquarters consider itself under a duty to the country, the army, and each individual soldier fighting at the front, to insist dot on the men at home really working hard. No more men could be withdrawn or withheld from the army. The fall in labor output, which could not be wholly explained by external circumstances, and the strikes, were phenomena which directly impaired the country's fighting capacity in the highest degree. They were a sin against the man at the front, and also, according to the courts, acts of high treason against the country. Lacking a lead from the government, infatuated and misled by agitators, a section of the German working class has precipitated their country, their fellows, and themselves, into incalculable misery. It will always be a terrible indictment against them. The government should have made especial endeavours to influence the working class by full explanation of the seriousness of our position, and should also not have hesitated to use force if everything else failed. General headquarters knew only too well that in dealing with exemptions there were cases of favouritism, which of necessity had the same embittering effects as the shirking at home. Often and often I begged the Ministry of War to put a stop to this. It was inevitable that, in our difficult position, we should have to turn our attention to the occupied territories. The Ministry of War had already tackled this question, and the employment of Belgian workmen in Germany had actually begun. General Headquarters requested the Governor-General to comply with the wishes of the War Ministry and industry generally, and did so all the more earnestly because, at that time, the government had not even met the army's demands for additional men to the extent of passing the auxiliary service law. The conscription of workmen for Germany was in the interest of the Belgians themselves, since unemployment had reached a high figure. This conscription, after discussion with the officials in Berlin, was extended. With these extended enlistments, which at first were carried too far, there were cases of hardship, which it would have been better to avoid. They were in the main due to the Belgians themselves, who often denounced their fellow countrymen, for one reason or another, as out of work, when this was not the case. The Governor-General put a stop to these abuses so soon as he discovered them. In course of time many Belgian workmen emigrated to Germany, without any further complaints being heard. We also conscribed Belgian workmen for work in the occupied regions. In the Belgian refugee press and in the Entente propaganda, as was to be expected, there was a wild outcry against this procedure. The fact that similar cries were raised in Germany merely reveals a very childish judgment on the war. The military authorities were acting from patriotic duty, and not arbitrarily. We also obtained labor, though not as much as we might have hoped, from Poland and the other occupied territories, as well as from those which we acquired later on. We acted everywhere with the greatest consideration, and avoided any appearance of oppressing foreign populations with the air of a high-handed conqueror, we were much too objective, and such conduct was not in accordance with our views. Prisoners of war were of the utmost importance in all fields of war activity. We could not have kept our economic structure together without the aid of the enormous numbers of Russians taken in the East. For the same reason, of course, the prisoners taken from us involved not merely an actual diminution of our strength, but also an increase in the labor force available to the enemy. Whenever we took prisoners, it had to be decided whether they were to be employed in the occupied districts or to be sent on into Germany. 
In this respect, too, the greatest consideration was shown to the authorities at home, even when the army was in the most urgent need of labor. 2. Side by side with the effort to obtain further manpower from the home country went the preparation of the program for munitions production, for the execution of which a part of the manpower in question was to serve. Our most pressing need was for more guns, ammunition, and machine guns, and then larger supplies of many other things. The guns were needed, not only for new armament, but also for changes in the old, to substitute later models for old ones, and also make good the very heavy wastage. In the battles of Verdun and the Somme, we suffered heavy losses in guns, not merely through hostile bombardment, but also because they wore out extremely quickly through the higher rate of firing. Our heavy artillery was well supplied with high-angle howitzers, but the number of long-range weapons was not so satisfactory, and we accelerated their production, as shelling of back areas had proved very harassing to the enemy. It rendered the daily supply to and relief of the troops in the front line very difficult and in action made the transmission of orders and the movements of reserves a serious problem. The supply of the heaviest long-range guns was also increased. His Majesty made special efforts to secure that the Navy should give up guns from the vessels that were placed out of commission. The heaviest guns still required railway mountings, and were thus restricted to certain areas. Mechanical transport was more necessary than ever, particularly for bringing up ammunition. A gun and a howitzer of longer range were being introduced into the field artillery. It was necessary to decide how many guns were to be produced monthly, in order to cover all requirements. This was a difficult matter. In the case of the heavy artillery our estimate was about correct, but for the field artillery it was too high. When we found that out, we fell below the mark and henceforward there was always a certain vacillation. Industry cannot be transformed in a day, and each change involves time, and a falling off in production. It was thus necessary to exercise the greatest caution in deciding on any new construction. This was the reason why we were not so insistent on the production of a special infantry gun as we might have been in view of subsequent events. X. For defense against tanks the 06 field gun, which penetrated them, was sufficient, all we had to do was to turn it out in sufficient quantities. At this time the increased production of ammunition depended on a larger supply of explosives, and this in its turn depended on the possibility of obtaining or producing the necessary elements. Sulfur and nitrogen were particularly important. It was a very difficult task to solve the problem of their supply. We aimed at approximately doubling the previous production. This level was gradually reached, in spite of many obstacles, including serious explosions and shortage of coal. When the explosives program was carried out, steel began to get scarce. In short, we had one trouble after another, before we succeeded in increasing our munitions production to the desired point. A matter requiring special attention was the supply of the various sorts of ammunition to the troops. There were too many varieties, it was nothing less than a work of art for battery commanders to estimate their requirements, and for the staffs to get the right supplies up to the right place at the right time. The construction of our fuses left something to be desired. The pre-war fuses were not simple enough, and it was essential to get better designs. We had to be very economical with copper and brass, the shortage of which hampered our plans. In spite of the efforts of the Artillery Testing Commission, it was a very long time before we had reliable fuses, which worked in such a way as to burst the shell on immediate contact with the ground. The shell fragments thus spread well and low, instead of being buried. We soon abandoned shrapnel, the training of the troops being insufficient for such delicate work. Shells with sensitive fuses were everywhere preferred. Gas production, too, had to keep pace with the increased output of ammunition. The discharge of gas from cylinders was used less and less, the troops being opposed to it from first to last, and the use of gas shells increased correspondingly. Our Yellow Cross gas shell was greatly feared by the enemy. Our men were still apprehensive of damage from our own gas and it was a long time before things improved in this respect. Geheimrat Haber rendered valuable service in connection with the use of gas. Smoke shells, too, were now manufactured. The infantry was supplied with a light machine gun, which might well have been lighter and more simple, for it required too many men. It was necessary to come to a decision, however, for preparations for manufacture had to be made and these took months and months. Each company of infantry was to have four, and later six, of these light guns. Our older, heavy machine gun was good, and the men liked it. 
the artillery was shortly afterwards equipped with this for protection against infantry attacks and for anti-aircraft work. The supply of armor-piercing bullets to the infantry for use against aircraft and tanks was increased, and the war ministry also undertook the production of other rapid-fire weapons for the infantry, as well as of weapons of heavier caliber to deal effectively with tanks. Great attention had to be given to the production of motor transport. Our horses were getting worse and worse, and remounts came forward slowly. We had to make lorries to replace horse transport, although here, too, we were met with difficulties in the supply of material. We also needed lorries for carrying troops. The enemy, backed by their enormous industries, found it easier and easier, not merely to move their reserves quickly in lorries, but also to use them on an increasing scale for bringing troops up from billets to the line and taking them back again, thus achieving an important economy of physical and moral strength. We had to be content if we could find lorries enough for troop movements in great emergencies. The time was not yet come for us to undertake the construction of tanks. Our aircraft industry took a quite special position. The opposing armies were competing to produce the fastest, best climbing machines. Now one side, now the other would gain the lead, and our industry was often ahead. Especially in 1918 we had some splendid types, to which, next to their own courage, our flying men owed their victories. Hitherto I have only dealt with some of the more important kinds of war material, of which largely increased supplies were required. But of course everything had to be thought of, for everything was important. Barbed wire, for example, was as urgently required as small arm ammunition. To settle in what proportions the various kinds of material were to be produced, we had to weigh one against another and consider their relative importance and the probable future requirements. The whole program was a complicated mental achievement, intended as it was to meet future requirements rather than present necessities. Most of the credit is due to Colonel Bauer, of my staff. It was only definitely settled after several conferences in Berlin and received the name of the Hindenburg program, although the program put forward by General Headquarters was not confined to the proposals for increased munitions production, but included demands for more men and moral support. It was clear that considerable time would be required for the carrying out of the Hindenburg program, indeed, its very introduction produced a general dislocation which for the moment tended rather to reduce than to increase production. A whole series of inevitable obstacles had to be surmounted. As soon as we could see clearly, we were met with the difficulty that the works which in peacetime had been employed in the manufacture of locomotives, and had been transformed for war purposes, had to be given back again for locomotive manufacture. Our rolling stock was now in need of a thorough overhaul. Their munitions work had, of course, to be distributed among other factories, and all plant had to be used to the utmost. The increased output made the extension of factories necessary, and this took time. In other places works had to be abandoned or amalgamated. The whole constituted a far-reaching interference with our industry, and all the more so as we had such leeway to make up. A good deal of time was bound to elapse before work began on the Hindenburg program, and still longer before the raw material became war material. The program itself, too, had to be revised and cut down. As things became clearer, it could be seen that the necessary labor for the whole program could not be obtained without endangering the supply of men for the army and navy, at a later stage the view was expressed that the whole program had been a mistake and that the general headquarters would have been better advised to leave the war ministry to continue its work as before, merely making its demands on that ministry. The field marshal and I could, however, only deal with the situation we found and that was a shortage of supply and equipment for the army, in spite of the presence of the war minister at general headquarters, and of the fact that that shortage was an open secret. Of course it is obvious that instead of this sudden expansion of our war industries it would have been far better to have effected a timely but wholesale transformation of our peace industry into war industry, the former having been prepared for the change in peacetime or during the first two years of the war. General headquarters, however, had to act in a situation where those ideal conditions were not present. It is always the same. At first nothing adequate is done, the critics complain, but have no specific details to attack. But as soon as something is done, something constructive brought into being, even if it is really a great piece of organization, the critic has something on which he can really fasten. Often enough he is right. It is easy to be wise after the event. Inaction and neglect are always the worst offenses, worse than mistakes of method. The Hindenburg program did really become a program, and it achieved more than the other parts of the great scheme, in which we had no say. 
We got our industries going at last. The Hindenburg program was carried through, thanks to the munitions production office created out of the Ordnance Department. This office was under the control of General Capet, who was especially concerned with technical and industrial questions, he had the assistance of his two important and resolute chiefs of staff, Major Stadlander and Colonel Wurzbacher. The army knows well what it owes to this office and the men at its head. Our industry backed up the fighting forces. It will always have the honor and credit of that. Once it was made clear what demands were to be made on it, it got to work on its task with characteristic energy, and gave ever better and better results. That it ensured to itself a correspondingly high reward from the government was only reasonable, in view of the great risk and the large capital outlay involved in fulfilling our demands, just as reasonable, in fact, as the workers' right to good wages. I opposed all extravagance and selfishness in the soldiers' interests. It was the duty of the government to ensure by all necessary measures that our economic position was not made any worse by the enormous demands of the Hindenburg program. Taxation could only serve as a partial remedy. Profiteering was the deadliest sin, and our inability to eradicate it was a matter of the greatest regret to me from the point of view of moral at home and in the field. I made repeated efforts to put a stop to it. The war profiteer is a repulsive phenomenon, and he and the corruption of his influence have done us incalculable harm. At the suggestion of general headquarters changes had meanwhile been made in the Ministry of War. A war bureau was established as the central office for the control of the whole of our war industry. In this the recruiting and labor departments dealt with all questions of manpower, the raw material department with raw materials, and the above-mentioned munitions production office with all questions of manufacture. The hopes I placed in the war bureau for obtaining all the available manpower were not fulfilled. Even this office seemed to look at all such questions in the light of domestic politics, instead of putting war necessities first. I had also hoped that it would succeed in bringing employers and workmen into closer relationship. The desire for mutual cooperation existed in many quarters. The problem of manufacture would have been much simpler if the War Bureau had been given control from the start of our whole war industry, including engineering material, motor transport and aircraft. That was not done, and as a result the problem was never really tackled. Efforts were also made in the occupied territories and in Poland and Belgium to promote war industries. This was only possible, to a limited extent, owing to the fluctuations in the military situation, on which we had to reckon, and the shortage of labor. There were difficulties of other kinds at times. For example, the Belgian workmen in the huge small arms industries of the Liege district were only willing to work if they received an assurance that the weapons they manufactured should not be used by German troops on the Western Front. This assurance could not be given. We were thus compelled to remove from many places the machinery which was required by our war industries and transport it to Germany, where good use could be made of it for war purposes. 3. The production and distribution of raw materials in Germany was entrusted to the safe hands of Colonel Coeth, who in his fear revealed a spirit worthy of this war. He played a large part in the work of getting raw material from the occupied territories. The supply of raw material from neutral and allied countries was assigned to a special department of the Prussian Ministry of War, with which Colonel Coeth cooperated closely. Coal and rolling stock were outside the scope of his department. Colonel Coeth gave the army all that it urgently needed, and in view of our position and our dependence on foreign countries, no more could have been done. The supply of raw material was secure for a long time to come. The public, however, suffered severely. Clothing and footwear were very short. Prices ruled terribly high, gravely increasing the cost of living and all the troubles it led to. This caused me anxiety. General headquarters could not but be dissatisfied with such a state of affairs in the interests of the efficient conduct of the war, and made many appeals on the point to the government, unfortunately without success. Our dependence on foreign countries now came home to roost, and I attached great importance to the production of substitutes. I instructed Lieutenant Colonel Schmidt Redder to go into this question. He got into touch with the various government departments and our industries. He is mainly responsible for such success as was achieved. I hope that his work will bring benefit to his country. It may prove an incalculable blessing for the German people, if they learn how to produce at home what they have hitherto imported from abroad. To produce the various kinds of raw material a large number of war companies were established. 
I was not in a position to judge whether and to what extent these were necessary, but it is quite clear that their operations gave rise to an extraordinary amount of friction. The maintenance of the economic life of the country depended primarily on the question of transport. That, in turn, depended on locomotives, wagons and personnel, and was closely bound up with the coal supply. The minister, von Breitenbock, gave up a great deal in every direction to satisfy the requirements of the army. The greatest strain was put both on staffs and material, and the locomotives in particular were worn out. As a first step, matters were improved somewhat by surrendering engineering shops for the work of locomotive and wagon construction. General headquarters helped the Minister of Public Works in other ways, even, although with great reluctance, releasing men on such a scale as to weaken the army. This was unavoidable, however, for it was essential to give some relief to the railway workers. In many directions we had prepared for a short war, and in this and other matters now had to make arrangements to meet a long one. Military demands on the railways at home still remained very extensive. We had taken all the Belgian railway material, and also the engines and rolling stock we found in North France, but these were not nearly enough. The material taken in Russia could not be used, owing to the difference of gauge. Our allies also made heavy demands on our engines and rolling stock. On the Austro-Hungarian railways there were hundreds of German locomotives and about 10,000 German wagons. Bulgaria and Turkey, too, received both personnel and material from us. We had just captured material in Romania, but on the other hand the enemy had taken several thousand German wagons to Moldavia and kept them there. The occupied districts, with their immense mileage, required an army of railway men, and material on a scale to match. General headquarters, through the director of railways, made a number of suggestions to the minister with a view to limiting the strain on the railways at home by cutting down the services, for example. Similar steps were taken in the occupied districts. These measures, which were not and could not be carried out in their entirety then, in view of our economic situation, had to be put into force under compulsion of the oppressive armistice conditions and the revolution. It may be realized how strained the transport situation was at this time when I state that powder and explosives factories, on which everything depended, were at a standstill for days on end. There was plenty of coal, but the railways could not bring it to them. Things became so bad that I had to have daily reports on the supplies to the powder factories. The director of railways, Colonel von Aldershausen, and his chief of staff, Major von Stockhausen, were personalities and applied themselves to their immense task with the greatest intelligence. They remained throughout in the closest touch with the military railway authorities in the Allied countries, and with the transport ministers of the German states. The existence of the various German railway administrations made the problem much more difficult. We were paying the price of failing to secure greater uniformity before the war, and to insist on all the states keeping to the same standards. Bavaria, for example, had considerably fewer heavy locomotives per kilometre than Prussia. A Bavarian engine required quite different spare parts to a Prussian one. A great deal could have been done to improve matters without any alteration of the imperial constitution. Transport difficulties were also increased by the fact that there was no unity of control or management of canal and river navigation. Hitherto this had not been developed, though it was urgently necessary. This omission must be made good. A special inland water transport department was established, and at my request the Admiralty assisted us by recruiting the necessary men. The transport situation, which had been very bad in the winter of 1916-17, improved later. The railways were severely taxed in the winter of 1917-18 but not so badly as in the spring. The Minister of Labour on his side did all he could to improve matters. Coal and iron are the bases of all war industry. We had both in our country. We were able to improve our position considerably, even in our dealings with the neutrals, by our possession of the Longwy and Brie basins, the Belgian coal fields, and parts of the coal areas of northern France and Poland, which latter we managed jointly with Austria-Hungary. We began to mine coal in northeast Serbia, and tried to get Turkey to make a better use of her deposits. We gave our allies coal, and in return received nothing but Bohemian lignite from Austria-Hungary for Saxony and Bavaria. In return for coal and iron neutral countries gave us, among other things, foodstuffs, gold to improve our exchange, and horses. What a power coal and iron proved themselves to be. The shortage of coal at home became considerably more acute in the winter of 1916-17, it had a serious effect on moral, and called for strong measures. 
the coal supply in Germany was not properly controlled, and output had fallen very much. As I have already explained, I proposed to the Chancellor in February, 1917, the appointment of a special coal controller. Geheim Bergrat Stutz was the first to succeed in getting the coal tangle straight, or, at any rate, in overcoming the more formidable obstacles and achieving a fair compromise between the demands for coal for domestic fuel, for light and power, for agriculture and industry, for the railways and the navy. I found it very difficult in May and June, 1917, when we were under the influence of the Great Untanked Offensive in the West and the extraordinary high rate of wastage it involved, to weaken the army further by releasing 50,000 workmen at his request. This should be remembered when the history of that period is read. General headquarters complied in order that we should lay a firm foundation at home for our war on foreign soil. I must emphasize once more the fact that such a weakening of the army laid on general headquarters a greater duty than ever to the men in the fighting line, to press insistently for the increase of labor output and the better employment of manpower in Germany. The army never recovered the men thus released, and labor output even fell off considerably. That was, of course, a heavy blow to us. Iron was not so plentiful as coal. It was difficult to turn out sufficient quantities of steel, especially of hard steel. We obtained large quantities of iron ore from Sweden, and the ores at Poti in Transcaucasia were also of vital importance to us. Scrap, too, was needed for steel production. WC removed it from the occupied districts in large quantities. Many a factory building bad to be sacrificed to our war industry, under the pressure of the blockade and the necessities of the war, in order to furnish old iron for the steel of our guns and shells. The output of steel gradually became adequate. Then the steel had to be distributed to the various works, i.e., four guns, ammunition, barbed wire, and, in particular, the quota for the improvement of the railways had to be set apart. Besides coal, iron and steel, the material required for the production of submarines, motor transport and aircraft, and lubricants, presented us with some of our gravest problems. For lubricants we had to rely on Austria-Hungary and Romania. As the former country could not supply enough oil, and every effort adequately to increase her output failed, the Romanian oil was of decisive importance. But even when we had this source the question of rolling stock remained very serious, and made both the carrying on of the war and life at home very difficult. In 1918 the supplies in the Caucasus promised better times. In our economic condition at that time, our home production of benzol could not be substantially increased. Besides, benzol was not suitable for submarines and aircraft. When, towards the end of the war, we did decide to supply benzol for our aircraft, this was done solely on account of the shortage of petrol, and in the knowledge that we were thereby reducing the fighting capacity of our airmen, and increasing the dangers to which they were exposed. Stocks, like the rate of wastage in the army, required constant watching. The use of cars had to be limited more than ever, and even that of motor lorries in quiet periods, in order to be able to make full use of them at critical moments. I could not put the army's demands any higher. The shortage of oil at home was serious. The country districts did not obtain sufficient for the winter. The peasants had to pass the long winter evenings in the dark, which was very bad for their moral. It is characteristic of Germany that little was ever said about this great inconvenience. For a time some of our transport difficulties were due to the bad lubricants used on the locomotives. They froze very easily. Private cars were practically not used at all in Germany. The whole rolling stock situation was one of the greatest anxiety, and called for incessant attention. It was not until the autumn of 191s that I achieved my desire that the supplies for the army and the navy should be under a single control. The supply of transport material for the army and the home country was already under a single authority, the director of mechanical transportation. General headquarters constantly urged the importance of developing all processes for the production of substitutes, but many inevitable natural difficulties stood in the way. The raw materials for trench warfare, timber and rubble, were drawn on an increasing scale from the occupied territories, but Germany, too, bad to send large quantities. As far as raw material was concerned I could not deal with more than broad, general questions. But even thesis demanded a thorough study, and I had to keep myself constantly a U current if I was to decide rightly in many difficult problems. In such a war it was inevitable that the occupied territories would have to supply raw materials. Our strong organization gradually achieved a great deal in this direction. 
General Headquarters asked the Governors General in Poland and Belgium to work for the same end. In all essentials, the same methods were followed, universally. It is obvious that this involved hardship for the local population, but equally obvious that these measures had to be taken. Every intelligent person will admit that in many cases we might have acted in some more practical fashion. The task before the authorities, collectively and individually, was, however, at once novel and peculiarly difficult to carry out owing to the changing requirements of the long war. In spite of our extreme need, we acted with a consideration that was carried almost too far when compared with the extreme measures taken at home. Germany had to surrender her church bells, but, at the suggestion of Chancellor von Hertling to His Majesty, Belgium was allowed to retain hers. The occupied territories were of decisive help to us, both at the front and at home. The exploitation of their resources absorbed large numbers of men, just as our war industries at home did, but we had to make this sacrifice to live. Our allies were induced by the Ministry of War to take their part in supplying Germany with raw materials, mainly for the manufacture of, or else in payment for, the munitions supplied TC them by us. The Ministry also managed the copper mines at Bor in northeastern Serbia, which were extraordinarily useful. General headquarters were only called in to help when Turkey or Bulgaria, true to old Balkan traditions, were behindhand in delivery of materials, and required some stimulus to make them fulfill their undertakings. In the problem of supplying raw material for the army German scientists put their immense knowledge at our service. Thanks be to German science. In all questions relating to the increase of our home resources I received magnificent support from Colonel Bauer and Major von Harbu. Their work was typical. 4. For the nation and the army, man and beast, the question of food supplies was of equal importance. The work of the army in the field depended to a high degree on their rations. That, next to leave, has the most decisive effect on the moral of the troops. I thus had to give the food question my serious attention. The waning moral at home was intimately connected with the food situation. In the daily food the human body did not receive the necessary nourishment, especially albumin and fats, for the maintenance of physical and mental vigor. In wide quarters a certain decay of bodily and mental powers of resistance was noticeable, resulting in an unmanly and hysterical state of mind which under the spell of enemy propaganda encouraged the pacifist leanings of many Germans. In the summer of 1917 my first glimpse of this situation gave me a great shock. This state of mind was a tremendous element of weakness. It was all a question of human nature. It could be eliminated to some extent by strong patriotic feeling, but in the long run could only be finally overcome by better nourishment. More food was needed. We had to find new sources of supply, conserve our own stocks, and, above all, increase our own production. The last was the most important. The recent occupation of Wallachia was of decisive importance. Other measures were needed, however. The necessity of using straw and wood for fodder, and perhaps even for human food, was constantly insisted on by general headquarters, as was the employment of leaf hay for fodder. Just as we had to get every ounce of strength out of the people to carry on the war, so, with the help of our scientists, we had to make nature yield up everything that could be used for, and turned into, food for man and beast. The necessity for preserving foodstuffs from decaying and going to waste led, among other things, to potato drying, in which I took a great interest. To increase agricultural production supplies of artificial manures in sufficient quantities and at reasonable prices were essential. General headquarters took every step to secure these supplies, which were all the more important, as natural manure became more scarce owing to the diminution of our cattle stocks and the shortage of straw, not to mention the progress of intensive cultivation. We obtained the necessary phosphates from the occupied territories of northern France and Belgium, and were constantly impressing on the Chancellor and the Treasury the necessity of extending the establishments at Merseburg for getting nitrogen from the air. The question of prices was a matter for the home authorities. It suffered from political considerations. In view of the prevalent socialist agitation against the land and the agrarians, who were raising the price of bread against the poor, and taking into consideration the already serious living conditions, the government lacked the courage to fix maximum prices which would be suitable in the long run. Agriculture, suffering from very high cost of production, and faced with the necessity of having stocks for after the war, was often quite incapable of working profitably on the basis of the prices fixed. Supplies were short for the population, and the low prices meant that they were not all brought to market. 
the non-expert bodies, whose duty it was to see that all stocks were delivered, were not in a position to perform it. Their actions led to a good deal of irritation and discontent. The individual did not even receive his official ration, which itself was fixed too low to maintain his full strength. As a result, both town and country set about to help themselves as far as they could. Illicit trading and hoarding increased. Before long there was no end to the process. Producers kept all they needed themselves, and more, and even if this was a trifle compared to the total stocks available, their conduct was bound to cause discontent. The masses, especially the middle classes, including officials and officers with fixed salaries, suffered real hardship. A few, no doubt, gave way to temptation in the difficult times and helped themselves, but the majority were literally starved. This was an additional burden to the already overburdened middle classes, yet, kicked by everyone and suffering in silence, they did duty to the very end. The workmen got better treatment. They adjusted their demands for increased wages, which they supported with strikes, to the illicit trading prices. True, a large part of the working class also suffered hardship, but, in contrast to the middle classes, they generally had enough to live on. The question of illicit trading became of the greatest importance in domestic politics. It increased with the length of the war. As people at home lost interest in the war, their natural instincts, which now had nothing to curb them, were given free rein. Illicit trading and hoarding took more and more disgusting forms, and these and the declining moral interacted on one another with increasingly disastrous results. Our system of compulsory production combined with maximum prices had failed. Production did not increase, and yield was falling off, hampered as it was by other influences such as shortage of labor, lack of manure and bad weather. The many suggestions which General Headquarters made to the Chancellor for combating illicit trading, extravagant middlemen's profits and high wages, which had to be put an end to if we were to maintain our capacity to fight, met with no response. The whole thing was a farce. The fear lest the maximum prices for agricultural produce should be fixed too high actually contributed greatly towards increasing the cost of living and widening the gulf between town and country. The discontented elements knew how to make capital out of all these things. Our enemy starvation blockade triumphed and caused us both physical and spiritual distress. My personal view of the system of compulsory production at home was that the sooner it was abolished, and in the case of certain articles of food it should be abolished at once, and free trading again permitted, the better it would be for everyone. On the other hand, I thought that a wide development of cooperative societies and unions of producers, as auxiliaries of the government, was urgently required. Unfortunately there were not yet enough of these anywhere. Above all it was important that the prices for individual products should be raised, and fixed early enough to enable, farmers to make their arrangements accordingly. The intendant general, who shared my views, put them energetically before the war food office. It would seem that England, with her system of minimum prices, chose the better part, for her production certainly increased enormously. The farmers worked well. The great landed estates, in particular, achieved wonders. The country has again been able to see that, just as the army is the basis of order, so our agriculture is the foundation of our economic, indeed, even of our political, life. If we had only borne this in mind before the war things would have been much easier for us. Today it is the first duty of the state to make good what was then neglected, and that of our agriculture to promote intensive cultivation. I had many intimate discussions with both presidents of our war food office, von Batocki and von Waldau. Different as they were, they both displayed stern devotion to duty and deep love of the fatherland. The army often helped the homeland. In view of the heavy burden laid on the troops, they were no better off than the men at home. I acted throughout on the deep conviction that the army and the people were in all respects one. General headquarters, indented, always worked for that end. In Berlin people seemed at times to have the idea that the army and the people were two different bodies, with different stomachs. This view was ch melancholy proof how little the war was understood at home. It was with a heavy heart that general headquarters had often temporarily to reduce the rations of meat, bread, potatoes and fats, and also of oats and hay. This way done to help the people at home and keep up the war spirit. The war food office, however, thoroughly understood the army's needs, and especially the fact that the men in the front line were deserving of the greatest consideration. The men usually did not have enough, even when they received the full ration. Besides, the food was too monotonous. 
I heard many complaints from the army commanders on this point, but I could not help in individual cases. At home, the depot troops did not get enough to eat, and this gave rise to a lot of trouble. Luxuries became rarer and rarer. Horses suffered particularly heavily, their rations being wholly insufficient. Their hard fodder ration was too small, and great difficulties were experienced with the supplies of coarse fodder. The commissariat department had, at the beginning of the war, to combat many difficulties due to their peace organization, and had insufficient personnel. At a later stage they were fully equal to their responsible work. Their devoted and self-sacrificing work was of great service both to the command and to the men. The department concerned at general headquarters always cooperated well with the director of the administration department of the Ministry of War, General von Oven, who fought with me at Liege, and with the War Food Office. There was mutual give and take. The sins of omission of the pre-war period, however, our failure to prepare our agriculture for war and consequent lack of any great reserve when it began, could not be made good. We helped the home country in their supply problems with motor lorries, by requisitioning vans, and by undertaking distribution from the stations of the large towns. We had to put up with the difficulties in which these measures involved the army. Harvest leave was given far more freely than normally. The potato supply at home was helped by releasing rolling stock. The occupied territories helped us with food supplies. The lines of communication inspectorates drew on them, in particular, for meat and saw to it that their agriculture was carried on on the best lines. Wherever troops were stationed for any length of time, they themselves worked hard both in cultivation and harvesting, but frequent changes prevented us from deriving much benefit from this. In the year 1917 only Romania enabled Germany, Austria-Hungary and Constantinople to keep their heads above water. The measures taken by the Entente relieved us of anxiety as to the feeding of Belgium. WC obtained substantial supplies from neutral countries, especially Denmark, Holland and Switzerland, in our purchases we acted through a special German organization, and did not deal, like the Entente, with the inhabitants of the different countries, allowing them to make a profit. Rightly or wrongly, this aroused considerable indignation and resentment among our allies and the neutrals, and ultimately also at home. The food situation in Austria-Hungary was always exceedingly strained. Hungary had enough. She did, it is true, undertake the supply of a very considerable part of the Austro-Hungarian army, but she gave no assistance to starving Austria. In the latter country, the Czech cultivators refused to supply the poorer districts inhabited by Germans. The clumsy Austrian system of administration created additional difficulties, so that, in spite of orders of draconian severity, there was never any real hope of procuring the necessary supplies or of distributing them fairly. I shall never forget the way in which a high Austrian official begged me to help him against Hungary in this question of supplies. The army largely starved, as did German Austria, and especially Vienna. Although agriculture was very primitive, the situation in Bulgaria was better, but the system of government was rotten. Arrangements on the lines of communication were bad, and the supply system was managed on antiquated lines. The army often ran short of food. There was ground for hope, however, that Bulgaria would be self-supporting in the long run. The Turkish supply system was rotten through and through. Her agriculture was the most primitive imaginable, even iron plows being unknown. Our Minister of Agriculture, Baron von Schorlemer, had made efforts to improve Turkish agriculture, but the Turkish government displayed not the least understanding or perception in the matter. They asked for motor plows to bring more land under cultivation, but never dreamt of really tackling the whole problem and taking definite steps to increase production. Turkey, especially Constantinople, was thus in urgent need of help. In the autumn of 1916 the idea was mooted of establishing a central supply office for the Quadruple Alliance, under German control. It was a specious suggestion, but the food situation in the four countries depended on circumstances that were fundamentally different. Equality could never have been established. In the end, they would all have lived on Germany. The idea was abandoned, quite rightly. 5. The great importance of Romania, or more correctly of Wallachia, has already been noticed in various connections. We had now the task of exploiting this country for what we needed, and of transporting it to the consumers. Romania and the Dobruja were put under one administration. Having regard to the predominant part which we Germans had taken in the conquest of the country, I endeavoured to have this administration put in German hands. 
In view of the peculiarities of our allies and their business methods, this certainly offered the best guarantee of due consideration being paid to our economic claims and interests, and our allies agreed to the course proposed. A definite settlement of the Bulgarians in the whole of the Dobruja was not in our interests. That portion which was originally Bulgarian, having only been ceded to Romania after the Second Balkan War, was immediately administered by them, in accordance with the Treaty of the Autumn of 1915. That question was thus settled for the time being. As things were then, handing over the rest of the Dobruja, including the line from Kornavoda to Constanza, would have been equivalent to giving Bulgaria the third and last trade route from Central Europe to Turkey, though she already controlled the routes via Salonika and Sofia. This monopoly would be bound to have a bad effect on our trade with Turkey. The selfish attitude of Austria-Hungary was already quite enough for Turkey to bear. In the Dobruja the interests of Germany were identical with those of Turkey and Austria. Nevertheless, in nil Bulgarian questions, Vienna adopted a very ambiguous attitude towards us. It was thus uncertain what line would be taken at the Austrian headquarters my views to a certain extent ran counter to Bulgaria's interests. All the same, I had the satisfaction of seeing all the Allies agree to the establishment of a German lines of communication administration in the Dobruja, this was placed under the headquarters staff of General von Mekonsen's army group, and comprised the region from the southern frontier of the former Romanian Dobruja to a line some 20 kilometers north of the Cernovoda Constanza line. The rest of the Dobruja comprised the operations zone of the 3rd Bulgarian army and was thus under Bulgarian administration. The Bulgarians soon gave considerable trouble to the German authorities in the Dobruja and their head General Kurt von Unger. The matter was even brought to the notice of General Headquarters I stood firm against the Bulgarian demand to administer the lines of communication area, and was firmly supported by the attitude of the German officials who fought with spirit against the selfish behaviour of our allies. The administration of the district was bound to suffer from this friction, but General von Unger and his German lines of communication commandants took care that the rich oil supplies at Constanza and other raw materials were exported from the lines of communication area, and were thus put to the use that really benefited the interests of ourselves and our allies. The land was cultivated as well as was possible in the difficult circumstances. If the Bulgarian army did not receive the supplies from the Dobruja that it could have yielded, the fault lay solely with the attitude adopted by them and their government. The population in the lines of communication area enjoyed our protection almost to the end of the war. The question of the permanent restoration of the southern portion to Bulgaria was dropped, owing to the peace of Bucharest. We had reserved the right to buy raw material in the operations zone of the 3rd Bulgarian army. The Bulgarians felt themselves aggrieved by this, and put many difficulties in our way. The administration set up in Wallachia contained a strong Austro-Hungarian element. This arrangement was of course far from satisfactory. We had, however, to put up with this on the simple ground that Germany had not the men to do everything herself. In many cases the Austro-Hungarian officials made our life a burden, they feared an increase of German influence in Romania, and sought to obtain for themselves advantages of every description. Bulgaria, too, made the administration more difficult, acting at first in a most arbitrary and despotic manner. Turkey was loyal. The administration was called military. It was under Field Marshal von Mackensen, and thus also under general headquarters, and not directly responsible to His Majesty, as were the governors general. The foreign office was kept out of it. The military governor was General Tulf von Cheap and Wadenbach, who had for some time at the beginning of 1915 administered the occupied parts of Poland, so far as they were not in the operation zone. His chief of staff was at first General von Bergmann, and later Colonel Hentz, who had been Mackensen's deputy chief of staff during the Romanian campaign and had a fine grasp of administrative and economic problems. Under the military governors were German and Austrian lines of communication commandants. The military government did not include the whole of Wallachia, a narrow strip remaining part of the lines of communication and operations zone of the 9th and the Danube armies. The whole area was, however, administered on the same principles. The Romanian officials and judges had for the most part remained at their posts, and those that had fled could be replaced by other Romanians. The administrative problems were thus simpler than those that had previously confronted the commander-in-chief in the east, being mainly economic. These were, of course, of the utmost importance. The appointments to the military governor's staff and the selection of lines of communication commandants were made with MI to this situation. 
There were highly satisfactory supplies of agricultural produce of all sorts, especially wheat and maize, and also of peas, beans, plums, eggs and wine. The autumn sowing was undertaken at Onka everything was done to encourage production. The sowing of winter wheat was most important, as we had to rely on the Romanian harvest for the critical period before the Hungarian harvest in July and our own in August. Vegetables also were of importance to us, and vegetable growing was made as profitable as possible. The stocks of cattle had been greatly reduced by the war, and those that remained were now used for draft purposes. The export of meat was thus confined within very moderate limits. In getting agricultural produce from Romania, the military administration worked with the officials of the Central Purchasing Company which had been active in Romania before that country entered the war. Its independent attitude did not, however, meet with approval. The stocks of oil we found in Romania were not large. The boring plant had been absolutely destroyed, and the wells very cleverly blocked up. The English Colonel Thompson had admirably fulfilled his duty of making it difficult for us to use the oil fields. His work was not, it is true, of decisive value to the Entente, but it did materially reduce the oil supplies of our army and the home country. We must attribute our shortage in part to him. The military administration brought in men acquainted with the Romanian oil industry and applied itself energetically to its second most important task, of restoring the oil production by clearing blocked wells, making new borings, and re-establishing the refineries and getting them going again. The output increased, though very slowly. To many people in Vienna, influenced by their privations and not well disposed towards us, it seemed that we were not getting on quickly enough with the gathering of the harvest and the resumption of oil working, and in February 1917, complaints came from Vienna and were repeated to me from Berlin. I had my doubts for a time whether the work was really being well done. However, I was able to judge of the difficulties to be overcome in Romania from my own experiences in Kovno, and I did not let myself be misled. By April the complaints had ceased, and the administration was generally approved. The distribution of the supplies from the Dobruja and Wallachia was carried out in accordance with special agreements among the Allies. There was no great difficulty in settling on a basis for the distribution of the oil, but the sharing of the agricultural products of Wallachia was one of the most thankless tasks of the quartermaster general, General Harndorf, whose frank, thoughtful ways and wide understanding of war economics made him particularly suited for the task. Bulgaria had no interest in the distribution of the Romanian supplies, as she was receiving the Dobruja harvest. Turkey received only a small quantity, having been allotted advances from the large stocks lying in the Dobruja. It was thus a question of an understanding between Germany and Austria-Hungary, or, more correctly, Austria alone. The Austrian negotiators made huge demands, we took a leaf, from their book and made equally large claims. After a furious discussion, the happy medium proved once more the best way to agreement, an ultimate satisfaction on both sides. Of course, representatives of our war food office were brought into the negotiations, and the general lines of our case were settled in advance in discussion with them. Only in unusually critical cases was general headquarters called on to decide. For the transport of oil, corn, etc., it proved possible, generally speaking, to reopen the routes which had been used for export from Wallachia before Romania entered the war. For this purpose the Romanian railways were restored, which took a certain time. The Danube navigation was reopened at once. Austria-Hungary regarded the Danube as her exclusive province, but Colonel von Aldershausen kept our interests to the fore. The German Danube shipping company, the Bavarian Lloyd, found further scope for its activities. Our transport arrangements always fulfilled the demands made on them. The anticipated increase in oil exports was prepared for in advance by increasing the construction of tank wagons and tank ships. We started to lay a pipeline from Ploesti to Juju, it had not been completed when peace came. Just as previously in the district administered by the commander-in-chief in the east, so here in Romania the officials of the military administration and all others concerned in the government of Wallachia were fully conscious, not only of the vital importance of their work for the prosecution of the war, but also, as we all hoped, of its value to the country when peace came. 6. The German people, both at home and at the front, have suffered and endured inconceivable hardships in the four long years of war. The war has undermined and disintegrated patriotic feeling and the whole national moral. The strangling hunger blockade and the enemy propaganda, which went hand in hand in the fight against the German race and the German spirit, were a heavy burden a burden that grew ever heavier as the war lasted. 
the blockade worked successfully. Propaganda had found fruitful soil at home. It now turned its attention directly to the man at the front, who by this time was ready to give it a hearing. Blockade and propaganda began gradually to undermine our moral resolution and shake the belief in ultimate victory. The very natural longing for peace began to assume forms that bordered on weakness, led to divisions among the people and lowered the moral of the army. Poisonous weeds grew on this soil. All German sentiment, all patriotism, died in many breasts. Self came first. War profiteers of every kind, not excluding the political variety, who took advantage of the country's danger and the government's weakness to snatch political and personal advantages, became more and more numerous. Our moral resolution suffered untold harm. We lost confidence in ourselves. The idea of revolution, preached by enemy propaganda and Bolshevism, found the Germans in a receptive frame of mind, and gained ground in the army and navy through the independent socialists. Pernicious doctrines spread among the masses. The German people, at home and the front, had received its death blow. When I was appointed first quartermaster general, Germany was just at the beginning of this development. Its nature and its future course could not be grasped. One thing, however, was absolutely certain, that we could not watch it idly and do nothing. Something had now been done to lighten the burden of the blockade, we had broken through it in Romania. Nobody knew whether we would ever have another chance, or how we should use it. We were hypnotized by the enemy propaganda as a rabbit is by a snake. It was exceptionally clever and conceived on a great scale. It worked by strong mass suggestion, kept in the closest touch with the military situation, and was unscrupulous as to the means it used. The German people, who had not yet learnt the art or the value of silence, had, with their mistaken frankness, shown the enemy propaganda in their speech, writings and actions, the best line of attack. The German people had themselves coined the phrase, Prussian militarism, although this very, Prussian militarism, the spirit of unselfish loyalty, of the surrender of the individual to the conception of the state, had created Prussia and guaranteed Germany's brilliant development. People mistook externals for the substance of militarism and failed to realize the national strength that issued from it. It should not have been resisted, but encouraged. Even high officials of the government used the word reproachfully to me during the war, so that one can hardly blame the many who thought they were acting wisely in turning against militarism, even though they could not say exactly what it meant. True, many of them knew perfectly well what they were after in this struggle. Authority was at stake. The Entente knew all about the strength of Prussian militarism. They knew why they fought against it. They knew, too, what they were doing when they stirred up an agitation in Germany against the Corps of Officers, in the last resort the pillars of authority. They were on sure ground when they worked against Prussia in South Germany, attacked the Emperor, the symbol of our imperial unity, railed against the Crown Prince, and promised our people the riches of heaven as s ton as they had got rid of the Imperial House and the other dynasties. Later on the enemy propaganda began to take interest in me, too. The army and the people were to he tilled with doubts about the general staff, the belief in ultimate victory was to be shattered, and faith in the man who strove to oppose a strong resistance to the Entente's ambitions was to be destroyed. By working on our democratic sentiments the enemy propaganda succeeded in bringing our form of government, as being autocratic, into discredit in Germany Amy throughout the world, although our emperor had not the same power as the president of the United States, and although the franchise for the Reichsting, the supreme representative body in the empire, rested on a more democratic basis than that of many other countries. The enemy propaganda aimed ever more directly at breaking up the unity of the German Empire and at separating Germany from her ruling house and her dynasties and governments from their people, this was revolution pure and simple. The propagandists were clever in realizing the effects that such phrases as peace of understanding, disarmament after the war, League of Nations, and so on would have on the German people in view of their unpolitical and unmilitary mentality and the great privations they were suffering. They were only too ready to follow, in conscious or unconscious self-delusion, these alluring but deceptive visions. In this connection, the propagandist story that the peace of the world had been disturbed by German plans of world dominion, fell on only too fruitful soil. In plain fact, the German government in the post-Bismarck period had had no great foreign political aim whatever beyond the maintenance of peace, save, perhaps, that it aimed at increasing the colonial possessions of the country. It scarcely thought of world politics. It went to Baghdad without clearly knowing why. 
living as we have done since 1870-71 a life of constant preference for the apparent over the real, of judging by externals, we have overestimated our own strength, and underestimated the forces that were working against us. We spread all over the world, without having a firm footing in Europe. After gaining Alsace-Lorraine and establishing the empire, the German people were satisfied. To increase our colonial possessions, and advance our position in the world by extending our markets, had become a necessity for us. This could only be done by force. Our people, on the other hand, aimed at an equal place in peaceful competition. Preoccupied with business and political speculation, they did not know that other peoples would find it difficult to distinguish this peaceful aim from the desire for world mastery. The maintenance of peace was a great object. Just as we could only win a war of defense by attacking, so we could only keep peace by pursuing a clear, strong policy, on well-defined principles. German foreign policy did not have that character. It showed itself to be capricious and inconsiderate. The peoples who were ill-disposed to us took advantage of this to combine against us, even those who had hitherto been opposed to one another combined against us. In other ways we showed ourselves uncertain and irresolute. That, too, brought us no friends. Many Germans were very anxious, and voiced their fears unmistakably in all directions. Unlike their government, they had far-seeing ideas. These utterances were, however, merely those of private persons, and meant no more to us than they would in any other country. The war made no change in this situation. The war aims of the governments and peoples of the Entente were always far more ambitious than the dreams of individual Germans. We know this now to our cost. Plans for world dominion demand a strong national feeling. This, in spite of the foundation of the empire in 1871, we have never achieved. Our government did nothing to cultivate it in the post-Bismarck period. On the contrary, we lost it in proportion as woe lost our strength of will. In our political thought we have remained too federal and too divided in questions of domestic politics. We came into the world too soon, without any national sentiment, and in our sense of world citizenship, born of foreign influences, we have never found the true level between thinking nationally and thinking internationally, between our domestic and our world interests. No dreams of world mastery, no nationalism of the German government, endangered peace before 1914, or have prevented its conclusion during the war, whatever enemy propaganda might say. After all, propaganda did not set out to tell the truth, but merely to break down the determination and fighting spirit of the German people, and to spread views that would serve its own ends. At last came the catchword of the national right of self-determination. A problem apparently based on a most acceptable truism, but actually only to be solved by force where, as is so often the case, nationalities are mixed. The phrase fitted the case of Austria-Hungary better than it fitted us, but it also had its effect on Germany, and in the long run, interpreted by fear and hatred, it was destined to deal us our death blow through the construction put upon it by Germans. In the last stages of the war, and quite openly from the beginning of 1918 onwards, propaganda worked ever more clearly for the social revolution, side by side with the political revolution. The war was painted as being waged by the upper 10,000 at the expense of the workers, and the victory of Germany as the workers' misfortune. The enemy propaganda and Bolshevism, which aimed at a world revolution, were working for the same ends in Germany. England gave China opium, our enemies gave us the revolution, and we accepted the poison and distributed it as the Chinese distribute opium. While Entente propaganda was doing ever more harm to the German people and the army and navy, it succeeded in maintaining the determination to fight in its own countries and armies, and in working against us in neutral countries. Responsibility for the war, the Belgian atrocities, the ill treatment of prisoners, our political immorality and treachery, our mendacity and brutality, despotism in Prussia, the enslavement of the German people, all these reproaches, cleverly invented for the benefit of the campaign of lies against us, had the greatest effect all over the world. Side by side with these were the catchwords of the fight for democracy against militarism, autocracy and the junker, of the war for civilization and for the freedom of the smaller nations, and other phrases of the sort, idealized and of infinite effect on men who do not see too clearly. The public opinion of the world was mesmerized by them. For the American soldiers the war became, as it were, a crusade against us. In the neutral countries we were subjected to a sort of moral blockade. The way to the soul of the neutrals was barred to us. We did not know how to open it. 
we alone did wrong, everything that the Entente did was morally right and the obvious course to follow. Germany was the world oppressor, and the policy of the Entente, and that alone, was pursuing true moral aims, at once freeing the world and making it happier. In neutral countries, which now must know the truth, we lost all credit, while that of the enemy rose immeasurably. We had our friends, it is true, but they had no influence. Similar work was done in the countries allied to us. The object was to separate elevens from our allies. Propaganda was an old and powerful weapon in England's hands. The East India Company had striking success with it in the conquest ID India. It had started a tradition in England. England was the only country that long ago had employed this weapon of politics and war with a clear vision and on a really large scale, in the service of its national world encircling policy. To threaten foreign countries with the aid of revolution has for many years been the policy of England, said Bismarck 60 years ago. He was thinking of the speech of Canning on the 12th of December 1826, in which that Prime Minister threatened in a public sitting of, the House of Commons that England controlled the, winds of Aeolus, and could at any time unchain the powers of revolution. If we, he said, take part in a war, we shall see gathered under our standards all the restless and dissatisfied, whether with or without a cause, of any country with which we are in conflict. Footnote, in the official report, however, the passage reads as follows, but I much fear that this country, however earnestly she may endeavour to avoid it, could not, in such case, avoid seeing ranked under her banners all the restless and dissatisfied of any nation with which she might come into conflict. Even before the war dose observers had dearly recognised the propagandist activities of our present enemies. They were then already working systematically against us. It was mainly their propaganda that England and France had to thank for the success of their policy of undermining our position in the world. The disarmament proposals of the Tsar were their handiwork, and well adapted to the utilis ruminating credulity of many circles in Germany. The wide distribution of Bemhardi's book in the English world was also part of the same work. It would have been better if it had never been written. We were to be cut off from the world by Reuter. Our political leaders apparently failed to observe the influence of the present untarned countries on the press of the world, although their attention was drawn to it often enough. They also did not see the influence of the little centres of French culture on public opinion in the capitals of neutral countries. Even the Masonic lodges of the world, as had long been planned by England, worked with the whole mysterious strength of this most powerful of all secret societies in the service of Anglo-Saxon, and thus, to us, of international politics. Only the national lodges in Prussia remained free from this influence. All over the enemy country's strong propaganda organizations had been established under the guidance of experienced statesmen and politicians. Under a single leadership they worked everywhere and with united strength, on clear and simple lines, and with ample funds. They had branches in neutral countries, where they achieved their aims with that utter lack of conscience which is so characteristic of the untarmed. Special organizations dealt with the encouragement of national aspirations, particularly in Poland and among the Letts, and no doubt also among the peoples of the dual monarchy, especially the Czechs and Southern Slavs. While on the field of battle we held the initiative almost to the very end, the enemy carried on the psychological war campaign from the start with a united front, attacking along the whole line, and finding auxiliaries in the many deserters in the neutral states, and also, alas, support in Germany. In England the whole propaganda service was placed under Lord Beaverbrook, with three directors, of whom Lord Northcliffe attended to the enemy countries, Kipling to home and colonial propaganda, and Lord Cothermia to the work in neutral countries. While England preferred to work principally in economic and political propaganda, military and intellectual questions were the special province of France. This is typical of the reasoning of our enemies. America, which at first assisted only financially, undertaking 50% of the whole propaganda expenses of the Entente, later took an active part in the work. Italy, Belgium, and the other allies, generously aided by American money, were also active in propaganda. The express aim of the American and English propaganda became more and more the achievement of an internal revolution in Germany. Lloyd George knew what he was saying when, at the end of the war, he expressed to Lord Northcliffe the thanks of England for the work he had done, Lie had proved himself a master in mass suggestion. 
we found ourselves, bit by hit, attacked by enemy propaganda, in speech and writing, through the neutral countries, especially across our land frontiers, from Holland and Switzerland, through Austria-Hungary and even our own country, and, finally, from the air, with such cleverness and on such a large scale that many people could no longer distinguish between enemy propaganda and their own sentiments. Propaganda was all the more effective against us when we had to carry on the war, not with strong battalions, but with good ones. The value of numbers in war cannot be denied, and without soldiers there can be no fighting. But numbers alone are nothing without the spirit that animates them, this is true both at home and in the field. We have fought the world, and we could fight the world with a good conscience so long as our moral was high. While our will to conquer remained unshaken we had every prospect of victory and, what was just as important, need not bow to the enemy's lust for our destruction. When our moral failed, the whole position was changed. We no longer fought to the last drop of blood. Many Germans were no longer ready to die for their country. The collapse of our moral at home, with its effect on our fighting capacity, the campaign against the home front and the spirit of the army, were, undoubtedly, the chief means whereby the untanked hoped to conquer us, after they had given up hope of a military victory. I had no doubt about that. In the spring of 1918 a sagacious untanked politician spoke as follows. In London and Paris there is today a general and fundamental belief among the leading statesmen of the Entente that the German army on the Western Front can never be conquered by purely military means. But it is, nonetheless, clear that the Entente will win, owing to the internal conditions in Germany and the central powers, which will lead to the fall of the Imperial House. In the autumn of this year at latest revolution will break out in Germany. It is quite clear to us that there are influential circles in Germany for whom nothing could be worse than a military victory of Ludendorff. Tills bore out the words of Sprobel, a member of the Prussian Diet, an editor of Vomarts, in 1915. I confess quite openly that a complete victory of the empire would not be in the interests of social democracy. I am reluctant to write these lines and let them go out to the world. But truth is truth, and these words were spoken. 7. The Imperial Chancellor was responsible for the maintenance of our moral. General headquarters would gladly have undertaken the work of educating public opinion, but in accordance with their duty they invariably appealed to the Imperial Chancellor and asked his intervention. It lay with him to remove the, unfortunately, natural discontent of the people, and to proceed against the excesses and extravagances in our war industries. These and other sinister manifestations were bound to cause discontent, and so weaken the moral of all classes as to do irreparable harm to our fighting capacity, profiteering, pleasure-seeking, the thought of self, crowded out all noble aspirations, and privations made men callous. The men in the trenches could not help fearing that others would take their jobs and rob them of their livelihood. It is with deep emotion that one looks back and sees how the German sense of truth and honesty, spotless personal purity and devotion to the fatherland gave place to something else, something quite foreign to Germans, love of self, which became the highest law. The imperial chancellor should have shown the people whither they were steering, and put the enormous gravity of the situation plainly before them. The government should have kept the people constantly informed of the true state of affairs, which was that only from a beaten enemy could we obtain a tolerable peace, and that otherwise we must submit to a piece of force. Victory only could give us the one and preserve us from the other. Our political and mental immaturity, our want of judgment that prevented us from realizing the hollowness of catchwords and impossible promises, was, and is, our undoing. I had always hoped the German people would see through phrases, catchwords and political lies to an appreciation of the situation which corresponded to hard facts. I was mistaken. Phrases, catchwords and criminal misrepresentations had more and more influence as political feeling ran higher, and the gulf between the classes and between town and country widened. Party politics and their aims became more important than Germany herself. The great mass of the Bourgeoisie, torn all ways, sure that they always knew better than anyone else and entirely without discipline, went on their way. Afraid of responsibility and lacking character, they held aloof in haughty isolation, they also had no sense of responsibility to the fatherland. They never thought what immense harm that attitude meant to their country and themselves. The lack of self-restraint and conviction displayed on all sides and the agitations of the independent Social Democratic Party found no counterweight in the middle classes. It is a sad calamity that Gormans, usually such clear thinkers, should helplessly lose their heads in the hour of danger, and allow everything for which they had hitherto lived to be taken from them. 
the middle classes are thus also responsible for the disaster to our fatherland. The foundations on which the glorious edifice of our army rested became unsound. The source from which our defenders should draw fresh strength was defiled. Our war chancellors did nothing to repair the damage or enlighten the people. They dot had no creative ideas, and did nothing to hold the people together and lead them, unlike the great dictators, Clemenceau, Lloyd George and Wilson. The attempts of general headquarters to help the homeland by patriotic instruction and disseminating our propaganda, intended for foreign consumption, within our own borders were mere crumbs to the hungry. The soul of the German people was without direction or leadership, a prey to every pernicious impression that came its way. Ignorant of the world and hopelessly misled, they strove after unattainable phantoms. Is it, then, to be wondered at that they turned to those who, either from fatal stupidity or from damnable and criminal design, seemed to, offer them their heart's desire, and gave the cold shoulder to those who, realizing the danger of all this and inspired by deep concern for our future and ardent love for the country, demanded further and yet further sacrifices? It was a great calamity that these men were soon spoken of as never-enders, although they, too, were longing for peace. The press mirrored the dissensions caused by party politics among the Germans and the fluctuations of public feeling during the war. Only one section of the press remained true to itself. Another section, from idealism, from motives of party politics, or simply for business reasons, assumed as an established fact that improvement in the world which the advocates of a peace by understanding had invented, and abandoned the views they had held in 1914. Finally, there were newspapers who were ashamed of their attitude in the autumn of 1914, and of all their thoughts of a good peace. It even seemed painful to them to be reminded of such manly thoughts. Even during the war they slandered Germany to her sons, and did everything possible to destroy the belief in German might. They also contained direct challenges to civil authority and order, not to mention open defiance of our whole social system. My deep patriotic feelings were wounded as I watched this development. These were serious warnings for us to keep close watch on everything that threatened the successful prosecution of the war, a writing on the wall for the moral resolution of the German nation, and therefore the German army. This and much else was well known to our enemies, who joyfully drew their own conclusions. In August, 1914, the whole press, from inward conviction, had declared its support of our war of defence, and uttered line-determined words about the necessity of carrying it through to a successful issue. Unfortunately later on there was a change of tone in part of the press. It failed to realize that such a war of defense could not be ended by a peace of understanding, but only by victory, if we were not to be defeated and forced to accept intolerable conditions. As with the government and the nation, so with this section of the press, the thoughts of an understanding with the enemy grew stronger than the thoughts of victory, with all its heavy demands on a people suffering privations. Many of the most widely circulated papers proclaimed themselves heralds of this new doctrine of world reconciliation, they violently attacked those who were unwilling to believe in the enemy's readiness for peace, or at any rate insisted on maintaining our own lighting powers unimpaired, until the enemy had given some patent proof of it. They therefore attacked all who wished to keep the sword as sharp, and the arm that wielded it as strong, as was possible. In this connection another idea was put forward, that the war could never be ended by a military decision that is to say, by force of arms. No doubt the cooperation of the government was required to exploit the effect of military successes. But the last word rested with the masses. There was no doubt about that. Were people really so ignorant of the enemy's lust for our destruction? Did they not understand the psychology and the speeches of a Lloyd George or a Clemenceau? Why fight another battle if it did not contribute toward securing victory or escaping defeat? Had they no idea of the state of mind of the man who has to leave his home, wife and children and good employment, and face hardship and danger, if it is all to no purpose and he is merely risking his own and his family's future? Was it impossible to understand the emotions of the man who, carrying his life in his hands, alone on a dark night, struggles through a wilderness of muddy shell holes to some point where hell awaits him, or those of the man who is due tomorrow for the long-awaited leave, and has to go into action, and perhaps die, today? Ideas were thought out that were to make the world happy, thought ran far into the future, and the hard reality of the present was forgotten. No one remembered the mental agony of the soldier who was called upon to give his life. We were thinking of every imaginable thing, we ought to have been thinking of the war alone. The press lacked the cohesion and unity so conspicuous with the enemy. 
Without guidance, it could so easily become, not merely a useless, but positively a dangerous weapon of war. The fact that this was not the case in purely military questions, for the press carefully followed the instructions given TP it, is a proof of its readiness to submit to a firm leadership bailed on mutual trust. There were, it is true, a few black sheep, but, in the main, my request that military events should be discussed from this or that point of view was complied with. I can only express my thanks, here and now. The quite comprehensible efforts to satisfy the reader's craving for novelty sometimes resulted in news of a purely military character, which only helped the enemy propaganda, finding its way into our press from neutral or enemy sources. When one adds the sensational padding and headlines that are so dear to a section of our press, our enemies could not desire better assistance in their propaganda work. Be it far from me to seek the causes of such stupidity in ill will or sensation mongering. Short sightedness was often at the bottom of such cases, and still more frequently the great difficulties under which the press worked, the calling up of many trained men throwing an undue amount of work onto the editorial staff. Under the impression the situation made on me, I appealed in December, 1916, to the Chancellor to establish under his direct supervision a bureau to ensure a uniform direction of the press throughout the empire on all matters. I have always regarded the control of the press by the Foreign Office as a most unfortunate arrangement, for that office thus gained an influence in internal politics which would have been better excluded, of course, the interests of this department should be represented and considered, but the final control, embracing all government departments, could only be in the hands of the Chancellor, who was their constitutional head, and performed the duty of reconciling their needs and interests. In November, 1916, at the request of the Chancellor, I appointed Lieutenant Colonel Dutelmoser to be attached to his department, in the hope that after the resignation of Gesimrat Hamann some large scheme might be initiated. The work which was allotted to the Lieutenant Colonel did not correspond to my expectations. In detail, my demands had been directed to securing the control of all the press sections of the civil departments by some person of authority directly responsible to the Chancellor, the dose cooperation of this authority with the War Press Bureau and the Press Department of the Admiralty, the limitation of the Press Department of the Foreign Office to questions of foreign politics, and in compensation, a more vigorous propaganda campaign in enemy, neutral and allied newspapers, finally, the representation and promotion of the domestic interests of the press through one central bureau. The Imperial Chancellor, von Bethmann Holweg, refused all my demands. The unified control of the press would have been a means of once more rousing the resolution of the German people and of overcoming disintegrating influences. Enemy propaganda must be countered immediately by explanation of an even more penetrating and persistent character and must be supplemented by the speeches of statesmen and leading thinkers, and oral propaganda generally. Every German, man or woman, should be told daily what the loss of the war would mean to the fatherland. Pictures and the cinematograph had to be used for the same end. An explanation of the dangers confronting us would have had a different effect from the thought of war profits or all the talking and writing about a piece of understanding. What is equally important, it would have preserved us from greater dangers and served the cause of peace. I did my best, and aroused considerable opposition. The press of Saxony, Württemberg and Baden had a special position, but did their best to cooperate with us. The Bavarian press, as time went on, followed its own devices more and more. Our dealings with the press were made considerably more difficult by the lack of any common representation. Its organization was as confusing as that of the imperial authorities. There was the press committee, consisting of Berlin press representatives, the Union of German Newspaper Publishers, and the Imperial Union of the German Press. These organizations, again, were not on good terms. The announcement, here's an editor, here's a publisher, and many others which revealed a lack of unity, assailed us constantly. This was a pity as it made a strong, uniform molding of public opinion impossible. I have always estimated the influence of the press very highly, not only in the capital, but also in the provinces. I was always glad to receive representatives of the press, so far as my duties permitted. The channel of communication between general headquarters and the newspapers was the War Press Office. This was formed in October, 1915, out of various sections that had been part of the acting general staff at the beginning of the war. Its duties were the perusal and censorship of the home and foreign press and to act as censors. In the year 1917 a section was added to deal with patriotic instruction. The most important civil departments of the Empire and Prussia were linked up with the War Press Office. 
the analogous naval office was the press section of the Admiralty staff. The War Press Office always worked in the closest touch with these organs. The War Press Office, in accordance with its instructions, always refrained from exercising any political influence on the German press. All statements to the contrary are false, as are the suggestions that it conducted some special policy of the general staff. The importance of the war press office lay in its strong organization, its staff, and the lack of any unified imperial organization. The press was conscious of this. Their discontent was not so much directed against the war press office, as against all the various official press authorities which had no proper organization or direction. The majority of the unjustified attacks made upon this office in the Reichstag were due to ignorance of the exact scope of its functions. They merely show how impossible it was for General Headquarters, with the means at its disposal, to increase our fighting capacity. The war press office was there, and people could form unfavorable opinions about it, but they did not inquire into the causes of its shortcomings and help me to promote the creation of an imperial organization. The discussions that took place twice weekly with the members of the Berlin press and the provincial press represented in Berlin, in which, in addition to the war press office, representatives of the naval staff and all the imperial departments took part, were only of assistance to a section of the press. Lectures were accordingly given from time to time by official, of the imperial departments to representatives of the provincial press in different parts of the country. An important function of the war press office was the study of the press of neutral anti-enemy countries. At the front the army newspapers had become more and more important. The press bureau of the general staff of the army in the field supplied them with material, and also sent accounts of particularly heroic deeds of officers and men at the front to the minor newspapers at home. In the occupied parts of France and the prisoners of war camps the Gazelle des Ardennes did splendid work, winning the respect even of our enemies through its fairness and reliability. The same may be said of the Russish role, which was written in Russian and published under the direction of the War Ministry. The war correspondents of the great German dailies were grouped in press headquarters in the East and West, and so far as the military situation allowed, were informed as quickly and fully as possible of every new event, being given complete individual freedom. Within the necessary limits, they took part in the life of the troops and the staffs. In addition, eminent military writers described the war situation from a comprehensive point of view. It was the duty of the Chief Censorship Bureau in the War Press Office to secure uniform supervision of the military press in Germany, and obedience to the censorship regulations laid down by General Headquarters with the same object it kept in touch with the press departments in the occupied districts, and from time to time took similar steps in cooperation with the military press censorships of our allies. The censorship regulations issued by General Headquarters extended to everything which might hinder the effective prosecution of the war. They did not go beyond that. The Chief Censorship Bureau also transmitted to the military authorities at home the general instructions laid down by the imperial authorities. This led to serious misunderstandings and to impossible attitudes. It happened more than once that the general officers' commandings at home issued as instructions from general headquarters censorship regulations which were merely passed to them in the ordinary way by the Chief Censorship Bureau, thus naturally creating feeling against us. The conduct of press supervision was no part of the duty of the Chief Censorship Bureau. It was in the hands of the General Officer's commandings. The Bureau gave advice to the Supreme Military Authority, the Minister for War, when asked to do so, and kept him informed of any events which they thought required his attention. General Headquarters was thus not in a position to take direct action against any newspaper, but could merely draw the attention of the government, more especially the War Ministry, or in urgent cases the General Officer's commandings of the core districts, when we thought that the attitude of any particular paper was injurious to the prosecution of the war. There was, legally speaking, no political censorship. This was a mistake, and the cause of much mischief. The government itself often directed the Chief Censorship Bureau to issue some particular regulation. When I looked closer into these proceedings, I protested against any such use of the military censorship and put a stop to it. The subordination of the Chief Censorship Bureau to General Headquarters was not a happy arrangement. The conditions prevailing at the beginning of the war had compelled the General Staff to institute it as a measure of self-help. All censorship must excite opposition, and this will, of necessity, become more vocal as pacifist tendencies gain ground and the currents of domestic politics find themselves kept within bounds. General headquarters suffered much from this. 
the appointment, in the autumn of 1916, of the Minister for War as the Supreme Military Authority at Homo did something to case my position with regard to the press. Unfortunately in 1917 the minister refused to take over the chief censorship bureau. The press of our allies was better controlled by their governments than was the case with us, in Bulgaria and Turkey, however, it had not the importance it possessed in Germany and Austria-Hungary. Our allies also exercised a severe political censorship. In Austria-Hungary the government failed to take any steps to maintain moral or to rally the nation to action. In their last fight for existence the governments of the dual monarchy were in no sense the leaders of their peoples. Public opinion in Turkey was almost inarticulate, though rather less so in Bulgaria, where also the government failed to lead the people. It was particularly painful for us to see with what lack of appreciation Germany was spoken of in the press of her allies. Our Nibelung loyalty was, after all, no mere empty word, and the German blood spilt on foreign fields should have earned us gratitude at least. In the end Lieutenant Kulinkel Nikolai succeeded in making definite arrangements for the publication of military news, at any rate in the press of the Quadruple Alliance, and this mitigated the evils to a certain extent. Tours of journalists from the Allied countries were also expected to do useful educational work, but did not, in fact, make much difference. In this matter also our government failed to take energetic measures. It should have undertaken explanatory propaganda on a large scale among our allies, and thus have done good service to the fatherland for the post-war period as well. By degrees the military foreign propaganda department established branches in the allied countries. 8. Good propaganda must keep well ahead of actual political events. It must act as pacemaker to policy and mold public opinion without appearing to do so. Before political aims are translated into action, the world has to be convinced of their necessity and moral justification. What one desires to achieve must seem to be simply a psychological consequence of existing facts. We made no use of propaganda abroad, hardly knowing anything about it, although at home very skillful work was done against certain persons. Our political aims and decisions, issued to the world as sudden surprises, often seemed to be merely brutal and violent. This could have been skillfully avoided by broad and far-sighted propaganda. Not only had we had no inclination for propaganda work in peacetime, but we were also lacking in the necessary facilities. We had no world telegraph service, with its chain of cable and wireless stations. Efforts to remedy this had not yet been made. We lacked a leading journal of a strong national character, possessing influence abroad and weight at home, like the Times in England, the Temps in France, and the Novo Vremya in Russia. All these three papers took their stand on strong national platforms. The newspapers from which foreigners received direct information from Germany were all devotees of internationalism, fundamentally opposed to our form of government, and gave a false and one-sided picture of per life and thought and of the conditions in Germany. In the field of propaganda, we had much to catch up. We had to start the fight against the enemy's home front, and to use it with all our might to intensify the effect of the submarine campaign, which had just been decided on. We could not renounce the use of weapons which might prove decisive. I learned from discussions which I had with leading men that there was still, even at this stage of the war, immense ignorance as to the real necessity of a propaganda animated by great live ideas and capable of setting the popular imagination. The attitude of the government was lukewarm and doubting. They did not yet understand the nature of propaganda. They were opposed to it on the ground that it was too blatant and vulgar, whereas true propaganda implies that its activities are unobserved. It works silently. Doubtless because they realized their own powerlessness, the government thought that any wide and powerful counter-organization on our part against the enemy propaganda would be more or less a hopeless undertaking. This point of view, or the remark, our cause is good, we need no advocate, could lead to nothing. We had every reason to take action, not merely to defend ourselves, had to pass from defense to attack. Only so could we treat our enemy as lie treated us, and hold our own in the mighty world struggle. When I came to general headquarters I found only very poor arrangements, hardly deserving the name of a propaganda organization. I will say nothing about the Erzberger Bureau, as I have no knowledge of its activities. It was given up later. In the summer of general headquarters had requested the government to establish a strong propaganda organization. After many objections had been overruled, especially on the part of the foreign office, the military branch of this department was set up in July. 
Side by side with this branch, which was to deal with the purely military aspect, the Foreign Office took up the question of the establishment of similar branches for political and economic propaganda. It was only on this understanding that the chief of the general staff in the field had set up the military branch. All three branches were to work on the same lines, laid down by the Foreign Office, and carry on a wide and energetic counter-propaganda campaign, not merely contenting themselves with a feeble defense against the enemy's lies, but attack their propaganda directly. The political and economic propaganda service of the Foreign Office was unfortunately confined to a press and pamphlet service, which was mainly devoted to influencing the press by means of dementis, discussions of political events, and exposures of enemy weaknesses, it was like dropping water on a hot stone, and was not of the least importance. In the military department of the Foreign Office Colonel von Heeften gradually built up a large organization. This was under general headquarters, but was in the main financed by the Foreign Office, which received in return the right of joint supervision and of dictating lines of policy, rights of which it made virtually no use. Colonel von Heeften is an officer of unusually high intelligence and glowing patriotism. Everything he undertakes bears witness to his unflagging energy, born of inspiration, and he possesses a gift for constructive work and carrying his colleagues with him. What has been achieved is in all essentials the work of himself and his associates. By word and picture, and, above all, by means of the cinematograph, Colonel von Heeften tried to gain a secure footing in neutral countries. Oral propaganda was considered of the utmost importance. The transmission of news from mouth to mouth is the best, because it is the most dangerous, means of propaganda. The idea is planted, and no man knows whence it came. Propaganda by pictures and film was encouraged by the formation of a special pictorial department, the Picture and Film Office, and later of the Universum Film Company, Limited. The film is a means of popular education, and Colonel von Heeften desired to employ it as such after the war, his war organization being designed to that end. Pictures and films, and illustrations in poster form, strike home more and produce greater effects than writing, and thus have a greater influence on the masses. In connection with this, press propaganda was carried on by telegraphic, wireless and correspondence services, there was propaganda by pamphlets and lectures, and work was also done in connection with the neutral war press camp. Above all, Colonel von Heeften sought by distributing news quickly to find the way into the unfriendly section of the neutral press. Art propaganda was also encouraged. Here, perhaps, we went too far. The Foreign Office attached special importance to this, having, indeed, taken it up some time before. At our embassies in allied and neutral countries, and also in the occupied districts in the East, military propaganda offices were established as branches of Colonel von Heeften's organization, working up, with an eye to the special circumstances of the country, the material supplied from the central organization, and then distributing it. They worked in the closest touch with the ambassador. It was quite impossible for Colonel von Heeften by himself to recover all the ground that we had lost in the long years before and after the outbreak of war and to get on equal terms with the enemy propaganda and the public opinion it had created in neutral countries, let alone to penetrate into the enemy countries themselves. The insular position of England and America made this impossible. The gates of entry into France were Spain and Switzerland. From Spain we wore cut off and there was nothing left but the short Swiss frontier. This applied to Italy as well. The German propaganda was only kept going with difficulty. In spite of all our efforts, its achievements, in comparison to the magnitude of the task, were inadequate. We produced no real effect on the enemy peoples. With them a strong government, with its heart in the war, ruthlessly suppressed every sentiment of weakness or softness, and all talk of peace, especially a real peace of understanding. In neutral countries, and among our allies, too, we achieved next to nothing. We also attempted to carry on propaganda on the enemy fronts. In the East the Russians were the authors of their own collapse, and our work there was of secondary importance. In the West the fronts of our enemies had not been made susceptible by the state of public opinion in their home countries, and the propaganda we gradually introduced had no success. Matters would have been different if the Chancellor had supported Colonel von Heeften with all the authority of his high office and with real resolution. I often begged him to create some great organization. It became undeniably essential to establish an imperial ministry of propaganda. I attached the more importance to this, as propaganda by the speeches of statesmen proved its value more and more. 
Lord Northcliffe was not wrong when he claimed that the speech of an English statesman was worth £20,000, if it was copied in the German press it was worth £50,000 if the Germans did not reply to it it was worth £100,000. We made no effective reply to the barrage of speeches from enemy statesmen, still less did we think of suppressing them. The campaign against these speeches could not be organized by the military branch of the Foreign Office, nor could it be done by anybody, save an imperial department possessing special powers. At last a feeble step in this direction was taken in August, 1918. A totally inadequate organization was set up, besides, it was then too late. In these circumstances it was quite impossible to achieve uniformity in propaganda work between Germany and Austria-Hungary, as was so conspicuously the case with our enemies. We regarded everything as a domestic question that concerned Austria-Hungary or ourselves exclusively, instead of realizing that we were but one body, against which the enemy had raised his threatening arm for one destructive blow. The army found no ally in a strong propaganda directed from home. While her army was victorious on the field of battle, Germany failed in the fight against the moral of the enemy peoples. 9. In the autumn of 1916 the army received only slight moral support from home. But so far this had not led to inconvenience. The army was tired and very exhausted, but its spirits were good and its moral was high. There was close mutual cooperation between the army and the homeland. Leave was given as generously as possible. The number of men on leave was always smaller than the army, and I personally, desired. Apart altogether from the military situation, transport conditions made it impossible to grant leave on the scale which I would have wished. In critical times leave had to be cut down. The sick and wounded also took home news nf the army, and the army heard all about affairs at home from the draft sent up, and returned wounded. The letter, newspaper and parcel post worked well, and the army's choice of newspapers was not limited. Only certain organs of the independent social democrats were forbidden. The right to ban any newspaper was in tin, hands of the army commanders. I know of only a few isolated instances in which this right was exercised. The army was still receiving adequate reinforcements. These had, however, to be used, not only to bring existing formations up to strength, but also, however reluctantly, for forming new divisions, which were needed to give us a fiver hand in dealing with the expected attacks in the east and west. The thirteen divisions thus raised, at the cost, it is true, of reducing battalion strengths, were expected to be ready for the field in the spring of 1917. One result of trench warfare was that troops which were short of special labor companies set up all sorts of administrative institutions themselves. These were, of course, permanently retained in their sectors, the men remaining behind when their divisions were relieved. All sorts of difficulties arose from this, and everything suffered. A permanent administration company was therefore formed in every division out of the men engaged in this special work, who ipso facie left their old units. The strengths of the battalions mainly affected by this were again reduced, a step necessary in any case, as the young company commanders were not equal to taking charge of more than 200 men, or to leading them in the field. An artillery commander was allotted to each division. Many new formations were raised of field and heavy artillery. A special army field artillery was organized, in addition to the divisional artillery, which it was to support in the fighting line. Nine batteries were insufficient even for a divisional front of two to three kilometers, the demand for artillery having risen to incredible heights. The new organization was accompanied by new equipment. Our air forces, in particular our aeroplanes, were further developed. They had reached such proportions that it seemed necessary to place them under a special general, who should be directly under the chief of the general staff in the field. The first director of air services was General von Hoppner. This officer, who had proved his worth as chief of staff of an army, and as a leader of troops, now did all that lay in his power to develop this arm of the future. His chief of staff was Colonel Thompson, who had hitherto commanded the air forces single-handed. In spite of the efforts of the general staff in peacetime, we had begun the war with insufficient air equipment. Germany and the German army owe it to the enormous creative energy of Colonel Thompson and of Lieutenant Colonel Siegert, who worked at home, that our aircraft went from success to success during the war. At the moment the most important thing was to increase our chaser squadrons and to provide them with a good fighting machine, without, however, reducing the supply of other varieties. Considerable attention was also devoted to bombing squadrons. The airship disappeared from the fighting equipment of the army. 
it offered too large a target. The Navy continued to use it. Anti-aircraft defenses were perfected and increased, and defensive arrangements at the front and at home organized on the largest scale. This cost us men and material, which had to be taken from the front. Trench warfare offered no scope for cavalry. The formation of regiments of dismounted cavalry, of battalion strength, out of the cavalry regiments, with which a start had already been made, was now continued, and the Landstam and Landwer squadrons were broken up. Their horses were urgently required for the reorganization of the artillery and for our transport. The wastage in horses was extraordinarily high, and the import from neutral countries hardly worth consideration. The homeland and the occupied districts could not make good the shortage. There were many gaps. Our thoroughbreds had proved their worth, but our lighter strains were not good enough. We had not paid enough attention to their breeding. The heavy draft horses turned out to be quite unequal to the strain of war. General headquarters was compelled to allot the supply and transport, which had hitherto been part of the divisional organization, to the armies, and to localize them in the army areas. During the defensive battles the railways had been overtaxed, owing to the continual relief of divisions when the latter were accompanied by their complete transport and columns. I much regretted the new arrangements we were thus compelled to adopt, for the supervision and care were more satisfactory in the hands of divisions than in those of armies and groups. The construction of positions in the West was systematically revised, from the point of view of the new theory of distribution in depth and the most careful adaptation to the ground. In the East they were able to retain more of their old form. In addition to the construction of the two great strategic lines in the west, there was much work to be done there on all fronts, the existing positions in Flanders, to the Cass of Annas, and at Verdun being deepened, while the Alsace-Lorraine front, where so far not enough had been done, was also strengthened. The army worked hard at these positions, the melt understanding that they were digging for their lives. The labor that we received from home was insufficient for all that had to be done on the far-flung fronts. We were thus forced, unfortunately, to employ troops on the work, and their time for rest and training was curtailed. Of course the two demands conflicted, the armies wanted to get on with their fortification, which set mod to them the most vital thing, whilst Lieutenant Colonel Wet L and F insisted on the necessity for training. Many compromises had to be arrived at. For the education of the army for the coming GT defensive battles, a booklet, The Defensive Battle, was written. Colonel Bauer and Captain Gate, who combined a wonderful power of expression with a remarkable knowledge of tactics, were chiefly responsible for it. In sharp contrast to the form of defense hitherto employed, which had been restricted to rigid and easily recognized lines of little depth, a new system was devised, which, by distribution in depth and the adoption of a loose formation, enabled a more active defense to be maintained. It was of course intended that the position should remain in our hands at the end of the battle, but the infantryman need no longer say to himself, here I must stand or fall, but had, on the contrary, the right, within certain limits, to retire in any direction before strong enemy fire. Any part of line that was lost was to be recovered by counter-attack. The group, on the importance of which many intelligent officers had insisted before the war, now became officially the tactical unit of the infantry. The position of the non-commissioned officer as group leader thus became much more important. Tactics became more and more individualized. Having regard to the ever more scanty training of our officers, non-commissioned officers and men, and the consequent falling off in discipline, it was a risky business, of the success of which many eminent soldiers were skeptical, to make even greater demands on the subordinate leaders and the individual soldier. The controversy raged furiously in my staff, I myself had to intervene to advocate the new tactics. The new pamphlet embodied all the lessons we had learnt in the Somme battles, both as to the employment of artillery and aircraft and as to the cooperation of the various arms. It became a standard textbook for the whole army, and for the armies of our allies, so far as conditions with them permitted. Without this last limitation the booklet was dangerous, for it made demands on the men which could only be fulfilled by troops which, if no longer trained to perfection, were at any rate animated by a spirit of self-sacrifice and true discipline. This defensive battle booklet was completed by the Manual for the Training of Infantry in War, which was drawn up by the army headquarters of General Fritz von Below. This document demonstrates that eminent generals thorough grasp of the character of our infantry. My staff compiled a large number of other manuals on special arms and field fortifications. The training manual for the artillery was not completed in the course of the winter, but its main points were contained in the defensive battle. 
It had become clear in the course of the war that the art of shooting could not be thrown on the scrap heap but on the contrary must be advanced to the highest point. With that end in view, special monthly periodicals dealing with shooting and technical artillery questions were prepared by the Director of Artillery at General Headquarters and distributed to the troops. A vigorous intellectual life was observable in all branches of the army. We kept in close touch with the feeling in the army. It was supplied with the best that amid be given. Manuals and pamphlets were useless by themselves, they had to be ground into the flesh and blood of officism. Men. We held courses at Valencians for senior officers and general staff officers with a view to inculcating clear and sound ideas about defensive warfare. The German Crown Prince instituted a similar course at Sedan. Courses of all kinds were arranged by the army staffs, in particular for the training of junior officers as company commanders, and for non-commissioned officers. For all arms the basis of everything was the maintenance and improvement of discipline, without which no army can exist. Discipline was also required, at this stage of the war, to counterbalance the many unavoidable discomforts which affected the life of the troops. The frequent changes and the constant shifting of units made billeting conditions ever more difficult. The danger of the men taking anything they happened to want increased. The importance of mine and thine was frequently lost sight of. Clothing and equipment had deteriorated, and were consequently more difficult to keep in repair. Many causes, not the least of which was the want of proper lighting arrangements in the dugouts, led to a neglect of outward appearances. The men let things rip. Life at the front was bound to tell on them. On strong characters it had a stimulating effect, but these were rare, and the moral of the great mass was sure to suffer, increasingly so the longer the war lasted. Any thinking soldier knew that. It had, indeed, been the case in every war. The necessity for moral support from home, to maintain the feeling of duty and discipline at the front, was all the greater, and the homeland could only give such support if its own moral was high. The way in which the troops behaved in public places and their attention to saluting were sure tests of the condition of the army. Their conduct was by no means always good in this respect. The infantry was trained in the new methods, and in musketry, courses for group and company commanders were continued everywhere. The training of machine gunners was carried out on the most comprehensive scale, and a special practice ground was set aside for the marksmen detachments. On our artillery ranges the artillery improved its shooting and its cooperation with aircraft. The dilution brought about by the large number of new formations had to be remedied by most careful training on all parts of the front. Trench mortar units also, as well as pioneers and signalers, were given special schools and training grounds, on which they studied the particular uses of their weapons, but officers of other arms were also instructed there. Training was carried on without interruption, both in and behind the line. The life was much the same as in peacetime. Everywhere efforts were made to fit the army for its heavy task, and to keep its losses within bounds. At home, work proceeded on similar lines. Unfortunately conditions were unfavorable, the instructional personnel being too old. Rations were short, and depot units were too much in touch with home and not enough with the army. I always tried to have recruits trained as far as possible at recruit depots behind the front. A start was made and more was done as time went on. Of course, all our leaders, myself included, made every effort to prevent the troops from becoming tired or stale under training. Physical rest was an absolute necessity for the maintenance even of discipline, and it was only by adequate periods of relaxation in rest billets that men could gradually recover from the heavy moral strain. They had to be provided with comfortable quarters. Recuperation was impossible in empty huts, and we had to take over furniture and fittings from the civil population. Unfortunately this did not always remain in the district, the troops taking it with them when they were, moved. As for recreation, there were the military hands, which were very popular, physical games of all kinds, amateur dramatics and touring companies, and libraries. The ranks of the regular non-commissioned officers were greatly thinned. Many of them had, like the regular officers, fallen in battle, and others had been transferred to new formations, or sent home for instructional duties. The men promoted from the ranks at the front to take their places had not had sufficient training in leadership and did not look after the men well enough. Discipline was impaired by life in the trenches, where differences of rank disappeared for the time, and the danger that the new non-commissioned officers would not have enough authority was inevitable. 
the bulk of the non-commissioned officers proved themselves excellent subordinate leaders in the field, and trustworthy assistants to the officers, they fulfilled their difficult task loyally, and the country owes them a debt of gratitude. The officers were fully conscious of the importance of their duties as trainers and teachers of their men. This, too, will ultimately be recognized. In peacetime it took from 12 to 15 years before an officer commanded his company. By that time the qualifications which fitted him for his task, service experience, handling of men, care for his subordinates, had become second nature to him. During the war young men of two or three years service had to lead companies. Many succeeded, but others failed in many ways. The capacity for leadership is a gift, the result of education and tact. Zeal and courage cannot always take its place. Everything was done, at home and at the front, to secure the thorough training of company commanders, but there is no doubt that the complaints of the men as to their inexperience were, at bottom, justified. This was a very serious matter, involving the danger of destroying the admirable relations that had hitherto existed between officers and men. The excellent regular officer, so often the object of attacks was no longer available. The green grass was growing on his grave. In the short period of the war, it was impossible to train a new generation of these men, with the same high professional qualities, the same thorough knowledge, and the same sense of responsibility towards their men as had been possessed by officers trained through a long course of years. Nothing could provide a more striking justification of our whole army system than the events of this war. A well-known social democratic member of the Reichstag, who visited me as a war correspondent at Kovno, told me emphatically that he had been compelled fundamentally to revise his opinion of the regular officer. He said that in his view they looked after their men with the most thorough devotion and understanding, and that officers of the reserve found it much more difficult. I was greatly gratified by this frank and striking admission. In the circumstances there should have been more frequent promotion of regular non-commissioned officers to commissioned rank. This was done here and there. My former orderly room clerk in Dusseldorf was an officer in a field regiment as early as the autumn of 1914. Owing to the insufficient training and lack of experience of the company commanders, especially with regard to interior economy, the part played by the commissioned officers became much more important. Unfortunately, battalion commanders were often drawn from the reserve, and were thus naturally somewhat deficient in knowledge of administration, although owing to their greater age they were more reliable. The war must have made extraordinary demands on men of their age, for in defensive battles they had to go into the front line again and again. Both their health and their nerves were subjected to the greatest strain. They did admirable work in battle, just as good as that of battalion commanders on the active list. The duties of regimental commanders were varied and exceptionally arduous. They were everywhere directly responsible for their troops, and had to answer to their superiors for the appearance and moral, the success or failure, the weal or woe, of every single man under their command. The outward appearance and inward bearing of the troops, and especially of the corps of officers, were indicative of the personality, the will, the capacity, of the commander. Lai had to inspire his officiers and men with his own spirit, he was their example and their stay, their counsellor and friend in periods of inactivity as in battle. In trench warfare, it was very difficult for him to influence his officers and men, but in the end he set the seal of his personality upon them. There was a high rate of wastage among regimental commanders, owing to wounds, and frequent changes were thus necessary. There was often insufficient time for a commander to establish mutual confidence between himself and his regiment. Some commanders, however, retained their regiments for very long periods, sometimes for almost the whole of the war. Some of them, owing to heavy losses, had to renew their regiments completely three or four times. Humanly speaking that was too heavy a burden on them, tore they left a hit of themselves behind each time. After the regimental commander the next in importance was the divisional commander, who took the position occupied in peacetime by the corps commander. Hard as general headquarters tried, it proved impossible, in view of the constant troop movements involved in trench warfare, to maintain the unity of the corps. This was a decided drawback. The divisions gradually acquired greater independence in every respect, and the divisional commander thus became more important, through his hands passed all the threads from above and below, fighting, training and administration. He was the instructor of his troops. It was impossible to devote too much care to the selection of these officers. The general staff officer was, so to speak, a man apart. As the war became more technical, his duties became more arduous. 
it was no longer sufficient for him to have a general knowledge of all arms and their employment. He had to be a good artilleryman and, in addition, to possess a sound knowledge of the use of aircraft, signaling, supply questions and a thousand other things, while he had to master many details which the divisional commander had no time to settle. In spite of every effort to keep them brief, the orders which he had to draft grew ever longer and more complicated. The more technical the war became, the more did these orders grow into veritable works of art, involving infinite skill and knowledge. There was no other way, if things were to go smoothly. The variety of his functions often compelled the general staff officer to keep many things in his own hands. Care had to be taken that the independence of other services did not suffer on this account, and that the commander, too, was not shelved. I could never have allowed either of these developments. The commanders remained commanders. They were the leaders and instructors of their troops, and could not be in too close touch with them. The general staff officer was their helper and advisor, and was responsible for the smooth working of the machinery. Their tasks were different, but there was plenty for both of them to do. They were both responsible for the welfare of the troops. Apart from that the general staff officers of the division had no direct responsibility, this falling on the chiefs of staff at corps and army headquarters, in the widest sense possible in military life. The duty of the general staff officer was to keep in the background and to work with unremitting energy. The selection and training of general staff officers was difficult I only accepted officers who were familiar with regimental duty war experience, however, and the education given in the special courses held at Sedan, formed no real substitute for the thorough training of peacetime. General headquarters did have some complaints from the troops against them, mainly on the score of their youth, but on the whole they were highly respected. The general staff itself required a large number of officers, who were thus lost to the fighting arms. I had to take youngish men, to avoid robbing the troops of too many officers capable of holding commands. I found among the officers I selected many clever, manly and honourable men, who understood their work and carried it out with tact. The socialist leader whom I have already mentioned told me, once more going back on his previous views, that he regarded the general staff officer as the soul of the war. He was right. I have been told since the war ended that from personal motives the general staff did not keep me accurately informed, but continually gave too favourable a description of the situation. This allegation does not correspond to facts, and is an insult to the general staff to which the army owes an immeasurable debt. I have always focused my attention on the officers generally, not the staff officers, for I regarded them as the backbone of the army. In one of my last routine orders in October, 1918, I stated that in my view they were called upon to take a decisive part in the reconstruction of the country. Our officers have done their duty. Their terrible losses are an eloquent proof of that. It cannot be made a matter of reproach against them that many of them had insufficient experience, for this was simply due to war conditions and to their heavy losses. These inexperienced men, at any rate, knew how to go bravely to their death. In trouble, danger or battle the men always relied on and looked up to their officer, even when he was but a boy. Even if some officers did fail to strike the right note in dealing with their men, if some of them were even gravely kicking in their duty to the ranks, that is nothing against the officers' corps in general. Things were what, in war, they must be. In the long period of trench warfare the practice of interfering with the subordinate leaders had notably increased. This was a most unfortunate development, due in part to the many telephone lines available, but also to some extent to the inexperience of the junior staff. Every leader needed scope for his activities. Again and again I impressed on the corps staffs and the general staff that there should be no limitation of these leaders' authority, which is contrary to the nature of war. The training of the army laid an immense burden of work on general headquarters I had the gratification of knowing that the army headquarters staffs in the west were in agreement with our policy and measures. Of course, at the end of January, 1917, nothing had been finished. The raising of the new formations and reorganization were still underway. The array was only gradually beginning to get stronger. The troops had suffered too severely. The general principles of the new regulations were understood, but had not been thoroughly ground into the troops. The supply of material was still in arrears. In spite of all our pains, in spite of incessant labor, the strain on the Western Front had not been definitely relieved. In the East and in Romania, also, work was proceeding energetically on the same lines as in the West. The Commander-in-Chief in the East and General von Mackensen were entrusted with the necessary modifications for the conditions of that theater. 
For the rest, the troops there were in the same condition as those in the West. Training was also intensified in the Austro-Hungarian army, but progress here was slow. General von Below had also taken the Bulgarian army in hand, but both their language and their national sentiment remained foreign to us. It was very difficult for us to make much progress in the face of the Bulgarian distrust of German tutelage. Nevertheless, the spirit of the Bulgarian army began to improve, although their general headquarters itself did nothing really resolute as regards its training. In the Turkish army Lyman Pasha alone worked wholeheartedly. The Turkish troops in Galicia and Romania were trained on German lines, and not without success. There they were satisfactory, while on other fronts they were of little value. General headquarters did all it could to strengthen our war machine. Meanwhile, however, the attempt to increase our numbers through the formation of a Polish army, and thus to wipe out the numerical superiority of the enemy, had been a sorry failure. 10. The employment of the fighting resources of the Poles, whom we had freed from the Russian yoke, was important for the successful prosecution of the war. I had already given the matter my consideration earlier, and ultimately I sanctioned recruiting for the Polish Legion. They would not join up, however. The Russian Poles held absolutely aloof, and there seemed no prospect of any alteration in the composition of the Polish Legion, which was drawn mainly from Galician Poland. In the earlier stages of the war, Poland reckoned on obtaining her independence with the help of Russia. A manifesto of the Grand Duke Nicholas had promised the restoration of the Kingdom of Poland within its former frontiers, under the scepter of the Tsar of Russia, and this had doubtless made a great impression on all the Poles. The whole position had now been fundamentally changed. They could only hope to gain their independence by throwing in their lot with us, and not even then unless we could overthrow Russia. This we had to attempt also on military grounds. It seemed to me possible that Poland would give her sons to a fight for freedom against Russia, here, as indeed in many other matters, their interests were really identical with ours. When I became first quartermaster general, on the 29th of August, I found that there was an agreement in existence, made on the 11th of August in Vienna by the Chancellor with Baron von Burian, Minister for Foreign Affairs of the Dual Monarchy, which bound Germany and Austria-Hungary to establish an independent kingdom of Poland, with an hereditary monarchy, a constitutional government and a national army under a single command, which was to be entrusted to Germany. The proposed foundation of this statu was to be announced by both countries as soon as possible, but it was not to be actually established until later. Vilna was to be included in the new territory, whose frontiers were to be extended eastwards as far as the peace treaty would make possible. This new Poland was to be accepted as a member of the alliance of the two empires, and its foreign policy was to be conducted accordingly. The two central powers mutually guaranteed their existing Polish possessions, and provided for the frontier rectifications which would have to be made for the greater security of their territory at the expense of Russian Poland. Such claims were to be limited to strict military dot necessities. In the autumn of 1914 and in 1915 von Bethmann had frequently asked for my views as to the proper demarcation of this frontier. Views differed as to the economic future of Poland. Von Bethmann aimed at its incorporation in the German Customs Union, but this went too far for Baron Burian, who wished to see a separate Polish tariff system. Expression was given to the desire of both parties that the customs and transport restrictions which still separated the German and Austro-Hungarian districts should be as far as possible eliminated. No special provision was made for the possibility, which was certainly highly unlikely, of a separate peace with Russia. It was clear, and the characters of both von Bethmann and Baron Burian made it certain, that this agreement could not have been reached without very long discussions, which had probably started as early as the year 1915. In any case, the Chancellor had stated on the 5th of April 1916, that the Polish question was ripe for settlement, and that Germany and Austria-Hungary would have to find the solution. The Governor-General in Warsaw had also attacked the problem of raising a Polish army, and arrived at very favourable conclusions. The establishment of the Kingdom of Poland, with an army of its own, was now decided upon by this agreement. The Governor-General of Poland regarded the formation of this army as not merely possible, but, as a result of his inquiries, extremely promising. The uncommonly difficult military situation made an accession of strength to the Quadruple Alliance more than urgent. General headquarters felt, of course, compelled to go further with the proposal for the formation of a Polish army. Any hesitation would have been wrong, for it was a question of victory or defeat, life or death, for Germany. What might happen later could be left to be dealt with when it came. 
the position of the war at the beginning of September had made the danger in which we stood only too clear to all of us. Shortly afterwards at Ples a series of conferences on the Polish question were held, at which General von Basila was present, between the officials responsible for the policy and military operations of Germany and Austria-Hungary. These were of importance to me only so tar and they, halt with the possibility of obtaining a Polish army to reinforce our own. General von Basila held to his favourable view, although General von Konrad uttered a strong warning against optimism. The former stated that a fundamental condition to complete success was the proclamation of the kingdom and the establishment of a single administration in Poland by the amalgamation of the two governments of Lublin and Warsaw, until that was done the Poles would not be convinced that the central powers were really in earnest as to the carrying out of their Polish proposals. I thought that there must be a great deal of truth in this. In the interest of the creation of this new army, I pressed the proposed amalgamation of the two governments earnestly on Baron Burian. The statesmen could not come to any agreement. The wishes of the dual monarchy and the fear of domestic difficulties were more important to Baron Burian than the common prosecution of the war. The amalgamation of the two governments, advocated by General Headquarters and by General von Basila, was dropped. General von Basila, nevertheless, thought that it would still be possible to form an army if the Central Powers proclaimed the establishment of the Polish Kingdom, like proposed that for a start four or five divisions should be formed, for which the Polish Legion should form the nucleus. Ho hoped to be able to place these divisions at the disposal of General Headquarters, in April, 1917, and then to proceed with the formation of further ones. It was not much, but it did offer us the hope of some increase of strength. The war might still last for years, and every new addition to our forces should be welcomed. The military situation compelled us to agree to General von Basila's proposal, and General Headquarters accordingly adopted the policy which he held to be feasible. The imperial government now proceeded to carry out the program of von Bethmann and Baron Burian for the creation of the Kingdom of Poland, while we discussed the raising of a Polish array with General von Basila and the Austro-Hungarian General. Staff. Under Secretary of State Warnschaft begged me to urge on Minister von Lobel my views as to the necessity for the Polish army. I did so, stating in a private letter that the real ground of this necessity was the iron need of more men for the war. I am not acquainted with the details of the proceedings in Berlin. The Chancellor and General von Biedisela warmly advocated the raising of the Polish army and the establishment of the kingdom. There was, however, considerable opposition to this second step in many quarters in Germany. Rumours soon circulated from Berlin that I was the author of the plan. I repeatedly requested the government to explain the matter properly, but, unfortunately, in spite of my request, not a statesman could be found who was willing to set out the whole position in its true context. Just as in the question of the submarine campaign, so now, in the autumn of 19x6, General Headquarters was for the second time involved without any act of its own in a political controversy, on this occasion, moreover, the result was to hinder the prosecution of the war. Was it surprising that I felt absolutely disgusted by this procedure? Everybody who worked with me knows that I was always ready for frank discussion and listened willingly to arguments against my views, but that I insisted on absolute honesty. I was called in by the Chancellor to assist in drafting the proclamation for the foundation of the Kingdom of Poland. In my view the proclamation was ambiguous, and I said so. The proclamation of the kingdom on the, the 5th of November, and the steps taken to form a Polish army proved to be a ploughing of the sands. We soon saw that General von Konrad had correctly judged the situation. Once and for all I had to abandon all hope of our army being strengthened by Polish troops. General von Basila, too, recognised that he had been mistaken. Thus ended for good the question of forming a Polish army. The idea of forming a Polish national militia, which was mooted from time to time subsequently, and intermittently advocated by General von Basila and the Austro-Hungarian government, was henceforth received unfavourably at general headquarters in view of the ambiguous attitude of Poland, any arming of that country invented dangers which it was as much our duty to avoid as previously it had been to attempt to obtain an accession of strength from that country. Any amount of time and energy was wasted on these fruitless negotiations, in which the only point of interest was provided by the perseverance with which the Austin Hungarian statesmen pursued their anti German ends in Poland. The formation of a Polish army failed for political reasons. Poland apparently preferred to achieve her ends against GER many and Austro Hungary with the aid of the Entente. Manpower she had in plenty, even after sending labour to Germany and Austria Hungary. 
In this sense the manpower question had no influence on the problem on the formation of an army. Naturally we continued to make every effort to recruit labor in Poland on the largest possible scale, and to make use of the country for the prosecution of the war. To attribute the present conditions in Poland and our eastern districts to our attempt to establish the kingdom is to overstep the mark. If the kingdom had never been proclaimed, if the attempt to raise an army had never been made, events would have followed the same course, for their true causes are to be sought in history, in the strong national sentiment of the Poles and the traditional hostility between Poles and Germans. In the discussions concerning the establishment of the Kingdom of Poland anti the formation of the Polish army we touched also on the possibility of a separate peace with Russia. The intentions of the central powers with regard to Poland were obviously a stumbling block in the way of any such step. A separate peace with Russia has always figured prominently in the thoughts of the German people. As early as the autumn of 1914 I received authentic news of the presence of Count Witt in Berlin. This was, of course, no more than an empty rumor, England and France having then much too firm a hold on Russia. Stimmer had now been premier for a long time, and there was again talk of the possibility of peace being secured through his influence. Naturally, peace with Russia would have been more welcome to me than the whole Polish army, with the whole kingdom of Poland thrown in, to which, as a native of the province of Posen, I naturally had a strong instinctive dislike. The Polish army could at best only provide a few divisions, which were not to be weighed in the scale against the relief which we should experience by the disappearance of Russia from the ranks of our enemies. It was a very simple calculation, on which I need not waste words here. The difficulty was that, here as elsewhere, wishes and hopes did not bring peace and that the government and the diplomats did not seem to get further than wishes and hopes. Doubtless they felt that there was no real ground for these hopes, or they would not in August have produced their Polish program, which was aimed directly against Russia. They did not get beyond reflections on peace, such as might be indulged in at any time. There was never even a reasonable possibility of getting into touch with Stunner, nor the remotest suggestion of any move on his part. No one really believed in the possibility of concluding peace with Russia. The military situation in September and October did not favor it, even although the young tank must have perceived by October that their great autumn campaign of 1916 would not succeed. On the 21st of October the Chancellor stated that there was then no prospect of a separate peace with Russia, which was far too dependent on England. In laying for general headquarters the foundations for the further prosecution of the war, and to strengthen our forces, I had a wide held of work to cultivate. I could, of course, not do all the ploughing and sowing with my own hand. Where I found intelligent cooperation and the same serious view of the situation as I held myself, I sowed good seed. But often it was poor, and the field gave no yield. Weeds, too, grew up and choked what had hitherto been a good crop. End of Volume 1